Normatec recovery systems give you a high-tech compression massage for warm-up pre-workout and recovery post-workout. The technology is very safe and is used by a broad range of athletic types and really any fitness enthusiast looking to get the most out of their workout. The whole idea is that we're using air compression to help increase circulation in the body. We wanted to mimic physiology the way the body moves fluids. We went ahead and, and took a lot of those principles and put it into a system that you can use on your different extremities and your hips as well. Normatec has been an industry leader in pneumatic compression, providing improved mobility and profound healing for thousands of patients. We continually work with researchers to study and develop the effectiveness of our technology. We saw about creating that community space where people have a conversation around recovery and start really challenging their beliefs in what is possible and what they've known and, and maybe what could be. minutes won't hurt anybody. Thanks, Grandma. Paralyzed Veterans of America works tirelessly every day to create a more accessible America. Let's leave the accessible spaces to the people who actually need them. Whatever the reason, excuses don't excuse. Join PVA and be part of the solution. Honor the spot. Well, I hope you're all sitting comfortably today. Uh, we've got a long one. Uh, Echelon Racing the Community Series is back. We're starting with the women today. Uh, 80 kilometers, which um, in my perception is a long ride for an indoor ride. Uh, so I hope you're all sitting comfortably, uh, whether it be on your steed or in your armchair watching us here on ZMS uh, with Echelon Racing. It's going to be a cracker this one uh, down in Colorado. Uh, here's the uh, community series date. Um, you can see we're at the bottom of the left hand column. Uh, it's the Iron Horse Bicycle Classic. Now we're going to the history of that in a short while. That's 12th of December. Uh, we'll be back on the 2nd of January, January the 15th. You can see on the right, uh, Gila Tulsa uh, Intelligentsia Cup. And uh, that's a quiz, that one. Joking. Um, it is, of course, a bike race. Uh, Joe Martin, stage race, uh, rounding things off on the 29th of Jan. This is your Winter Series. It's brought to you by Echelon Racing, uh, broadcast by ZMS. Um, don't forget, there is, of course, uh, a um, pro version of this, and those are the dates there if you want to follow those. Now, it's all done on RGT, uh, which is 
certainly my favourite platform. I'm not uh, employed by them or have any connections with them whatsoever, other than that I use their platform to run my own personal races. And we have an excellent lineup of races today. Five again. Uh, there's men's A, men's B, uh, hand cycling, and paracycling. So uh, look out for all of that. I don't think we've got the hand cycle avatars still yet, but keep watching because sometime at this winter, um, the hand cycling is actually going to get its own av avatars, which I think is fantastic. Here's today's route. Now look at that lump in the middle. Uh, this is going to be arduous. I mean, it's just what, look, come on. This is just one big descent from the start. Uh, sorry, ascent from the start and a descent back to the start. Three laps of this, uh, they've got to go over that monster three times. Um, the boys sitting in their houses, garages, uh, whatever, sheds. Uh, that's the course. Um, it's in Colorado, and you'll see some Rocky Mountains there because uh, Colorado is famous for Rocky Mountains. Now, th this is in a valley. Um, I'm not 100% sure of the whole story, but uh, of course, they build railway lines um, along valleys, um, and of course, the steam locomotive is the iron horse and this uh, route i believe um, and i'm sure somebody will correct me if i'm wrong uh, has its roots in a bicycle versus train race um, over some distance we'll come to that later uh, we've got hours and hours and hours of uh, <clears throat> commentary to go through uh, because as i say this is an 80 kilometer race um well 83.4 as you can see in the top three laps uh, so one laps 27 point so we're looking at um the thick end of an hour probably for uh, per lap, it should be less than it, say 45 minutes, maybe 50 uh, at the most. Bear in mind though, there is a lot of climbing in this. Uh, here we have the lineup, who have we got in there? Uh, so, uh, an all-star lineup of the ladies, of course, and uh, we start with uh, Kate Ouellette, um Katie Miller, and who else we've got? Uh, Jackie Godby's in there, and Betram as well. I don't know Betram's first name. So uh, we'll, we'll, oh, um, hang on, that's not Fiona. Sorry, I beg your pardon, that's Fiona Beltram. Sorry, I misread read that. So here we are, they're off. Uh, the four of them go zooming off. Three bikes behind are put in there for camera purposes. Um, so uh, we are focused on the actual riders. Um, red seems to be in fashion today. Everybody wearing red. Uh, it's just because they're all, let's have a look. Um, yeah, I think all, well, apart from uh, Katie Miller, they're uh, all in, uh, all from the US, so maybe that's the uh, US strip. I was rather taken of, uh, by that fetching uh, strip that some of the male riders had on yesterday in the USA. Um, this doesn't seem to be the same one, so uh, that uh, maybe somebody can uh, tell me what this is. Uh, now, Kate Ouellette and uh, Jackie Godby um, off in a pair. Now, Jackie will be familiar with this scenario because in yesterday's 40 kilometer race, and bear in mind, Jackie um, and I think Kate Ouellette both did the race yesterday. Um, so, there's, actually, you can see there from that shot, oh, they've got the train in here, look. <laughs> this is marvellous, isn't it? Uh, this is because it's not on Magic Roads. This is um, one where the all graphics have actually been done for this. Isn't that splendid? Look at the railroad there. Um, I think it's the Rio Grande Railroad. Um, as I said, if you, if you look at the geography around it, I mean, railroads, um, trains don't like really going up hills because the wheels slip on tracks. So they try to minimise gradients on, on railway lines. So obviously valleys um, are very, very useful. Um, as I say, I think this is the Rio Grande Railway. I am not um, an aficionado uh, about these matters. But uh, anyway, Kate Miller just saw getting onto the trio there. Um, Fiona Beltram is now off the back at 88 metres and I suspect won't get on, but do bear in mind please that this is a long climb and perhaps Fiona's just uh, one of those canny climbers who does it at their own pace while everybody else uh, gets a little bit tired. Now if we look along the bottom um, of your, yeah, well done, uh, Miller's back on. So that's, um, let's have a look at her stats, shall we? Um, she's sitting on Kate Ouellette's, uh, do you think the train is deliberately, um, it's still going the same speed as a cyclist so that all the passengers can uh, watch the bike race. I mean, this is, um, imagine that, going to the Tour de France or the Giro d'Italia and, uh, you know, had a railroad along the uh, side of the uh, of the course and you just sat in a train <laughs> with the peloton. Um, actually, I did notice, um, I think in the Nice stage last year, the one that was basically uh, postponed uh, from the year before because of Covid, um, nice. Actually, I don't think that's, that's not right, is it? 
let me correct this. Uh, the starting towns um, and the finishing towns, and even some of those that you go to, pay money to have their towns featured. Uh, Jackie's pulling away a bit here, isn't she? She's just got 80 meters on the other two. That's pretty phenomenal. We'll go back to uh, Jackie. We're going to be here for a while, so we'll talk about Jackie a bit later. Just finishing off the point about the railroad. Um, the uh, stages, the, the towns that the Tour de France starts, finishes in, and, and some of the ones they go through, pay big money to have their towns included in the Tour de France because it's good for tourism, etc., um, and general image. And Nice um, also had the Attapted Tour. Now, the Attapted Tour, if you don't know, is basically um, an opportunity for riders to uh, go and ride the stage of the Tour de France, maybe 10 days before the actual pro race. It's massive, probably about 15,000 riders, something like that. Um, it's a huge event and it brings in a lot of money to the area. So equally, um, towns that are start finish towns will also go for, um, you know, perhaps hosting the Attapted Tour because that will bring in a hell of a lot of money. Now, uh, Nice, was the starting point in 2019 and it also had the uh, Etapju Tour uh, but because the Etapju Tour I couldn't have 15,000 riders coming down to uh, Nice during Covid that was cancelled um, but Nice had already sort of paid for it or something um, it was put into the 2020 race or I was sorry let me get that right. Sorry, it was 2020 that was cancelled, wasn't it? So it was a 2020 uh, race happened, but the tap to tour didn't. So Nice got a second bite of the cherry. And in 2021, it went back to Nice. Now, I remember watching this. And as they came down the valley um, of the river that uh, kind of ends up uh, coming out into the... Um, I'm just trying to think what the name of the river is. And I do know it, but I um, can't remember. But the river that comes down through Nice, past the football ground and out to the sea. Um, they came down that main road that... Uh, goes along the side of it and I do remember the railway tracks being there and I did, uh, I did wonder whether it would have been fun if the trains had actually uh, timed themselves uh, to uh, watch the riders but um, a train did go by if I remember and it stuck to its own schedule and went uh, either went by or got overtaken by a cyclist I can't remember which now um, but it's, it's a downhill um, direction train if you know Nice at all. Um, there's that sort of stony river that uh, comes down out of the Alps. Its name has escaped me at the moment. So we're still in the valley and if you look at the bottom of your screen as I always say during these commentaries um, you can see the profile of the course. Now this is only one lap so what you see at the bottom is uh, it's going to be done three times. Now the green sections are reasonably flat they're not necessarily dead flat but if you look at the top right hand corner of your screen you can see that the gradient there for these two is 0.9 but uh, seconds before before the camera switched uh, we were do you think they're gonna have to break this train <laughs> or is it all superbly lined up that the uh, train does not obstruct the riders wow that is cool um, when we switched over from uh, Jackie Godby uh, we had a zero in fact they're on zero now so they've got up to where she was so the gradient zero in the top right hand corner and if you look down at the bottom um, it tells us we've got a tailwind. You'll see a very big blob. Um, that's the riders we uh, focus on at any one given time. And the smaller little white blobs are the other riders. So, green means it's reasonably flat. If it goes orange, it's uh, a notable gradient, shall we say. And if it goes dark red, like you can see in the middle of the course, uh, that is a horrendous gradient. And if you look at that lump, that is a horrendous gradient for quite a long time. It we've seen from the profile and you can look up at the um, top left hand uh, sorry it's not there is it um, if you look at the top right hand corner um, you can see the sort of immediate gradient it doesn't give you the whole course okay so um, looking we, I mean, we did see the gradient earlier on when we were looking at the route uh, this is pretty much all the way uphill to the end of that or just past the end of that red section then we go downhill and you'll see the darker the blue the steeper the downward gradient um, so you'll see them, we've got these, you know, going down the side of the mountain um, and then you've got the green section where presumably we're going down the side of a valley and if you've ever ridden in mountainous areas, uh, which Colorado is noted for being, um, you will know that a lot of the main roads of course go along the valleys but rivers that they're going along are still effectively going uphill, um, albeit at a gentle gradient uh, where the river has worn out the valley over the years. So. So we, although we're going up a valley side here, um, 
it, uh, it is uphill nevertheless because the river is flowing up towards the mountains and it's only at that red bit where we actually get the uh, lump where we go up into mountains and if you look at the scenery and bear in mind that this is uh, a real road so it, it you know the scenery has been made uh, to replicate what really happens uh, in this area um, you can see that they're sizable mountains um, and uh, so we look at Fiona Beltram who's uh, presumably now decided to ride her own race she's 200 meters behind although as I say don't discount anybody in this um, well, she's got, this has gone up to 6.1% uh, percent gradient and she did slow down whereas you look at these guys uh, in second and third place um, Kate Ouellette and uh, Miller they uh, they're, they're looking at uh, minus two so they're, they're heading down so again if you look uh, in the bottom left hand corner you'll see the big uh, the big sort of white bubble thing uh, is the riders are on. Uh, they are on the green section, and of course uh, Fiona Beltram is on the orange section. So she was going up, and very shortly she will be going down like these guys. These guys are in 40 kph, uh, minus uh, sorry, a plus eight. Oh, in fact, uh, dropping to 35 now um, as they start riding uphill. 2.2 percent. Uh, that's quite a good speed. I've got a feeling they're going to slow down a bit more as it ramps up a little bit because you can see they're going into the next orange section at the bottom of your screen and 4.3% uh, down to 22 kph it's quite interesting how uh, how much your uh, speed drops when you hit one of these climbs um, and I don't know how one judges it other than by one's own standards I suppose um, but I know uh, that it, it, I don't know psychologically it seems to hit me worse uh, on these uh, e-races than it does in real life and I think that's because in real life I'm probably sort of taking my own visual um, account of what the hill looks like much more than I am uh, on a virtual race so I think it's uh, psychological but they always feel harder on uh, an e-race than in real life um, absolutely cracking graphics today well done um, to everybody at RGT for pulling this one off um, it's going to keep us uh, keep us very entertained. Um, it's, it's like a geography road trip, isn't it? I mean, I've never been to Colorado, so um, although for many years it's been on my uh, to-do list, but uh, I've, I've always loved to go to uh, Colorado. But um, I always end up settling for the Alps or potentially the Pyrenees. But uh, there we are. I will make it out there one day, I assure you. And of course, this um, rather like the. Uh, in the way that the French government used Tour de France as a great big uh, tourist marketing opportunity to the world. Um, this, in its own sweet way, is marketing Colorado to me. Now, Jackie Goodby. Now, she, my heart goes out to poor old Jackie. I say that. She's uh, not badly placed in the, um, in, in the overall standings. We'll come to that in a moment. But what that happened yesterday there's Jackie and uh, she's got that very focused face again isn't it same as yesterday you know absolutely knows what she's doing she's determined and uh, she's probably got her eyes on the figures as much as she has the road uh, with a great big uh, stars and stripes behind her letting us know that she is an all-american girl of course so uh, with Jackie um, I really really felt for her yesterday she absolutely pumped out um, a massive effort on the front all day yesterday uh, and she had uh, somebody on her wheel who uh, stole the race right at the end um, and it was uh, it was a little bit cruel um, shall we say I, 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 I did feel uh, very very sorry for her um, it was just the last in you know, a couple of hundred meters uh, where she got overtaken by Megan Isla however I think uh, Jackie has bigger things on her mind because, as I was saying, she is handily placed. Um, she's second at the moment in the uh, overall championship. Now, if she wins today, she will actually go top. Now, not every rider rides in every race, and this is a gruelling weekend because we had a 40k race yesterday, uh, an 80k race today. So there's a lot to be said for somebody like Jackie who could not only punch it out on the front um, all day yesterday uh, and say so was slightly uh, unluckily uh, put into second place uh, by a sprint from Megan Isla but uh, she's out here again today uh, of which most of her rivals are not now at the moment the uh, the lineup this series uh, standings are that uh, Anna Rankinen 
uh, from Finland is on 550 points. Now Jackie is 390 points. So you might say, well, okay, well there's 160 points different. If she wins, you get 200 points for this. So that would take her above Anna. Um, now I'm looking at the lineup today. Most of the other riders in contention aren't uh, aren't here today, and I suspect that what might happen for people like uh, Miller, uh, Ulet, and, and and even Fiona Beltram. I mean, she, Fiona's going to ride her own race here. Um, I think she's made that decision, but they're all going to score good points here. You know, 190 for second, 180 for third. So I. Um, I think these girls can move themselves up the rankings. And as the series pans out, you know, it will be interesting to see who does, um, you know, who does what in the terms of um, participation, um, not necessarily performance, but in terms of participation, uh, will some of these girls just go for every race and take the view that, well, you know, if I come fifth and get 100 points or something, or whatever fifth is, it's not it's more than 100 points, I should say, it's probably about 150. But, uh, you know, if I come fifth and get 150 points, um, <clears throat> you know, maybe I don't have to push myself. And maybe if Fiona Beltram uh, is is looking at it from that perspective today, that you know, come forth, pick up the points. So, uh, and it's interesting that only four uh, riders have taken up this challenge. Um, now I'm going to say I'm not surprised because I'm not sure that I would like to uh, do. And we're going up 4.8 percent. We notice the. Uh, Big balloon. Um, so look, basically, there's four riders, and these two together, they are the big balloon because that's who the camera's on. There's one in front, which we know is Jackie Godby, and there's one behind, which we know is Fiona Beltram. Um, can we have a look at uh, Miller's uh, stats? Do you think um, six percent? Uh, she's sitting behind Kate Ulett, um, taking in the draft, and she is. Oh, it's Kimberly Miller. Sorry, I was. I thought it was Katie Miller. Sorry, I do beg your pardon, Kimberly. I shall get that right from now on. Um, so, Kimberly Miller uh, is pushing out 318 watts, 3.7% uh, um, heart rate of 157, uh, riding at um, eight, a cadence of 87. Uh, speed on it doesn't seem to match for me, but uh, there we are. That's. Uh, what it is so that's quite a bit of effort um so we've got kate uh kimberly miller now sort of going on the front uh, which is going to require more effort 280 watts being pumped out there at 30 kph but of course the gradient's gone down to 0 0.2 they're past the little orange segment uh, but they've got that horrendous red bit coming up haven't they it's like yeah you know, ooh my god that's daunting um so where we are we've done eight kilometers um i think the uh how far are we guessing that must be less than a kilometer i would guess to the red bit and it looks to me as if jackie godby's about to hit it now we go under this banner and this is telling us that uh, we should go beyond and there's a white line across that and i think that's the start of the climb so uh this course does have segments so that's the start of the climb we've just gone over the white line go beyond of course is one of rgt's uh marketing phrases cliches whatever you want to call them uh the gradient up to 1.6 here for kate Ouellette, who's uh, sitting taking the uh, taking the draft up behind kimberly miller um she's uh probably not probably not a bad place to do this um Obviously, uh, one is aware that uh, whilst the effect of the draft is huge when you're on the flat and going fast, it is less so on the uphill. But um, I think every little bit of that saved energy counts when you're going uphill, doesn't it? We haven't, don't seem to have any numbers for Kate um, at the moment on the uh, digits at the bottom. I'm not sure quite why. Um, Jackie Godby's uh, now sort of firmly ensconced in the, uh, in the in the red section and we're about to hit it. So let's watch that gradient in the top right hand corner, shall we? Look, it's just jumped up from 2 to 4.3% uh, and I'm sure it's going to go up a little bit more. We're not quite off the uh, just green bit and I think any second now it should jump up from 4.3%. Uh, Kate Ouellet, uh saying 5.4 as i said it's going up i think it's going to go up a little bit more than that might be wrong but kate's uh, taking so we've got 5.4 for jackie who's further up the field you can see uh, now the uh, big 
balloon at the bottom is uh, the big white blob is with Jackie Godby. Um, 8.9. This hurts on RGT. <laughs> I think probably hurts on any platform. Um, but uh, I always think it hurts on RGT a little bit more. I think um, psychologically, and I don't quite know what Zwift do for their racing, but um, I think the settings in Zwift are a bit easier than they are in RGT. RGT is far more realistic. Right? Make no mistake. Uh, this is the realistic. I'm not talking about what the pictures look like. I'm talking about what it feels like to ride a bike and rate and be in a race. Uh, RGT is where you want to be. Um, it is, in my view, the best one. So Jackie got be now 350 uh, watts. She's pushing out as she goes up this eight percent section. Um, I can believe every watt of that, uh, Jackie. Go for it, girl. Um, you're doing well. You're doing well. <laughs> it's uh, about are you about halfway up the uh, red section, um, and of course you know you've only got to do it twice more as well. So <laughs> good luck with that. Uh, oh look, it must be feeling much easier. It's gone down to six point three percent. Believe me, you feel six point three percent. Eighteen uh, kph uh, is whacked itself up to seven percent, seven point six percent on the gradient. Beautiful graphics, beautiful graphics. Uh, nice of RGT to give us a sunny day in the graphics as well. Um, I think pretty much, uh, in fact, every rider here is from the Northern Hemisphere. So, uh, of course, uh, when you step outside your back door, it ain't going to look nothing like that, is it? <laughs> it's it's uh, going to be very, very different. And uh, mind you, if you don't, if you, I say that um, we did actually. Um, so I'm, I'm broadcasting from the UK, you might have spotted that from the accent. Uh, no UK riders in this, I'm afraid. So uh, I can be totally neutral. Uh, not that I'm uh, ever biased, but uh, we went out on a club run. So we're in the Northern Hemisphere, like you ladies. And uh, we actually got some sunshine this morning here in London. Didn't last for long, but we had some. Not as bright as this though, I'm afraid to say. Uh, this looks beautiful, doesn't it? Colorado in the summer must be absolutely glorious. I'm definitely going there. I'm definitely going there. So, uh, Kimberly Miller and Kate Ouellette are sitting together. I think they're going to ride the duration of this together from what I can tell. Because if they actually get up the uh, climb together, you might as well stick together for the race and just bash it out at the end. Uh, Fiona Beltram now. Um, I think she's doing quite well. I mean, she hasn't lost a massive amount. 400 metres on this sort of course with this sort of climbing is uh, nothing too great. And if, um, let's say she, she lost maybe 500 metres on a uh, per lap. Remember, this is three laps. Uh, you know, she lost something like 500 metres, 1.5 kilometres on a difficult course like this. That'd be more than respectable. And she'd earn a bag of points anyway. So, uh, you keep going, Fiona. You make sure you get those points. Um, and, you know, you can sort of snub all those uh, people who didn't bother turning up today because it looks a bit too daunting. Uh, it's well worth turning up because the amount of points you're going to bag in a small field. I think this is, uh, I mean, I, I have to say, I think these ladies are brave. And, and we have to take our hats off to uh, Jackie and Kate, who rode yesterday as well. That was quite a ferocious race yesterday. Um, and... As I say, Jackie was phenomenal. Um, as I say, uh, I say an unlucky loser. We know how cycle racing works, <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it is what it is. And I'm sure uh, Jackie's uh, well aware that that sort of things happen. And she probably must have gone through the scenario umpteen times during the race. Uh, while, as I say, <laughs> she had um, uh, the rider on her, uh, Megan Isla, on her wheel. Um, all through that race uh, but I, as I say Jackie um, I think I said it yesterday uh, people like you entertain us and as disappointed as you might have been with that uh, sprint finish which is literally right in the last couple hundred metres um, as unlucky as you might have felt and um, how unfair it might have seen Jackie um, you, I think one I see yourself a lot of fans from people like me and whoever else happened to be watching yesterday uh, I think you made a good account gave a good account of yourself and we uh, we salute you and if you get the points today uh, it would have all been worth it because you'll be top of the standings with Anna uh, Rankanen not competing today you've got to be in it to win it I think it's a phrase that we can apply to this so here we see Jackie um, grueling through 5.8% 
Uh, I wonder if her face is just as focused in the Zoom room as it has been. Every time we ever go over there, she's just so focused, isn't she? What a, what a wonderful rider. Um, we have a look at the Zoom room, see how uh, Jackie's getting on. <laughs> I bet she's got that same focused, determined face. There you are. Look, doesn't change a bit, does it? You wouldn't like to play, play poker against her, would you? You'd never know how she felt. <laughs> You'd have no chance. So uh, you keep going, Jackie. I think you deserve the win if you get it today. Um, just for you. what you achieved yesterday and how much you entertained us. Uh, absolutely splendid stuff. I see she's got aero bars on the front of her um, handlebars. I suppose they don't really uh, add anything when you're riding on any race. So I'm guessing that she probably uh, puts her bike onto the uh, turbo um, trainer or smart trainer, I suppose is the correct word. Uh, I, uh, which is interesting. I actually have. Um, I went out and bought when I when I um, really got into the uh, into the smart trainers. I just bought a very cheap frame and I just got all the bits and pieces out of my garage that I'd taken off other bikes, slammed them on there, uh, and put a permanent um, mishmash of a bike uh, on the smart trainer. So uh, not not the um, not the sort of bike you would be riding around some swish urban park showing off um, to your mates uh, it is a bit of a mishmash of old bits and pieces uh, although I will say it is colour coordinated I mean, in fairness it isn't, uh, it's not too ridiculous right yellow it is so that um, so that nobody can see me nobody will see me because it's in the garage anyway you don't want to see me this is who we want to watch uh, our warriors out there on this uh, absolutely beautiful course and uh, I can't wait to get around again and see that train I guess we're not going to see that train again now I don't know the absolute ins and outs of this but somewhere in this there, there is a, uh, a real live open air race uh, that you can take part in I'm assuming that this banner up here is the top of the climb um, because if you look at the top right hand corner you can see um, so I see uh, Kimberly Miller is just going to get that segment. I don't know if there's any points for the segment. I don't think there is. I'm not aware. Um, but you can see that little line um, on the top right hand corner. She's about to go over there and she goes under this barrier uh, which has a white line which tells us it's the end of the segment. Uh, this route definitely has segments. I'm not sure if they um, get you anything in this race. So uh, somebody might might not want to correct me on that. Jonah out of the saddle, just giving it that uh, bit of extra room because it's nine percent and it drops down to two percent. So I think we'll probably see her get back onto the saddle any moment now. Uh, don't forget the avatar doesn't quite react um, immediately to uh, whether you are in or out of the saddle. And in fact, actually, um, if you really stomp the pedals when you're sitting in them, um, it sometimes thinks that you're. Uh, out of the saddle because of the way you're pushing the pedals. Phone her on 200 uh, watts out, but now she's not wearing a heart meter, uh, so you're not uh, seeing anything in the right hand column. Uh, next to that is speed, which is pretty much mirroring what's in the top right hand corner. So we go up 6.9% of gradient, and her heart, um, her cadence, sorry, is 90. And she's out of the saddle again, is it? It's 5.8. She, I always remember. Um, I mean, I'm sure many, many professional cyclists have, have said it over the years. Um, but I do remember um, once in particular um, an interview with Art Lance Armstrong where he, he made the point that um, sometimes you just get out of the saddle on some of these climbs just to change the muscle you're using uh, for a few, you know, for 100 metres or something like that, um, rather than you actually need to be out of the saddle. I did, I, and I did wonder at the time um, whether or not that... Uh, in fact, you know, you, you could actually disguise things by making it look as if you needed to get out the saddle because uh, you were struggling a little bit um, and confuse your rivals, you know, in that sort of game of poker or chess or whatever. Uh, Kate Ouellette uh, lost uh, Kimberly Miller just at the top of that climb. I get the impression Kate's uh, chasing her down and wants to get back on her wheel. The distance is 62 metres at the moment. Uh, we'll see how much she's pulling that in. Uh, does Kimberly want to get away? She's ramped it up to 75 metres now. I think uh, Kimberly might, yeah, she's 83 metres now. I think Kimberly wants to go solo. I don't think she wants Kate Ouellette uh, with her. 
that said um and i mentioned this a few times in the commentary yesterday uh sometimes for reasons i have never worked out otherwise i'd be good at it um some riders seem to make better fists of the ascent uh, descent sorry uh better fists of the descent uh, than others and i think there's some people who just go i suspect maybe for a high gear um and push down the hill much more than they need to but some of us um, probably just spin down the hill trying to get a breath back from the climb so uh, it seems to me that uh, Kimberly Miller has pulled out a couple of hundred uh, I don't know we'll have to see um, we're on Jacqueline Cobby now let's go back we'll go back to that uh, Miller Ouellette uh, battle a little bit later um, I just uh, I don't uh, I don't know 100 it's over 100 meters I think so anyway, Jacqueline uh, Godby is about to go through another banner, and this time it does, always does have the. I, I heard there was two segments on this course. So this must be the other segment. Uh, Jacqueline uh, suddenly going up at uh, 3.9%, uh, pushing out just under 300 watts. It's now gone over 300 watts as she does his second ascent. Um, so to say, this this course definitely has segments. Um, look at that a fantastic little river don't you love mountain rivers i mean the water's always so clean isn't it and you can see through it and and everything like that and uh, and when you're going up a mountain on a really hot day and you can't actually get down to the water it just looks like you so refreshing that you would like to jump in but you can't um you have to keep going up your bike sweltering and uh Boy, I, we've all done a few mountain climbs where we've uh, sweltered up on a hot day. I think my, uh, I think the record, um, I think it's something that hit like 40 degrees centigrade or something. I mean, I can't remember. It was astonishingly high. It might be just under 40, but it was certainly well over 35 degrees uh, centigrade when I was going up the Col de Madeleine uh, in the French Alps one day. And it was murder. <laughs> it was absolute murder. Um, the downhill was so nice afterwards. Kimberly Miller is clear, isn't she? She's now got uh, the thick end of 200 metres on Kate Ouellette. She's lost her. Um, we say that. Um, I think there's plenty of time for Kate to make that up. In fact, it's come down to 160 metres. So I think maybe Kate is chasing. Maybe uh, Kimberly is a good descender and she's just gone over the line and is now ascending, I guess. Um, oh no, it's a descent segment, isn't it? If you look at the... Uh, oh, it's green, isn't it? Mm, very shallow descent. Um, anyway, so I, I'd say I don't... Um, I don't think we should write off Kate yet. It's snuck up to 200 metres again. Um, Watch this one with interest. Uh, you know, does Kate want to chase down um, Kimberly Miller, or uh, does Kimberly Miller want to go away? Does it actually suit them? I mean, bear in mind, we've got 67 kilometres to go. I'm not sure I would like to ride 67 kilometres solo, but of course, you know, these riders have different agendas. Um, if you know that the rider you're up against um, is stronger than you in sprint, then probably the best way is to actually distance them during the race. We see Kimberly here. Um, what's the distance now? She's whacked that up. It's 300 meters now. I think that is going to stick, isn't it? That is going to stick because, uh, as I say, you know, I, I think 300 meters is now getting to the stage. Well, no sooner do I say that, and it goes down to 240. Now, the, probably the reason it's just dropped down to 240 is Kate is going uphill. So we can see here now the 2.8% uh, gradient as she goes over that white line uh, presumably for a segment uh, here because we've got a little bit of orange um, it's very faintly orange just underneath us 3.9% this is uh, no doubt a segment and the distance has gone all the way down to 170 meters uh, for Kate uh, Ouellette but of course Kate Ouellette is now going to go onto this same climb as we've seen otherwise lovely river scenes probably the same one we saw before but I'll, I'll pretend I've never seen it before every time we go past. How's that? And uh, there's a, one of the things I've um, learned o over the years is that uh, if you sit and listen to commentators, um, oh, what a fantastic shot. <laughs> brilliant, absolutely brilliant. 
loving this loving this real road so um as i say the uh one of the things you notice about commentators is obviously they have to keep uh, keep telling you things and sometimes things are happening and they have to think very quick very quickly and they make mistakes so uh there's nothing there's nothing more much more fun than listening to a commentator and uh yeah, you know, oh, that's not right. That's not right. That's not right. You got your facts wrong there, mate. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, on on purpose, obviously, um, I put in loads and loads of little, uh, not quite correct facts. I would never put a lie in, but uh, some of the. Well, if you if you think that I've said something that's not quite accurate, remember it's deliberate just to keep you entertained and to check that you're watching. Okay, it's it's not uh, a lack of my knowledge. Couldn't possibly be, could it? Yeah, right. Okay, so uh, we're looking at thick on that now. Um, I, I have to say, I, I think anybody who can sit and do 83 kilometres uh, on their own um, in uh, in their pain cave at home on a smart trainer, uh, not even having another back wheel to look uh, towards and having no uh, benefit of the draft of the rider in front, uh, I think if you can do that, you are a star. Um, we have four wonderful stars here. Uh, Jackie Godley, Kimberly Miller. Look at it. Oh, look. This is, you've actually seen, for the first time, Jackie Godley's facial expression change. And that's because she took a drink. Look at that. Look at that determination. This girl knows what she wants to do, doesn't she? And uh, more power to you, girl. And that's what she looks like as an avatar. Same face. Absolutely determined, focused. And... Uh, the face of a winner, uh, and I think you were a winner yesterday, Jackie, even though the results don't stay that. She's enjoying a little bit of respite uh, now down this descent. There's a very bit of, a very faint bit of orange coming up, and the end of the lap is in sight. I mean, we're probably looking at, uh, what was it, about 27, so we're about eight kilometers from the end of the lap, and we can go do it all again. I hope they're gonna send the train past so we can uh, see that again. That will be uh, most enjoyable. I'm going to have to go and ride this, aren't I? I um, I haven't been on RGT for a little while, and that is down to a number of reasons. One of them was that I was waylaid with COVID, but I'm over that now, um, and I need to start getting back on my bike. Um, I've been out two, three times uh, outdoors in the last uh, eight days, which is my return to cycling, but. Uh, some rides on RGT are going to have to start with this course. This is awesome, isn't it? Absolutely awesome. Loving this one. So some great real roads coming out on RGT. Uh, it's a very different concept to the more popular Zwift, or and it hasn't got that sort of kind of real life element that you see on things like Fulgas and Ruby. Um, it's in its own sphere. It uh, what it seeks to do is actually repli replicate. Uh, Real racing, as much as it possibly can, with the technology we have so far. So, um, <clears throat> yes, uh, I think in the next year or two, you're going to start seeing steering coming into these races. Um, I And you will tell me that it already exists, and that's right, but you have to have a certain trainer, um, and it doesn't kind of really, really work if, if everybody else hasn't got it, does it? Um, so I think, as I say, we're... Um, we're a year or two away from that becoming, I think, a universal feature of these. Uh, braking, um, and this is one of the great things about RGT, it does brake. Um, unfortunately, you don't decide when you brake, it does. Um, but, you know, it's one step ahead of the competition in terms of you actually get braking around corners. You know, we've all been on a Zwift corner and gone round at 80 kph, uh, turning 90 degrees and wondering how the hell, you know, anybody on a bike could do that. Um, and the draft uh, and the reality of the dynamics and racing are better. Although I will tell you that I'm never ever going to win a race. Um, it's not true, I won one actually. It was quite a small one. I did, some, about a year ago I think I did win one. I was as shocked as anybody else. Um, but uh, anyway, the um, I, I'm not going to be one of the guys at the front. So these like, milliseconds uh, don't make a lot of difference to me. But uh, certainly the guys who are good racers uh, tell me that RGT is the one to be on. And uh, I think it's absolutely splendid that uh, Echelon Racing and USA Cycling have got involved with RGT. Um, Echelon Racing was on RGT last year. I remember Jonathan Crane uh, 
a man from Alabama um, going on about it. Um, if you don't know Jonathan Crane, uh, he's well worth watching on his streams, uh, Birmingham, Alabama, Alabama, and a regular racer across platforms um, with some great old uh, podcasts on YouTube. Um, you can catch up, I mean, talking about YouTubers, uh, ZMS is um, basically, I mean, these stream mainly on Facebook, but I think you can see them on YouTube too. Uh, so look out for those. Uh, ZMF really providing some excellent uh, production values to these races, and it's really, um, I, I, I'm not going to suggest that we've quite got the uh, helicopter from the Tour de France showing you uh, the Chateau of Colorado, um, and I'm assuming Colorado doesn't have Chateau, but uh, it, it, um, it, it's as close as anything I've seen. I think this is uh, this is good. Um, so I'm delighted to be part of it. I'm delighted our four ladies have turned out uh, today in this uh, Echelon Racing Ladies League. Uh, we need some more ladies, really, but uh, you know, let's admire the ones we've got. Eh? Uh, they are absolute warriors, and the Amazon warriors. Uh, for you younger viewers, uh, you need probably to look up what uh, an Amazon warrior was. Um, and it certainly is nobody who's delivering something that you order on the internet, uh, as you might immediately think. It's something uh, far more traditional than that, going back um, thousands of years in human history. Anyway, um, the bicycle doesn't go back thousands of years, does it? I'm Funny enough, I'm reading a bike book, A History of Bikes. Um, and some of the first uh, bikes were invented and um, they, it's quite interesting I'm not very far into it actually and uh, it's some of the early um, ideas that people had and of course uh, you'll probably know this but they had those um, bikes where you didn't actually have pedals and you just pushed yourself along with your feet uh, no brakes or anything like that um, and it's quite an interesting book I mean it tells you how these uh, riders you know began to realise that uh, they were wearing their shoes out faster than they uh, really should be because of the uh, way the bikes were and um, each little uh, each little advance comes much slower you know that was a world where um, people communicated less uh, and it, communications were slower and of course you know somebody could invent something in one country and it might be two years before it was heard of uh, in the next country so uh, you know progress is a little bit slow but you can see those early designs of bikes um, and I'm sure as I get through the book, um, the design ideas will come uh, quicker and faster than they did in those early days. So uh, cycling's only probably been around realistically 150 years. Uh, but how far has it come? When I look at those bone shakers in that book, and by the way, I've been to um, cy uh, veteran, uh, sorry, veteran cycle rallies uh, for bikes that are you know, more than 100 years old. and uh, they, they look horrible to ride. Um, wooden wheels with metal around the edge, uh, brakes that just, I mean, you would hardly recognise them as brakes, they're just little pads that go on the front of the wheel. And uh, and, they're, and they're not even rubber or anything like that, they're just sort of probably blocks of wood or you know, another bit of metal, so they're probably screeched uh, and so on and so forth. But they look horrendously uncomfortable. Uh, whereas here we are today on RGT, broadcast by ZMS, uh, watching four wonderful ladies compete in an echelon racing uh, USA cycling event uh, they're sitting in their homes they probably don't live anywhere near each other I'm sure that Kimberly Miller doesn't live anywhere near the other three and uh, with the size of the USA uh, there's no guarantee that um, any of the other three uh, live any closer to her and uh, just to put that in perspective uh, and I know I'm switching to Canada here the uh, I remember as a, a young lad uh, my best friend emigrated to Canada and um, I remember our school teacher pointing out that um, he's going over to Vancouver and <clears throat> the school teacher said that the uh, east coast of Canada was nearer to London than it was the west coast of Canada which was a bit of a wow because <laughs> it sounded to me in those days that Canada uh, was probably sort of several planets away and to think that uh, the other side of Canada was even further than that uh, so more than twice the distance uh, sounded phenomenal absolutely phenomenal and um, like all the things of best friends you know you promise that you'll write all the letters I think we wrote about one each and got bored of that and uh, have never come across each other since so there so if, if you are uh, <laughs> I don't know if by any chance you're into cycling and watching this Neil yeah right <laughs> 
All the best, mate. <laughs> um, there was a program on TV, wasn't there? Like, um, this is your life, and they dug out some old friend that you hadn't seen for 50 years. Uh, maybe, maybe somebody will do that for me one day. Um, you think they'll have me on a program like that, you know, where they document my life, you know, the history of commentating on RGT? You never know. You never know. So Kimberly Miller now is nearing 500 metres ahead of Kate Roulette and that is, I think, decisive. Uh, Fiona Beltram is further 2.4, um, well, you know, not further 2.4, but further 1.9 um, kilometres behind uh, Kate and Jackie got beat. Now, a clear two and a half kilometres in front. Now, um, we are, of course, uh, in a very, very long race. Uh, there is always a risk of tecanicals. I'm sure these accomplished ladies, though, have got their bike and uh, internet set up uh, to optimum standards and professional, excuse me, professional standards. Uh, but you can't be, you know, you can't be certain because, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, there is, you know, things like power outages and, you know, your internet supply uh, service provider um, messing something up. So uh, nothing certain. Um, I'll say, uh, if there's an old phrase, isn't there? It ain't over till the fat lady uh, wins. But I think it would be more appropriate um, if, on this, if we said it ain't over till the cycling lady wins. Uh, which sort of rhymes. It's probably got a similar amount of syllables, so we'll go with that. Uh, it ain't over till the cycling goddess wins. How's about that? And the cycling goddess today is Jane Godby, and as I say, she won some admirers yesterday uh, for that phenomenal ride she did, only to be pipped at the end. But uh, I'm afraid that is bike racing, somebody sitting on your wheel, um, the old wheel sucker sandbagging behind you. Uh, just to nip it away in the last 200 meters uh, with a very strong sprint and we can't um, we can't deny that Megan Isla had to uh, she had to sort of match Jackie all the way around um, she's taking the draft but you know she was still taking uh, you know doing a phenomenal pace and it ain't always easy if the person behind is uh, dry, riding in a determined um, possessed way in the way that uh, Jackie clearly does and we've seen We've seen her on the bike uh, visually, haven't we? And we've just seen how focused and determined she looks. Um, so you can't take that away from Megan. And the sprint was quite decisive and strong. So uh, as unlucky as Jackie was, I have to say that I think Megan's sprint at the end was uh, a power play. It was good. Um, you know, in some ways it merited the win because it was a good sprint. But uh, you just couldn't help but feel sorry for Jackie, could you? Put it this way, if, we, if I were watching this with my wife, um, and my wife loves the breakaway to win if we're watching Tour de France. Uh, she's not into cycling, I have to say. She doesn't like cycling. But unfortunately, um, when the Grand Tours like Tour de France and the Giro d'Italia are on, um, unfortunately, our TV screen tends to have them being broadcast. And uh, she, of course, naturally always wants the breakaway person to win the stage. And how many times have we seen them struggling to get up the... Uh, last 500 meters with the peloton bearing down on them uh, and whizzing past and going from first to 31st in about 10 meters that's bike racing it's what makes it entertaining and fun doesn't it so uh, kate ulette here is probably going to have to settle for third and uh, now the long lonely ride um on her own uh for another 58.5 kilometers and we're probably realistically, it has to be said, at the stage where the order they are in is probably how they're going to finish. But before we jump to that conclusion, let's have a look at the bottom of the screen. We can see quite clearly there that uh, the the big blob, uh, which is Kate in third, is on the first lap still I'm just um, trying to work this out that doesn't um, quite work for me I'm missing something here um, I'm just wondering if Jackie could be Jackie could be must be on the it actually it's slightly hidden it, um, sorry you just uh, talk amongst yourselves while I uh, try and reset the way my screen set up because um, I was missing uh, 
So I say Jackie is of course, yes. So Jackie's actually on the second lap now, and there's the railroad. That's the bit we love, isn't it? Every old bloke loves a train set, don't they? It's a, <laughs> a virtual train set. Um, so okay. So uh, yeah, Jackie is on the second lap. Sorry, my the way I had my screen set up, um, I was just missing something. Uh, on the profile at the bottom there, but that's uh, sorted out. Uh, so we can see that the other three ladies are completing lap one. Um, and as I say, actually, I mean, the gap, if you look at the perspective of it all, the, the gap between, if you, and we look at the bottom right hand corner here, the gap between um, Kimberly and Kate is, is not huge. Um, and certainly the gap between. Uh, those two and both uh, Fiona at the back and uh, Jackie at the front um, he, he's quite decisive now looking at his profile if we cast our eyes to the left of course when they do get on to um, the next part of the course it, it's basically this long climb up a valley uh, and then those three little orangey sections where there's a bit of a ramp and then of course that um, that big steep lump and of course there is always the possibility that um i'm sure i'm sure that's the um well that'll be the flam rouge but it's not the flam rouge it's only for this lap i think one kilometer to go um it's flam rouge but it's not uh, it's not flam rouge yet is it because it's three laps um so like i say um kimberly miller is decisively uh, now 700 meters in front of kate but you, you do wonder if the next section of this race when they get on to lap two might change all that who knows let's see uh, let's see who's got the hills uh, legs for the hills shall we um who's got their climbing legs on today which one of these ladies is going to be queen of the mountains uh meilleur on her as the french say it uh we shall see they went up together of course in the first lap so we didn't really see um, any signs to give us a clue as to which would be the strongest if they're riding solo and uh, so Kimberly's only on 0.1% uh, gradient at the moment um, so it's not uh, not anything that's going to give it the game away so far let's see what pans out 55 kilometers to go we've done 27 so we're about a third of the way through the race we've been racing for 50 minutes uh so you can expect another one hour 40 before we finish and that assumes that um they ride at the same pace and of course i don't wish to state the obvious but i'm going to uh, the longer the race goes on the more tired people tend to get as you may have noticed when you're out riding yourself on the other hand there are people who pace themselves and save a bit for the end um and tactically that might uh, that might be quite a cool thing to do wonderful graphics again aren't they um these buildings on the side i wonder if they're sort of like houses or industrial units it's hard to tell uh that's because the camera moves too quickly but it, I, i'm absolutely loving this course i've got to go and ride it and i can uh, get back on i'll only do the one lap though is that okay I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> these brave hearts out here doing three, going over that mountain three times, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I salute you, but I'm not going to emulate you, sorry, one lap for me. Great graphics, this is, uh, I haven't read, the, I haven't ridden the Leuven one either yet, um, for various reasons, but uh, I think I've done a little bit of it, but um, I had some issues, uh, I went away, um, went away and then I got COVID and it's been a long time since I've actually ridden properly online so uh, got a lot of catching up to do as we go over the railroad can't believe I said that it's a British same railroad ouch there are those those units again they look industrial rather than uh, residential don't they so uh, I wonder what the industries are around here forestry I guess in um, maybe they're railroad buildings who knows who knows? They're built alongside it. As I say, I think this is a Rio Grande uh, railroad. Uh, I think the region is Durango in Colorado. Uh, I don't profess uh, to be a geographical expert about the region uh, in any shape, manner, or form. Um, but I believe that this area was developed by the opening up of the railroad 
um, back in the 19th century. And, um, and I think so much, I mean, you see this, uh, you go back to the history of many, many towns. I mean, they, they were there. I mean, we were in St. Louis yesterday um, for the Gateway Classic where the uh, winner, winners uh, qualified for the UCI e-racing world championships in February. Uh, but St. Louis, for example, is on the Mississippi River, uh, and the reason it evolved as a town is because the trade up and down the river um, required various places that, I suppose, you know, goods could be traded, could be distri distributed from, and things like that. And certainly, railroads uh, opened up a um, the possibility for towns all over the place, and uh, quite often the railroad would open up the town. Uh, open up the communities and it would make them contactable. People could build towns in different areas and exploit regional things, whatever that might be, agriculture, etc. Uh, and of course, and if we look at the topography here, um, the fact that we're going up uh, valleys, uh, apart from the big climb in the middle, um, again, roads and railroads would use these valleys as the softest way uh, to go up gradients uh, as opposed to hillsides. And this is where you get the communities developing from. And uh, we've uh, there's an interesting ride I do locally to where I live, um, and it's uh, a kind of lesson in the economic speculation that goes with these things. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. But the um, way back, and I assume I'm guessing in the 1800s, uh, the late 1800s, uh, what is now um, in London's uh, what you guys in the US would call the subway, but we call the underground. Uh, our underground railway, um, the very first one in the world, in fact, was the Metropolitan Line in London. And the Metropolitan Railway was expanded and expanded uh, from its central, line, uh, central London origins. Now, the bits they expanded outwards with weren't actually underground, but the first original bit was the first underground railway in the world. But as the Metropolitan Railway expanded out, um, they kind of realised that if you built the railway out there and you had all the land around it, you could build lots of houses and people would snap them up because now you could get out of the smoke and grime of London and live further out uh, in cleaner air and get the train into work every day. And of course, like everything, sometimes people don't know when to stop. And they carried on building this thing and it went further and further out, way beyond uh, where it should do. And there are the remains of these railway tracks and stations uh, right out um, almost as far as Oxford, which will mean a lot not mean a lot to you if you're not from the area but um, it's all since been closed down but the speculation was that they build all these railroad stations and villages and towns would pop up around the station because people could get to London easily and they would make a fortune on selling the uh, selling the land and the houses the testimony is they went too far people didn't want to live that far out and as I say there are the remains of railway stations if you know where to look uh, and railroad tracks uh, in the middle of fields and you think why is there a station there and there, there is no reason other than that somebody speculated that they could make a lot of money uh, from building houses around it and the houses never materialized and the railroad got shut down and uh, I do remember uh, <clears throat> I, I devised a, a ride where you could go and visit all these old remnants and, and not pass them and there's one village there where the, every single house uh, is quite clearly a railroad house because you you can tell by the architecture just take it from me but you realize that there's no reason for this village at all other than two railway lines converged and so therefore there were railway workers there to look after the signals and the points and things like that uh, and you can just tell by the architecture they're railway buildings um, and there's no other reason whatsoever and both the railway lines that went through there that converged have long since shut down and got overgrown um, so, going back to those buildings on the side of the road, um, you can probably, uh, hence my guess, that they might be railroad buildings because they're built along the side there. We're still riding alongside the railroad uh, land as we look at Kate Ouellet. Uh She's riding at 29 kph, up a gradient of just under 1%. Uh, you see another one of those little bridges. I love all these bridges. Um, one of the things, when I've been driving in the USA, the amount of those um, bridges you can see, sometimes you get views, uh, I, I'm not saying, I don't know how typical this is of the USA, and maybe it's uh, 
a coastal thing that you see more than, but just the amount of iron bridges uh, going over um, rivers uh, that you see in the US and, and they're quite spectacular big bridges perhaps um, perhaps because I'm near the coasts when I see these things the rivers are wider than I'm used to but uh, I always think it's, it's a mark of the USA that the amount of iron railway bridges and, and road bridges uh, that you have so we cross the railroad and if I remember we start losing it somewhere uh, from here uh, we can see that uh, Kate is about to finish lap one and she will then be going uphill for a substantial amount of time um, for the next 20 minutes. Uh, as we look at Kimberly Miller now uh, on 4.6% gradient, uh, now a whopping great big 660 metres in front of Kate. And um, I'm just looking at that. Fiona Beltram has disappeared. So I'm assuming Fiona has decided not to complete the race which is a shame because uh you know if you can you pick up the points but uh she might have looked at that mountain and thought two more times so that is a bit too much so it looks like we're down to three riders um now in this uh which uh, means everybody's going to get a podium place on the positive side on the negative side kate you might finish uh last but hey ho last or third Tell everybody you finished third. That's the way to do it. That's the way. Okay. Jackie Godby, I think, is going to get the win that she probably felt she deserved yesterday. Uh, we still got 51 meet, uh, kilometers to find out. And Kimberly Miller uh, riding along. Um, one of the things I notice about these uh, German riders, they all seem to wear that kit of uh, white jersey and black shorts. And if you're, uh, um, I'll use the American term here, soccer fan. Um, for Europeans football of course but uh, if you're a soccer fan uh, you will probably know that the German national team uh, were exactly the colours that uh, Kimberly is sporting today black shorts and the white shirt and um, England fans know all about that because uh, England uh, it's funny enough they probably don't lose to Germany as much as uh, as much as they think they do but uh, uh, England uh, do seem to sort of get very upset when they lose a football match against Germany uh, and they have lost quite a few important ones particularly in big competitions so uh, funny thing is the England kit is not too dissimilar it's the same as that but with blue shorts but there we are so uh, Kimberly looking very very Germanic shall I say uh, in that white and black strip uh, known internationally across the world for the local football soccer team uh, on the other hand, uh, Jackie Godby is wearing the, uh, I suppose you could describe that as red, white and blue of the uh, the uh, the um, Stars and Stripes flag, couldn't you? So uh, she's patriotically got the US kit on and so is Kate, so uh, I think, anyway, um, is it the same kit or not? I'm not sure, we'll have to, we'll have to look at Kate's kit at the moment. This is... Um, Welcome to the next edition of Cycling Fashion, uh, what you should be wearing on the road. Uh, you don't have to wear your country's national colours, by the way, um, but it just seems that the uh, the German rider has... Uh, so here's, a, here's an interesting thing. Um, it always confuses me as to why sometimes teams, uh, a nation's sports kit doesn't actually match the colours of their flag, because I, I would naturally expect that to happen. I think the USA makes a big point of making sure that it's a, a red, white and blue kit. Pretty sure the French do. Um, England does not. Um, the England, uh, most England kits uh, do not match the St George's flag. Uh, there's always a dilemma because here in Britain we never quite sure whether you're racing for the individual four countries that make up the United Kingdom or you're racing for the United Kingdom. In cycling it's always the United Kingdom or Great Britain. and. Uh, the kits there, uh, the cycling kits do tend to have our national colours, but some of our other sports uh, do not, as um, Jackie just overtakes one of the uh, camera cyclists. So you see the fourth, fifth and sixth position of the black kits, uh, they're actually uh, camera um, cyclists, so that's how, uh, this is how all these pictures get to you. I mean, when you've got big field, you don't notice uh, them tucked in there, but uh, when three out of the six are actually cameras, um, it's a bit more obvious. So, uh, so yeah, cycling. Welcome back to Cycling Fashion uh, Blog. Um, no, you don't have to wear your national uh, kit. I, I don't. Um, so it's, uh, 
Uh, I think you can race in these things without wearing national kit. So I don't, uh, I don't think we should read too much into the fact that all our ladies here seem to be patriotic. But one of the things, as I'm saying, that um, you know, what, the German kit being black and white, um, and yet their uh, flag is black, uh, red, and yellow, um, always bemused me a little bit. The Italian um, Italian sport seems like a football team where um, blue kit, but the Italian flag is. Uh, red green and white um, and I had that explained to me that the um, the reason why the Italian national soccer kit is blue is um, it wasn't chosen to match the Italian flag and it was um, the blue was from the royal blue of the house of Savoy and if you're familiar with your Italian history you'll know that basically the country was pulled together by a chap called Gary Baldi because it was lots of principalities before that uh, a couple still remain, of course, San Marino and uh, the Vatican are not part of Italy. But uh, most of the states pulled together and the same thing happened in Germany. And the, uh, when they decided on the uh, colours for the football team, the soccer team, uh, they chose the House of Savoy, which was one of the royal houses of one of the principalities, uh, and quite an important principality, uh, that formed the New Italy. So the blue in the Italian uh, soccer strip comes from the House of Savoy, not from the flag. Uh, Germany, um, I don't really know quite why, but um, it never occurred to me uh, of being born post the Second World War. Um, but I did eventually learn one day uh, that, the, of course, if you look at the time of the Second World War, the German flag was not uh, red, yellow and black. It was uh, black, white and uh, red. So um, the yellow replaced the white. And this, I suspect, is because, I mean, rather like the French uh, have their Fifth Republic, so every time it all goes wrong, they just start from scratch. Um, I think the German constitution uh, was restarted after World War II, and the flag changed just to put the uh, past behind them and the yellow put in instead of the white. So I suspect that some of the uh, sports colours of black and white uh, relate back to the flag that Germany had uh, prior to the finish of World War II. That's my theory. Uh, if anybody knows, you can post up uh, on Facebook and it will come up on screen, I suspect. Uh, I might be wrong. So, here we have Jackie, that same determined face. Um, gosh, she, she, this girl knows what she's doing, doesn't she? She's absolutely, uh, absolutely focused. Her eyes don't even flicker, do they? I mean, she's looking at that road. I, I, I suspect she's looking at the data rather than the road because I don't think you really need um, as fascinating as it is, I suspect she's trying to keep her, her data uh, in, in the right order. Um, she's not on those tri bars yet, of course, um, which I'll say tongue in cheek, don't take that too seriously. Uh, this looks like a proper pain case, isn't it? You can see all the kit lying around and um, water bottles. Uh, oh, she does actually swear. I mean, she might look all that. So she looks very cool, but it looks like she actually, uh, she is human after all, she sweats. <laughs> And uh, I hope she's got. I hope you got a good fan under there, uh, Jackie. Um, it's uh, it, it's very very painful if you don't. I mean, it, the amount of, you just watch. Uh, you think you think the floor's going to flood if you don't have a um, fan underneath. Eight point two percent. I bet she's going through it, isn't she? But uh, once you're over the top of this, she's getting to the steepest bit. You'll see that even that big red chunk in the middle that she's going up, and she, she's a big white blob. You see it's slightly more orange in the lower bit and it gets really red in the second half. Uh, so she's in that second half. Um, it's easing off a little bit. Oh no, it's back up to 8.6. Um, I think to do 18 kph uh, on an 8.6 on an RGT course is very, very commendable. Um, that is good riding. I mean, 20 kph halfway up a climb like this, 5.2% uh, after what you've just done. Um, 38 kilometers into a race uh, that's strong riding uh, Jackie's a strong rider and uh, I think she convinced us all of that yesterday and every time I see her on that turbo um, I'm convinced that she is really is a force of nature she's uh, a strong rider and I think she is going to be a very worthy leader in the uh, in the ladies series by the end of this race with uh, Anna Rankin and uh, not being part of it today, and currently the leader in the ladies uh, series. Um, 
just recap if you weren't here earlier. Uh, so Anna Rankern, uh from uh, Finland is current leader of the ladies series with 550 points. Uh, Jackie Godby, who we see um, as a potential winner of this race, is in second place on 390 points. Uh, Gabrielle Schumann, who's not racing today, 360. Eva Dora, 360. Lisa Haag, uh, 335. And Erska Corrent at 320. Now, none of those ladies are racing today apart from uh, Jackie Godby. Um, of the uh, other ladies racing today, uh, sorry, Eva Dora's racing. Uh, no, she's not. She, she entered, but she didn't race. Um, Fiona Beltram has dropped out. Uh, Kate Ouellet, though, um, has uh, got points on the board and could have find herself amongst that uh, clutch of, um, and I read out the top six. Um, I think Kate could find herself uh, handily in the top six uh, with a, a decent result today. And third would be a decent result, uh, and I think probably take her into the top six. So it's well worth uh, Kate completing this. She might finish third and last, but there'll be a good points haul to go with that. So uh, more power to you as uh, we are looking at J uh, Jackie getting over the top of the climb. So she's got the big long descent. There are a couple of little um, uphill, well, slight ramps out on the way. Uh, and there we go. Um, Jackie is probably going to st string out her uh, spin out her lead a bit further as she takes advantage of that descent before the others reach it. Uh, we're looking at uh, Kimberly Miller uh, hitting the 7% ramp at 14.9. Now you see that's interesting isn't it? I mean that's sort of 3 or 4 um, kph slower than Jackie was pushing that out uh, and that's a marked difference. And Kimberly is you know in a strong second position. I think she's uh, distanced herself enough from Kate Ouellette uh, to probably, as long as nothing goes wrong, secure that second spot. And it has eked out a bit. Um, so I, th I think Kate's probably going to have to settle um, settle for last place. And we'll see. I mean, they're both coming up to the... Um, I'll say that. They're both coming up to the uh, next uh, big climb. Well, there we are. We can actually see that Jackie does um, change position occasionally. So, uh, oh, it's because she's just sweating and uh, mopping her brow. Uh, just turn the fan up a bit, it'll be fine. Uh, adjusting the chewing gum, of course, uh, vital when you're riding. And she does look like kind of quite calm, doesn't she? It's no, uh, <laughs> it's, it's no sort of like, you know, gritted teeth and grimacing going on there, is there? So, we're at uh, Jackie on the left, and we've got Kate Ouellette uh, on the right. And I don't think Kate, I mean, the interesting thing, I mean, Kate's uh, just going to finish off lap two here. And, um, sorry, that's, uh, that can't be right. So what have we got here? Um, must be one into lap two. I'm a little bit confused because the uh, blob on the bottom looks like they're at the end of um, the lap, but I don't think that can be right. So, uh, Kate Miller's actually got 42. She's about halfway through the course. Um, and if you look at the uh, blobs on the uh, on the bottom, there's four blobs going up the hill, and that's where I'd expect uh, Katie and Kimberly to be, uh, plus probably a couple of camera bikes I'm guessing so there's uh, that makes more sense Kate's on the on the climb um, uh, sorry Kate Kimberly's on the climb um, Kate must be two 230 meters I don't think Kate's necessarily out of this yet um, now we did, if you remember on the first lap Kimberly Miller really pulled out the gap on the descent from this mountain so Kate needs to sort of do something on this mountain climb uh, to close that gap and then try and sit on Kimberly's wheel on the downhill and suddenly we've got a race on. Uh, the gap is not changing much, it's still at um, 230 metres so it sort of suggests they're both going up at the, uh, the same pace. Down a little bit, uh, maybe Kate's listening to what I'm saying, go on Kate, give it, give it a bit, go on. Go for it, go for it, you've got nothing to lose. 
Look at this, he's piling down, 220, get it under 200. You remember the shout, and you're only half up the hill and it gets steeper. <laughs> um, you can put that little bit of extra in, Kate, you know? Who knows? So, um, I thought she was crossing tram lines there, but it's the shadows from the overhead electric cables, isn't it? So realistic, this stuff, isn't it? Uh, everything by the potholes. That'll be, <laughs> we're talking about the advancements of technology uh, and me suggesting that in a couple of years' time we'll all be steering. Um, you know, you, you need to be careful what you wish for in reality because uh, we start getting uh, speed bumps, potholes, all the rest of it built into these courses. Do we really want that? I don't know. If, if you think it, the courses would be better with real potholes so that we all sort of bumped. <laughs> I think it'd only be fair to have those if you had um, steering, wouldn't it? Because then you could steer around the potholes, but if you didn't, you got disadvantage. Cracking views here, um, brought to you by ZMS, our producers. Uh, cracking racing from Echelon. Uh, and don't forget we've got the men's A, men's B, paracycling, and hand cycling still to come. Uh, plenty of action ahead. I don't know who's uh, racing today, but the same in the men's competition as the ladies in the sense that um, I think not every rider will ride every race and if you miss a race uh, your rivals can get a lot of points on you so in some ways um, if you've got the capacity energy uh, free time and everything else that goes with it uh, turning up at every race is probably the way to win this championship and I certainly think that uh, Anna Rankinen um, is blowing it a little bit by not being on this race uh, there's probably very good reasons why she can't who knows um, we're not she's not here to ask but uh, Anna got to the top because she turned up in every race so far uh, is about to be uh, caught up by Jackie uh, Godby who is has not hitherto been in every race but now will match Anna's three out of the four races so this is race four uh, we've got three more I think and it's all to play for but quite an interesting league um, very prestigious as well. I mean, I think the ladies would be very proud of themselves for having raced in these. Uh, I certainly think that anybody that sits through an 83k race like this, uh, Jackie plumping out uh, just under 300 watts on a 3.9% gradient. Um, so this is one of the small ones. Um, but no, I think anybody that can sit through an 84k uh, race in a pain cave uh, should be very proud of themselves anyway. Um, and if you actually did well in this, uh, you are a bit of a star. Um, and what you need to do if you are a star, you need to record all these races. So you go onto the ZMS Facebook uh, transmission or maybe YouTube or wherever they uh, might be. I think they're on both. So you go on there, you record it, and you make sure that you just send that and share that with everybody you know uh, to let them know that you are a bit of a, a golden child and a star in the world of RGT racing because RGT will become big, I reckon. Um, and thanks very much for Echelon uh, supporting it. Thanks very much for ZMS uh, doing all the production on this. And thank you guys for racing and watching. This is where it happens, RGT. So, just having a look now here, we're with Kimberly Miller and Jackie Goodby. Uh, I don't think there's any uh, danger of uh, Kimberly catching Jackie as uh, Kimberly goes over one of the lines for the segments there. And, uh, an RGT go beyond banner. So as I said, this is a real roads um, course. Uh, if you were watching yesterday, you will have heard me going on about magic roads because one of the uh, marvelous things about magic roads is, of course, that the uh, it gives us the opportunities to create our own courses. And uh, how I got very involved with RGT is that I run. Uh, races myself uh, every other Wednesday and uh, on RGT that's at 7.30 uh, p.m. that's UK time so work it out from wherever you are um, I know some of the uh, some of the guys in the US uh, come and race my races in their lunch hour um, and work out how to uh, cram them in uh, most of my races are probably 20 minute 23 minutes something like that races if you're on the front um, no more than 30 on the back and more like 27 old guess. Um, so I, I do all my routes on magic uh, roads and what happens is you create a route uh, it's on real 
courses, you know, you pick your course off the bottom of your roads that exist, uh, you send them in and you get a package back with scenery. But that scenery is not going to be the real scenery. Um, there are no resources to recreate every building along some urban street in whichever town you create the course in. Um, so what you do is you get stock scenery. Now the difference here is that we're riding on a real road so the uh, quality of that scenery goes up a notch because this is based on real life examples. Somebody's gone round, filmed this uh, and turned it into a real race. And we saw that with the uh, little features like the train uh, coming along. Uh, this will be um, as close as uh, one might expect for this sort of thing uh, to actually looking like it would look like if you're riding through uh, Colorado. And of course us just watching it, we don't even have to go through the pain in our legs. These ladies are providing that part of the service. Uh, they're the ones suffering all for our benefits so we can watch this uh, glorious scenery uh, down there in Colorado. Um, as I say, I've never been there, but this is selling it to me. Definitely is. Um, might even go and ride on this course, the Iron Horse course. As I say, I think this has got history and there was a challenge between uh, somebody with a bike and somebody with a train. Uh, and as I say, my limited knowledge is that uh, this area, uh, Durango, uh, Colorado, was opened up by the Rio Grande Railway coming through uh, this area um, along this valley. You've seen the trains. Um, you see the river there, which I assume is the Rio Grande. Um, but uh, it's it, uh, as I say, I think there was some sort of challenge where somebody rode a bike uh, and somebody took a steam train and the bike got to the next town first. So um, quite why he did that, I don't know. Um, did somebody probably put some uh, rocks on the line or you know, tie the damsel in distress uh, to the line? Uh, who knows? It's, uh, I'm sure it's one of those hair and the tortoise stories uh, or maybe just the climbing was uh, a little bit much for the steam engine. Uh, and I'm not quite clear whether the steam engine had a full train, uh, a loaded train uh, to pull up or it was just on its own. So I don't quite know how the story goes. But uh, apparently the cyclist won and this is why this Iron Horse course is, uh, that rhymes isn't it? This Iron Horse course is legendary in cycling and uh, it's been brought to you very kindly by RGT and with Echelon broadcasting what it? oh echelon to put it on the races and zms broadcasting it what a team man eh? this is the dream stream uh look out uh, as i say i'll run my own races um i've just put a women's uh category into the races in my own races i run them a little bit differently to this i um put everybody in there's no categorization so uh, these are women's open races in echelon here they uh so any woman can enter and it, you will get disparity between uh, the standard of the riders naturally uh, you'd expect nothing else in the men's uh, races which we've got coming up there's a men's a and there's a men's b now in the men's a um, that's the equivalent of i suppose the swift a and b or in real racing uh, category one two or three uh, and then there's a men's b race uh, here in the echelon series uh, which is based on what would be C and D grades in Zwift or in real racing uh, categories four five onwards. So this is split. Um, it means that if you would be an also ran in the A race, uh, you have a chance in the B race. Um, now, lots of people put on different races uh, with different criteria. Uh, my own formula is to not uh, classify the races. So everybody races together. Um, and my view is that if you are racing position in my race uh, you're racing for 50th position if you you know you don't look at this as if um, it were a uh, um, how should we say you don't you might not win one of my races because the front riders will be too fast what will happen you'll end up in one in a group of riders of similar ability now one of the things I was looking at was um, how to get more ladies to do this because if you're going to do it that way uh, inevitably the ladies can't win the race uh, because there'll be some strong men in there who just uh, dominate the front. What I've decided to do is let them race in my race so that they actually get to race alongside the men. Uh, they might get in a group uh, and what happens is their points which will be uh, constructed from the um, main race uh, will be transferred into a ladies league and consequently 
If a lady uh, sprints with a man and beats him uh, and gets an extra point, the way my points work, uh, she'll get an extra point in the ladies' competition too. So we'll see how that one pans out. Um, it's a new approach and just trying to see how one, that one works. Uh, here we've got a ladies' competition, which is great. Um, I don't think there's a right way of doing this or a wrong way. I think the fantastic thing about the whole uh, e-racing community is that all of us are trying different ideas uh, of ways of running the competitions. And I dare say that somebody amongst us uh, will get it right and inevitably the rest of us will copy that formula uh, once we've all worked out what the best way of doing this is. But until then, we're going to run it in the natural way, um, as you would expect. Uh, so the way I'm doing it is a little bit unconventional. Uh, this is a more conventional approach, and this is how you'd expect to see it in real life. And why not? Why would you do that any differently for such a prestigious competition as Echelon Racing? So what we have here is an open race uh, of ladies with slightly different... Uh, I suppose uh, because it's not categorised, that you know you're not getting all these riders with the same capabilities, and it does spread out a bit. But and here's the trick: it's still exciting because why? Well, because you still have to enter every race if you really want to win this. And we're going to see Anna uh, Rankinen, uh, um from Finland lose her top slot uh, because Jackie got to be turned out for the big one. This 80. Uh, it's 83 kilometer race. There she is. She's back to that focus look again, isn't she? And that's uh, that's a sort of like oh, look, she's got a uh, support team at the back. The mechanics uh, rustling around. Um, don't nick her water bottles. She's working hard. Whatever you do. <laughs> so uh, probably have to get a broadcast waiver from him now. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So um, Jackie by turning up and doing this, which is a tough race. Um, she's over halfway now um, with just the 32 kilometers to go um, but uh, no she's uh, she, she's um, deservingly going to take the lead uh, and it still is exciting because uh, next week it might be that uh, Jackie has to miss a race next week there isn't a race next week but next time uh, Jackie might have to miss a race in which case Anna might claw it back so the, the league's still exciting even though um, I think we can safely say that bearing barring a tecanical uh, this is going to finish in the order of uh, Jackie Godby, uh, Kimberly Miller and Kate Ouellet but uh, congratulations to Kate Ouellet as well because um, she rode yesterday as Jackie did uh, and in fairness um, you know that, that's quite phenomenal to uh, ride both of those days um, in succession so uh, you know it, she probably got tired legs we're looking at it saying i wish i hadn't done yesterday's race i'd be better in this one but uh you are grateful you did yesterday's race kate because you got all those points didn't you that's right good thought so here's jackie uh determined as ever um no maintenance staff in the back um trying to nick her water bottles or whatever else and the us flag flying proudly uh, for today's winner, um, we'll have the US anthem on the podium, or we would if we had a podium. How about that? And uh, she's absolutely focused. I can't get over how focused she is. I wonder if, I wonder if we all look like that. Oh, no, we don't all look like that because we've seen the photos. And there she is, uh, slightly more aerodynamically uh, positioned, I would suggest, on the uh, avatar. And why not to make it look more like a real bike race? Because obviously. You don't need to be that aerodynamic uh, when you're at home. Although I suspect uh, this is this is one of my theories again, so don't take this as fact. Um, I suspect that we all get used to riding in our most comfortable position when we're out on the road, and it will be as aerodynamic as we can tolerate. So some people got a lower, um, you know, lower sort of. Uh, profile than others <clears throat> but it will be the lowest one that we find comfortable and if we ride with that all the time our leg muscles will sort of be used to riding from that position so consequently I suspect that um, in reality everybody is in a semi aerodynamic position because that's where their legs are used to functioning uh, from that position but again if you're a medical expert and that was a load of rubbish Please tell me, so I'll never, never say that again. How's that? It's, uh, 
making up these medical facts here. They're just theories, they're not facts. Okay. We see uh, Kate is now comfortably um, going on downhill and she's what five kilometers, uh, sorry, Kate, Kimberly, sorry, uh, he's nearly six kilometers uh, behind Jackie Godby. Uh, she's eked out now 700 meters uh, before Kate Goulet and I think she'll hold that. 36 kilometers to go. Uh, we've been riding one hour 27. Uh, we're probably going to finish um, after six or something. Like that. Depends where you're watching this from, doesn't it? So um, let's just do it from now, shall we? Uh, if we're probably going to finish, take more than another hour, um, or maybe around another hour to finish this race, I'm guessing. I think that's going to overlap with the men's race. Um, we will have to uh, inevitably at some point switch over to the men's race and start covering that. And we've got men's race uh, A, we've got men's race B, paracycles and hand cycles. So there's four races going on. We're going to have to flip over um, at some point. So we may not uh, follow a lovely ladies all the way through this race, um, but they have been marvellous entertainment uh, all the way so far. Uh, we will, of course, bring you the results. And uh, I'll tell you what, I don't know, spoiler alert, um, but if you did want to get down to the old uh, bookmaker uh, and put a little bit of a bet on, uh, if you want to wager, um, you might even do a little uh, forecast here and do uh, a one, two, three, It'll get the odds up for you. Um, but if I was you, uh, you know, if you can get down to the uh, put a bet on, or even if you bet online, uh, my tip would be Godby Miller Ulet as a one, two, three. Um, you could do a reverse forecast as well, couldn't you? Um, just in case you went the other way around. Actually, that's rubbish because the forecast is a two. <laughs> so I think it's a tricast, isn't it? You can tell I don't actually bet. <laughs> I know nothing about this. Um, I don't, I really don't bet. Uh, I don't have any uh, moral stance on that, in case you wonder if I'm being a bit, uh, I just uh, never really something I've got into. Um, but I have no problem. Um, in fact, other people's bets amuse me. Uh, one of the guys I go to soccer matches with, uh, he, uh, every uh, time before the game, he'll go and put a bet on eight uh, teams to win. And inevitably on the way home from the soccer, uh, seven of his teams have won and the eighth one hasn't and he's lost and the one that loses of course is the uh, the one that you'd predict was a dead cert to win so um gambling keeps me very amused and it's even more amusing when it's somebody else losing their money rather than me um, but i have no moral objections whatsoever uh, you go and do it if it's fun why not as long as you can afford it so anyway if you do want to put a, a bet on uh, let's go for Godby Miller Ouellette and uh, I can imagine can you imagine just going into the bookmakers and going right I want to put bet on the RGT race uh, I'm going Jackie Godby uh, Kimberly Miller and Kay Ouellette and the guy going uh, what race is this and he'd be looking through his computer screens trying to find uh, where that bookmaker's uh, got the odds uh, for <laughs> I can't find this race yeah, hurry up, mate. It'll be over in a minute. I'll, I need to put the bet on. It's not going to happen, is it? Not going to happen. So we're all right to our um, national bookmakers, uh, whatever you call them. Um, Paris Mutuel Urbain in France. It doesn't even sound like bookmaker, does it? Uh, funny enough, Paris, um, whilst being the capital city, also means bet. So uh, I think... Uh, <laughs> You've got a capital city called Bet. Hmm. Interesting. Wager. There we are. Fantastic scenery still, isn't it? Yeah. It's, um, you've got all those coniferous trees there uh, sloping up the mountain, but the little brown bits poking through. You've got the white houses at the bottom. Uh, nice shadows on a sunny day. Uh, I do enjoy it. I mean, it's one of those things about mountain areas where you get these flat valleys and they're deadpan flat where the river or whatever over millions of years has sort of eked out this flat valley at the bottom and there's just the sharp stunning rise of mountains on the edge of the valley um stunning i i have never been to colorado um i have seen it so many times on the television and, and keep saying i must go there one day uh, and then always settle for the alps because i live in europe and they're a bit nearer 
Um, I can even drive my car there, uh, which means I can take the bike in the car, uh, which is a lot less hassle than taking the bike on an aeroplane. I suspect that uh, you can hire a bike in Colorado. I've just got a good feeling that uh, it's one of those places that has got more than its fair share of bike hire places because I know a lot of riders come from Colorado, don't they? It's um, I know Jan Decker, a uh, Belgian rider uh, in, on RGT, you'll see Jan around a lot. I think he lives in Colorado, uh, for example. I'll just throw that out there. Um, it's one of the interesting things about this uh, e-racing because everybody's got the flag next to their name uh, that they want you to see and uh, you find yourself commentating and you're talking about uh, some guy that's all oh, at these guys you know he's, he's racing in Australia it's midnight there uh, and you find yes he's Australian but he lives in wherever I don't know New York City or <laughs> London or Paris or something um, so the flags don't always tell you where the rider is based. Uh, I think they do initially, actually. I think I think when you sign up, um, there's certainly one guy in, in my races um, who I noticed is, um, he, he probably lives about five miles from where I do, I noticed, uh, from his uh, Strava profile. Uh, and he always had this UK flag. Um, and in the commentaries, he always mentioned that he was a UK rider, uh, to which he obviously took a bit of umbrage uh, and now has the Australian flag next to his name. Um, I'll say Australian, it might be New Zealand, but I think it's Australia. Um, they're very similar. Um, you know how you tell them apart? The uh, Australian flag has got extra uh, stars on it. And the way I always remember it is uh, Australia's bigger, so it needs more stars. So uh, I think the New Zealand flag's got four stars and Australia's got five or six. Um, and certainly a big one under the uh, Union Jack. In the, on the left hand side so that's how you remember it uh, the one with the most stars is Australia because uh, it's bigger so there we are uh, ways to remember the difference um, there are still I mean, there's so many flags out there that look the same aren't they I mean a badly coloured uh, thing on screen you know I can't tell the difference between Ireland and Italy you know because the orange you know bad orange or bad red you know faded red on an Italian flag makes it look Irish um, and there's plenty of countries use very very similar colours. Um, Slovenian flag. Um, I mean, they have little badges on there, so you can tell the difference. But there's more than one version of that in different countries, and it's not dissimilar to the Russian flag even in terms of colours. So um, very very hard commentating just from the flags. Uh, not difficult today because we have uh, a total field of. We had originally had four, of which three were US riders. Uh, so Fiona uh, Beltram has decided enough's enough and that red mountain is a little bit too nasty to do three times um, and she was a drift off the back um, which is a shame I think she should have finished and got the points but who knows who, who am I to make that judgment that's her call uh, she knows how she feels and maybe she's got something on tomorrow where she needs uh, needs her legs so there's no point um, burning out today. We're going back to the flags, very easy today, uh, it's USA, Deutschland, USA uh, and the British flags at the bottom uh, can be ignored because they're camera riders. So uh, so um, I'm delighted to say, being British, that um, in fourth place our British camera is uh, the leading camera in the event. So um, yeah, a bit of national pride, a bit of uh, chest thumping there um, as if it matters which of course it doesn't <laughs> so it's, uh, ignore that uh, that's a time filler so uh, Kate Ouellette third place on the podium uh, absolutely splendid and uh, flip side of that is that she's third out of three uh, but of course the uh, kudos is still there because she turned up when others didn't and uh, this is one of the things if you look at some of the difficult races uh, you know your, your instinct is to say actually I don't fancy that it looks hard I can't win that um, but you've got to remember that a lot of other people are thinking exactly the same uh, and what happens if you do turn up it's like well okay I didn't win that but it was only three riders and I got lots and lots of points for the series um, so I think Kate Ouellette is going to find herself uh, a little bit up the rankings uh, in this um, just to you know just because she made the effort to turn up uh, which is splendid, isn't it? Really, it's um, 
you know, what we like to see, you know, th uh, things, giving everybody a chance. And uh, so Kate's got 137 points at the moment. Um, she's currently sitting in 20th place, but I reckon uh, 280, that'll rocket her up to somewhere like, I just want to see where she, uh, she's got 137, that's about 280. Uh, she'll rock it up uh, from 20th to about 7th, I think, yeah. I think she'll go from uh, 20th to 7th. So you keep going, Kate. That is rocketing up the table, and you can uh, you can rub that in everybody's face that uh, they should have been there, shouldn't they? You've got to be in it to win it, remember. Kimberly Miller firing away for Deutschland, Germany, uh, in that uh, traditional white and black kit. Very Germanic. And... Uh, Actually, I'm not sure how Germanic, um, Germany is quite a reasonably large country, not as big as the USA, of course. Um, so it has various uh, terrains and different parts of it. I'm not sure how um, coniferous Germany is. And certainly I've been up near Dresden, uh, driving through scenery that's not a million uh, miles from this, um, in, in terms of style. Um, and obviously down in the uh, south uh, east of Germany in Bavaria you get the uh, Alps where it borders Austria so uh, you get this sort of terrain down there as well um, very beautiful it is too Bavaria uh, and you don't have to wear the leather shorts while you're uh, cycling um, if you've never been to Bavaria it's quite um, surprising because uh, I'm never quite sure um, just how serious they are about this but uh, people actually do wear Leiderhosen uh, down there and you see them wearing them uh, these are leather shorts by the way um, nearly every German I've ever met who's not from Bavaria thinks it's um, a little bit odd that they should do this but I think my argument back is um, actually just you have to stop and think about this isn't it equivalent of Scottish people wearing kilts um, yeah the rest of us might not think that's the thing to do but actually they're quite fetching. Um, according to my wife, women love them. Uh, she wants me to get a kill, but I'm not doing it. And uh, and what have you. And yeah, and it uh, echoes a bit of uh, Scottish tradition and pride. Um, and I think the Scots, uh, the Scots are very proud of their tartans. And uh, I say their tartans. I have one. I have a Scottish name. So I, um, I do have a tartan. And uh, I am... Uh, uh, descendant from Scottish clans so uh, I'm allowed to wear my family tartan even though I'm technically English uh, <clears throat> hear all the boo hisses coming from the Scots <laughs> anyway uh, no Scots or Brits in this apart from camera people uh, are one's sixth and one's fourth camera. there's no there's no prizes for camera work or maybe Maybe you get things like Oscars and that for camera work, don't you? It's uh, different sorts of prizes. Somebody in the industry likes you uh, and you pay them some money and they get you an award. That's how it works, isn't it? The uh, the cost of getting an Oscar in the movies is phenomenal. Um, nobody independent can ever win an Oscar because the amount of lobbying and treats you have to do for the Academy members is very, very expensive. Anyway, who needs uh, Oscars? We've got uh, bicycle prizes coming out here from Echelon. And uh, this is a tremendous league. And I, I believe, it, I don't know how many years it's been running. I know it was on last year. Um, I definitely remember Jonathan Crane uh, talking a lot about it, which was the first time I became aware of it. But it's obviously um, something that's uh, traditionally uh, much bigger in the USA than it is to us Europeans. But that is changing and it's, uh, you know, broadcasts like this and events like this and the community series, um, that helps it grow. And uh, more power to Echelon for uh, getting behind this. As I say, um, I think this will become uh, bigger and bigger, more globally. Um, as I say, I, I wasn't aware of it before uh, the 2020 series. Um, I don't know why I wasn't aware of it. Um, probably because I didn't do that much uh, e-racing much before covid um but i've got i will say this um let the history books get this right um actually i did get into e-racing before covid uh but not by much you know by a few months i just uh, happened to get into it and um absolutely loved it and then covid came along and i did feel rather smug it has to be said because i don't know 
about any of you guys watching this or racing in this, but uh, I, I used to hate turbo trainers until I got a smart trainer, and that changed the world for me. And um, I, so therefore, I wasn't really, really into the whole turbo thing. Uh, th this absolutely changed it for me. Uh, but as I say, it wasn't, uh, I bought mine a few months before COVID, and then COVID came along and everybody wanted a smart trainer. And I don't know what it, supply chains were like in the USA or, or Deutschland for that matter. Um, but suddenly in Britain, you just could not get a smart trainer from about March 2020 onwards. Uh, they sold out in a, you know, a week or so. Uh, everybody realized they weren't going out on their bikes and smart trainers were the thing. And I think uh, a lot of people, I think the... Um, momentum had been building up because uh, I think people have been saying how good smart trainers were and uh, there was probably a little bit of skepticism and people thinking oh well yeah no, they sound good oh it's nearly summer oh, well, I'll get one next year this sort of thing and then Covid came along and everybody was stuck at home and they wanted one uh, and the whole thing blew up. RGT has gone from strength to strength um, I was promoting races on RGT from around uh, early March 2020 I put on my first ones and uh, I just watched it grow the platform has got better um, yes people sit there and go oh well it hasn't got this and it hasn't got that that they're used to on Zwift uh, get get with the program it's not supposed to be like Zwift it's something else it's for racing it's uh, you know it's realistic it's for serious cyclists it's not a game there's nothing wrong with Zwift it's brilliant in what it does uh, it's the market leader it does a phenomenal job but RGT is for ladies like this look at that focus right this is a proper rider put in an absolutely stonking ride uh, she's destroying the field uh, she deserved to destroy the field yesterday she's come back for more and get our just desserts the first and the second over uh, two longish races in this series is phenomenal I think she's going to go to the top of the standings well, we know that uh, as long as she gets home uh, she's only got 20 kilometers to go so we're not that far off uh, the finish for her we uh, might be looking at maybe 25 minutes to the end uh, and Jackie will be standing tall I don't know at what switch at what point uh, we will be uh, switching over to the men's races um, men's race is 80 kilometers so I don't think um, you know, we suddenly have to go over and see these. Maybe we can go and see the start. Uh, this is up to the producers, and it depends how the whole thing's set up. It does involve a bit of switching, um, so we'll see how that pans out. But um, I think maybe we do want to see the start of men's races. But I think uh, the opportunity to come back and watch uh, Jackie, uh, Kimberly, and Kate cross the line in this ladies' race uh, is something we should do. And uh, if Jackie is in the Zoom room, um, it would be wonderful. If she's got any breath left, um, if she'd have a little talk to us, um, I would love to um, find out how she felt yesterday after that absolute uh, crushing uh, sprint on the line after she'd done all the work. Uh, but she, you know, she's a proper rider, isn't she? Just look at this, you know, still stuffing out uh, plenty of uh, watts, 300 watts, you know, what, 57 kilometres, I don't. Well, I rode 57 kilometres this morning, but I didn't do it on RGT non-stop. And do bear in mind, there is a huge difference between riding 57 kilometres uh, out on the road, because if you go down a little decline, you can stop pedalling. Uh, in this, you don't. Um, I mean, you can, but uh, you don't. Uh, this this is more intense than uh, real road uh, racing. Um, well, not racing, but riding, uh, mainly because you can't let go. Um, and I would say... It, it, if somebody wants to poke that back at me and say well actually you're saying it's realistic it's not realistic if you don't freewheel down the hills yeah you can freewheel down the hills but the reality is that if you are in a race and everybody else is pedaling you've got to pedal and so therefore I, I sort of counter and say yeah okay um, maybe if you're out for a ride on your own you'd freewheel casually down this slope not really caring uh, but you're in a race here so you might Keep pedaling down the hills um, and that's what you do RGT is the racer's choice it's got to be so we're just seeing um, <clears throat> Jackie coming up towards the uh, mountain for the third and final time um, 
and I'll bet she will be glad to see the other side of that. Um, as I say, it'd be lovely if we could speak to Jackie in the Zoom room uh, after she's finished and got our breath back. Uh, quite how that fits in with um, going over to the men's races, we'll have to find out. Uh, I think, as I say, we will bring you the ladies' results even if we do flip over. Um, but I think we can all safely say that, uh, barring some sort of power outage, uh, this is going to finish Jackie Goodby and uh, Kimberly Miller and then Kate Ouellette, which uh, I, I oh, kudos to all three of them. I mean, it's absolutely splendid, isn't it? It's um, it's great riding. I think I'd be proud of these times. <laughs> I really would. I don't, I'm not sure I could do this. <laughs> the mountain just looks daunting to me, um, and Jackie's probably looking at up, <laughs> looking up it as we speak. I say she's looking up it. I mean, obviously, she just has to stare forward. She doesn't have to uh, strain her neck in any shape, manner, or form because uh, yeah, she's on RGT. As I said earlier, I, in my experience, I think um, you don't quite psychologically uh, get the same feel going up a hill just because um, it's uh, it's the way. I suppose you're looking at the screen, whereas um, if you were out on your bike. You would actually, uh, you would actually sort of crank your neck up a little bit and look at the top of the hill in a way that you don't really need to because you're focused on the screen. Um, yes, okay, you might argue once again that that is slightly unrealistic, but this is never ever going to be perfect, is it? I mean, you know, if you want it perfect, you can have potholes in the road, uh, a bit of rain, um, and we'll put some ice in it for you as well. And of course, if we do put the ice in it and you come off. You've got to really fall off your bike and hurt yourself, and uh, you know, nice bit of road rash down there. So, how realistic do you want it? Do you want road rash, potholes, ice, rain, uh, low temperatures? How about that? You know, make make your living room feel like uh, you're in the Arctic or something. No, we don't want it that realistic, do we? I didn't think so. <laughs> Is there one viewer listening to this going? Actually, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> Well, maybe maybe have it as an option for somebody like you. So Jackie has just got the small matter of 18.2 kilometres to ride. However, um, in the immediate future, she's going to have to tackle the mountain. This is the third time she knows what's coming. Uh, she's probably a bit more tired, um, although you'd never tell from that poker face that she's got, would you? Absolute star. She is now 5.43 kilometres uh, ahead of Kimberly Miller. And Kimberly has now um, taken a whole kilometre uh, ahead of uh, Kate Ouellette. Uh, it's not a huge gap over the distance, um, I would suggest. Um, you know, this is a long race. Uh, it's a hard race. It's got, you know, it's got a serious climb. Look at that, 8% uh, Jackie's in tailing at the moment. Um, it's not easy doing eight percent, and you know, sixty-five kilometres into a ride, uh, you've got to be a strong rider. Uh, and I think we can all uh, safely say, uh, without fear of contradiction, that Jackie is a strong rider. Um, I don't want to race you, Jackie, because I think you'll beat me <laughs> deservedly. Uh, I take my hat off to you. Absolutely fantastic. Look at that. No. You know, here we are at Cadence 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, Gradient 7.6, or 87 for a second, Cadence 87, 87, the Cadence back up to 88, right, 6.6, .6. she's got a rhythm, Cadence 89, it's even gone up a little bit to compensate the 87 a moment ago, Gradient 6.4, uh, eases a bit and Cadence goes up to 89 as she gets a little bit of respite from that marginal drop in the... Uh, in the gradient but that's steady and I think I mean we'll have to ask her if we get the chance uh, but that may well be uh, the secret of her success she's just looking at the data and responding to it now what we've got coming up uh, we saw on the split screen there we've got the uh, men's A and B race paracycling and hand cycling and uh, a nice healthy peloton seems to be collecting together on the men's race uh, that uh, will be exciting I don't know who's racing um, yet so I can't give you uh, too much of an insight into the men's race uh, and I know that um, <clears throat> I mean they're doing the same race that we're watching here 
so it's another 80k and they did the same as the ladies yesterday which is 40k so um some of the riders who rode yesterday may or may not turn up today but uh, the series and i think looking at some of these names and i know some of these guys um i think these guys will turn up today because i think they're the sort that if they're going for a title they'll turn up at every race and we've got zach harner on 510 points uh, david blodgett on 454 Mike Lister um, from the UK on 421. Alex Plager uh, from Deutschland, uh, 418. Mike Swart from uh, the USA on two, uh, 398. Charles Revel on 371. Um, Aris Sofocles on 360. So there's 150 points difference between uh, first and seventh. Uh, I've only gone down to seventh because the next gap is probably um, one that's not going to be made up assuming these riders ride of course um but a, a gap of 150 uh if Zach Harner doesn't turn up uh, Aristophanes does um Aristophanes could find himself very much in the same territory points wise uh, as Zach Harner um so therefore there is plenty to observe and watch out for um and we can see how these guys get the mountain uh so 20 uh, Jack is doing just another 20 kph on a 6% gradient uh, I think that's pretty commendable. Um, certainly, uh, probably a little bit more than I might do. So she's also better than me. Um, but we knew that, didn't we? So uh, she's a phenomenon, really, isn't she? I mean, this is an emphatic ride. The day after she did an emphatic ride, uh, only to have the uh, wind stolen from uh, under her nose in the last couple hundred meters. But uh, I think she probably had a hunch that was coming uh, in the way that uh, Megan had uh, sat on her, uh, Megan Isla had sat on her uh, wheel for the whole race. She goes through one of those segments, she's nearly at the top of the climb. Uh, I bet she is absolutely looking forward to that descent. If we look at the bottom of the uh, picture, uh, you can see. Uh, the big white blob is where Jackie is, just coming out of the red zone. A little bit of green and then some nice blue descent. And uh, she will be absolutely lapping that up. Uh, Kate, uh, Kimberly Miller um, seems to enjoy descent. That's where she distanced Kate Ouellette and, of course, um, Fiona Beltram, the fourth rider from the USA. Uh, no longer with us, unfortunately. Uh, when I say... It, let me rephrase that because that sounded a bit terminal, didn't it? She's no longer in the race. <laughs> no this. Dear, oh dear, um, be careful with your language, don't you? So uh, she's no longer in the race. I, she was distanced and I get the feeling that she probably looked at it as uh, this isn't um, really worth the effort. Um, I'm not going to win. Uh, which suggests that she's not really interested in the series because I think anybody else, uh, anybody interested in contending the series would have looked at this as a great opportunity to pick up a lot of points. So here we see Kate uh, in third, and she clearly wants the points, and why wouldn't she? Um, I was say, this is going to propel her right up the rankings. Um, she might have struggled uh, with Anna uh, Rankinen's uh, 550 points, and uh, Jackie could be going to go up to about 590. So uh, Kate's not going to catch them. But she might well find herself, you know, hustling around the uh, third, fourth, fifth positions, and uh, you know, in with the shout of uh, pulling something off if she keeps attending the races. And she's clearly a lady, I think, uh, that understands that uh, you complete the races to get the points. As she uh, grapples with 3.7% gradient uh, and very respectable 24 kph, although the gradient's just come down since I started saying that. She's got 21k to go and uh, unfortunately that does include the big climb so <laughs> it's uh, it's not downhill from here as they quite often say so just looking we've got the men's a and the men's b um we're into row two of it's usually 12 in a row so it's 13 on the line for the men's b already um, i think we're looking at two and a bit uh, so it's two rows uh, at least 24 riders on the men's A category. Paracycling three, uh, and I suspect they're the usual um, usual sort of suspects uh, in that. Uh, there is uh, hand cycling as well, 
Uh, so, we'll, so we'll see what the full lineup is. Um, there's a way to go before that race starts, I think. Uh, so uh, whether or not, uh, I mean, I'm guessing, uh, but I think we'll probably uh, go and have a look at the start and then come back to the ladies to see the finish because uh, Jackie Godby's only got 14 kilometres to go. That will take uh, maybe 15 minutes or something like that. So we can have a look at the starts of the men's races um, for about five or six minutes. We'll probably come back to seeing uh, CJ Jackie get the glory. Um, and oh, I think the uh, glory is very, very well deserved. Um, and if possible, I think we're going to ask her if she'd say a few words in the Zoom room. Um, because she's this weekend's queen, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, deserves a little bit of an interview. And to be honest, I'm just really interested to know how she felt yesterday, because I really felt for her. <laughs> so, I'm just, so even if I'm being selfish about the questions, I want to find out uh, what went through her mind yesterday uh, and how determined she was to not let that happen again today. Uh, she has ridden, oh, this is a warrior's race, isn't it? Go for it, Jackie, you're a star. Absolutely. So, um, I'm not sure how many minutes uh, we've got to the men's race. Uh, so probably was on the screen that we just had and I failed to take note. Um, but it starts, uh, I think, in about three minutes. or oh, one minute 40. So, I think we should have a look here. Let's see who's in there. Uh, I see David Blodgett's in there. And if you remember, uh, he's in second place in the series at the moment. Bouchard Howe, who rode yesterday as well, John Cooper, um, who else have we got in there? Brian Hodges, um, I can see, we've got 25 riders online. Uh, less than yesterday, but I think this is um, understandable. This is a daunting race, and if you rode yesterday as well, uh, this is probably looking like um, a mountain too far. Um, see snow. Um, I don't think you will, because it's the summer, but if it was a winter setting, you'd see some snow. Uh, is that Christophe Matteo? I think I uh, might have the names wrong here. Uh, Borders back. He rode yesterday. Billing rode yesterday. Uh, who else have we got here? Best today. It's a great, uh, great name, isn't it? Uh, Dismet did not ride yesterday. Uh, this is the men's B race, um, by the way. Um, so, like I was saying, these uh, these are category CDs on Zwift, uh, category sort of three, four, five uh, in real outdoor racing. Uh, 13 riders on the line again down from yesterday um, but for the same reasons uh, there are going to be people who looked at today's course and just thought wow uh, I'm not gonna make Sunday lunch if I do that am I so um, it's only in the US um, I would I would have you know though I did uh, 12 seconds to go men's B is about to go nine eight now you need to pedal really really hard um, if this splits and you get left behind you are in big trouble particularly in a field this size this is the men's A and off we go uh, and you saw about four riders there get stuck and already we've got a gap and I think everybody who's not on our screen now has probably got a difficult job getting back into that peloton now what normally happens bear in mind it's flat here as we get the steam train uh, what normally happens is this group sort of bunches together about now um, there'll be a couple on the front who still want to do some damage um, and there's a split there isn't there and there's half a dozen riders six riders uh, but it's, they've not sustained the gap so as I say what normally happens this bunch will you know go over the first 500 meters or so and probably accept that that is the peloton and form into a bunch uh, you'll get, then get the attacks uh, at various places um, I think today attacks will happen on the hills where it's a very flat course what you see is attacks are not designed for the rider doing the attack to get off the front what they're designed to do is stretch the peloton and get drop riders off the back and this is what happens at the beginning of one of these races so um, we're looking at uh, can we close in on the men's A and just try and get a, a feel for the size of the peloton um, that is most of the riders isn't it so it's um, there's probably about, uh, I don't know, just under 20 riders in there. Um, and we had about 25, we've got 25 online. So we probably only lost four or five riders at tops at the start, is my guess. I can't count all those um, perfectly at the moment. Maybe if we can focus on somebody in about 12th position. Uh, Snow, for example. Oh, no, he's moved up, hasn't he? Um, 
Just trying to have a look at the positions. 15 at the back, 17. Yeah, so it's probably about 18 riders uh, in that group and looking at the gaps. Um, yeah, so maybe 21 riders in that gap. 22 is Harris uh, from Canada. Uh, Girotti, uh, which sounds Italian, but it's got a French flag. Uh, the next batch. So yeah, 21 riders in the peloton out of 25. We lost four in the initial phase, uh, most of which were cameras by the looks of it. So um, we just got two riders totally distanced, and that's Girotti and Harris, uh, Canada and France, respectively. Looking at the front, and uh, Bouchard Howe is the rider off the front uh, road yesterday as well so this is uh, a man showing off how strong he is now he lit up the race quite a lot yesterday he's quite an explosive off the front rider and um, I think the uh, you know he illuminates the race I mean I like him um, commentators dream you are mate um, because you make the race interesting uh, so he kept going off the front yesterday uh, and it stretched in. and look at that I mean to go 42 meters off the front two meters into an 82k race this illuminates the race it makes it exciting um so well on kevin so kevin bouchard hell uh hell there uh is the man off the front uh making it entertaining for us uh, as he did yesterday uh he's no longer on the front uh, oh sorry we're at the men's b race so <laughs> i thought wow how did he lose 42 meters when i just turned my head for a moment uh what have we got here we've got a much uh, so we've got one two three four five Eight, nine, ten. What about 10 riders, um, 11 riders making up this group, uh, 13 online. So basically everybody's stuck together, haven't they, on the uh, on the B race. Um, I'll say that as uh, a couple of people go off the front, but there's no significant uh, gaps, um, I would suggest. I mean, maybe yeah, Metcalf and Hambrick there. Um, David uh, Breku from the Netherlands. J10 uh, up there, Matthew, the Frenchman. I don't know whether these are going to stick. Um, I, 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 as I say, I think people are stretching it and they're probably trying to drop a couple of people off the back. Uh, maybe that's going to happen. You're starting to see that around eighth place uh, where little gaps uh, tending to appear between eighth and ninth there. Uh, maybe, that's, uh, maybe that's the effect of this attritional uh, race off the front. It's uh, it remains to be seen whether it uh, is telling or not. Um, see, this is coming together. I, I don't think anybody is going to get away and ride solo for 80 kilometres. Um, and the reason I say that is because the moment you say something like that, it all changes, uh, which makes it interesting. So, hand cycling down the bottom, who have we got? Uh, Brooks and Kilgore. I'm pretty sure both of those rode yesterday. Uh, Jackie not uh, with us today by oh this is paracycling sorry um, so yeah so these two I think um, are going to probably ride together uh, I don't know I maybe not I'm gonna I'm gonna revoke that comment I think we have to see who's the strongest going up there going up the hill um, I think that will, this will get decided the first time we go up the mountain uh, and once the um, once the gap is there. So there's Jackie Jones. Uh, sorry, I was, he is there in second place. And uh, Kuman and Brian are the riders with me. So everybody in this is going for the title, I think, or are going to give it a good shot. Uh, they turn up every race. And of course, and this is where we get really enthusiastic and excited about this, uh, we want hand cycling to grow on here, and we are going to get avatars for this. So in future races, instead of watching uh, people on upright bikes you're going to see hand like this on the avatars uh, they are in production they're not quite ready to uh, be used on RGT but I'm sure before the series is up you're going to see them and it's going to be great um, I what I like about these guys they turn up every race and and maybe you know maybe they look at it and say well you know maybe I can't win the series but if you don't participate maybe put the series on so we need more of you hand cyclists and we need uh, the word to go around Kevin Bouchard Hell is a bloody star, isn't he? Look at that. 350 metres. Less than five kilometres into the race. This is either going to be the most phenomenal ride we've seen. <laughs> or, 
Oh, he's going to get caught. <laughs> I don't know what his climbing is like because yesterday it was a very flat course. Um, he's on the flat, well, I say he's on the flat bit. It's a minus two gradient at the moment. So he's just been over a, a lump. Maybe he's a good climber. Maybe he's a good climber. Um, the gap's 470 years. And there's some decent riders in the next batch as well. <laughs> some Mike Lister's in there. Uh, yeah, this is. Uh, and so, oh, who else have we got in there? Uh, Revel. Um, so it's uh, that's Charles Revel, isn't it? Uh, we've got IK. Uh, I think that's not not Francois here, though, is it? Well, he likes hills. Uh, no, it's L I K. Um, L I K. The uh, Belgian flag there. Uh, there's another rider called Francois IK. Um, but I'm pretty sure that's not Francois. I think he goes under F. Charlie Revel, um, he's pumping out some Watts, 300 of them to be precise, in third position. And he has just caught Navin in second position. And I think, although there's a little bit of a gap between the bunch behind and these four, I think that's going to close. And I think they'll all be better off uh, working together. What we might be seeing is that the strong riders, knowing they want to catch uh, Kevin Bouchard Howe, uh, obviously Mike Lister on the front, man from Devon. Um, the riders on the front might be just saying to themselves, look, we mustn't let him get away. And if they don't let him get away, if they let him get away now, uh, they might not retrieve the position. Whereas, uh, uh, on the other hand, you know, maybe hang him out to dry 500 metres. My goodness. Uh, that, it's quite phenomenal, isn't it? It's... Um, I've just been told, if you were listening earlier, uh, that there's no audio on the Zoom uh, room, so we're not going to be able to chat to Jackie uh, Godby if uh, she if and when she wins. So, um, unfortunately, that's a real shame. I'd love to interview her. She must be fantastic you know, to find out uh, exactly how she was uh, feeling during all of that. Um, to all of that uh, yesterday and, and today even uh, is Jackie now 5.5 uh, kilometers to go uh, safely 10 kilometers in front of Kimberly Miller phenomenal you go girl uh, Kate Ule uh, holding it at just over a kilometer behind uh, Kimberly uh, that's not a lot in the scheme of things and I think it's a very impressive ride from both the second and third place ladies in this uh, but we'll pop back a little bit later um, and uh, see what's going on that is uh, 600 meters Kevin Boucher has uh, got in front of him um, <clears throat> we've got some pretty decent riders uh, in the chase um, just look in there uh, they do seem to be sort of more or less together um, certainly the uh, it's 700 meters now this is um, phenomenal um, we'll just have to see what happens when we get to the hill, won't we? I say hill, um, you know, I'm British, we do like an understatement. This is a mountain, this is a proper climb. Um, let's have a look at the men's B. Uh, they seem to be uh, stuck together and are probably going to uh, be so uh, for quite a long time. Um, we're looking at uh, not a huge, well, no, we are. There's, not, there's a couple off the back, uh, but we do about that. Metcalf and Matthew. Uh, the rest of them down to ninth are uh, all sticking together. I think we see them going over uh, a 6% gradient. This is the second of the uh, three orange patches in the bottom left hand corner of your screen. Um, uh, it's uh, actually it's probably the third one, isn't it? Depending on your definition of orange. Uh, there's a fourth one, and then we get the mountain itself. Uh, if it does, if you start seeing splits here, now look, the men's B, um, they're at 5% uh, gradient. They are in a line, which suggests it's being stretched by uh, David uh, Bregu um, with uh, Hambrick. Uh, I'm trying to think of Hambrick's name now because I do know it. It is... Oh, it comes to me in a minute. <laughs> it's a great name. It's an all-American name. <laughs> I can't remember what it is now, but he rode yesterday as well, uh, very well as it happened, um, because he had that kit on, and I remember commenting that he sat in the pack very cleverly and launched himself up it um, very sweetly, 
uh, to get a half decent place. Marion Hambrick, as I told you, it's an all American name. And um, the only other Marion I ever remember is John Wayne's real name, wasn't it? Uh, Marion Morrison, uh, same surname as me. So, Marion Hambrick, uh, yeah, he rode a phenomenal race yesterday, very clever and astute. He uh, sat in the pack uh, and then waited his moment and clawed up. Didn't I uh, didn't get a podium place, but he finished well up. And it, it wasn't for that bright kit. I probably he would have probably gone under the radar in the commentary. It's one of those smart rides um, that we uh, often see from Ned Bowen uh, from Chicago on RGT. Ned not here today. Um, not sure if it's not Ned's sort of race or what. Mene and Cassidy has decided enough's enough and he's going to chase up uh, Kevin Bouchard Howe. Um, you've got a bit of a distance to do that, but you're nearly 200 metres in front of Charlie Revel and uh, Mike Lister. Uh, Eagle Cops there um, in fifth place. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to have to sort of choose my words very, very carefully. Uh, there is a bit of controversy around Eagle Cops. Um, he has been done for a lot of doping, and I'm not sure what the official line is on his uh, position in these races. Um, it's not for me to say, it's not my call. Uh, but Eagle Cops, uh, as I say, is publicly, he served um, quite a lot of doping bans. And apparently, according to reports that I've read, uh, when he was under a four year doping ban, still went out there and raced. Uh, so there's a bit of controversy about Eagle Cops, um, and I don't know whether or not his results will count towards anything. Um, of course, uh, there is uh, the comment that counterbalances that that says, if he's done nothing wrong recently, and he's done nothing wrong in this series, um, just because of past transgressions, you can't make judgments against him. But I'll just flag that up in the commentary, uh, Slovenian Eagle Cops, um, as I say, has, as far as I'm aware, been um, caught Doping, uh, doping. He's had a UCI uh, ban, you know, proper UCI ban. We're not talking about uh, a bit of e-racing here. This is uh, real road racing. He's been banned, banned by the UCI and I believe the Slovenian uh, cycling authorities and then went out and raced and ignored the bans during those periods. So uh, Eagle Cops uh, may or may not be allowed by the people who adjudicate on the Echelon Racing Series uh, to be a valid racer. Kevin Bouchard Hill is on a 7.1% gradient. He's on this hill. Um, you may or may not have tuned in. Uh, I, I, I've been here for a few hours uh, commenting on the ladies' race. So uh, there's things that I've said that I could assume that you've heard before, but if you've only just tuned in for the men's race, uh, maybe you're watching Daniel Cassidy here, um, and you've only just tuned in for the men's race, you won't have heard me say it all, which means I've got uh, carte blanche to repeat myself to death. Uh, on all the things I said earlier in the ladies race. If you have watched the ladies race with me, I do apologise, um, but I think it's uh, not unreasonable to make some of the comments uh, that I made in the earlier race about the men's races to uh, the paracycling and the hand cycling uh, for our newly tuned in viewers. Um, so we've got this 7.1%. Um, I think the first half of this hill uh, mountain is slightly easier than the second half. Um, I think it is where we are going to see things decided on each lap. There's three laps in this race. What you're seeing at the bottom in that profile, the uh, orange, red, green, blue uh, splurge, is the profile. So you can see where it goes up the hill. Uh, it's hard red, which means it's steep, which probably means 7%-ish upwards. And uh, on the other side, where it goes blue, that's a descent. And uh, we're looking at 1.1 kilometers. Jackie Godby, who's the star of the weekend, uh, I think, and she is about to go through the Flamme Rouge. Yeah, and she's on minus 4%. This probably feels good. Um, I bet she's not smiling now, but she's totally focused. I bet if we look at the Zoom room, her face will just be absolute focus. Uh, she is a true competitor. Uh, she's strong. Uh, she's emphatic. Um, she's focused. Uh, she is <clears throat> certainly, I think, the star rider of the weekend uh, based on the performance yesterday and today. Yesterday, if you only just tuned in, 
she rode the whole race 40 kilometers uh, on the front and Megan Isla sat on her wheel for the whole 40 well 39.99 kilometers and just raced around her with a sprint in the last 200 uh, meters uh, very very cruel on Jackie but uh, that happens in, in bike racing we know that she knows that she's come out today ridden 83 kilometers over mountains three times she's done that mountain uh, she's emphatically won the ladies race she is um, the thick end of 10 kilometers in front of the second place rider uh, Kimberly Miller and a little bit more in front of third place Kate Hulet. Uh, this is great riding as she looks at the um, the finishing line just 30 meters to go and then she crosses it and I think uh, come on there's got to be a wave there Jackie come on there's a wave button on your uh, RGT app Kimberly Miller in uh, second place uh, 9.8 kilometers to go so it's gonna be a little while before she hits the flag uh, well done Jackie uh, Jackie will go to the top of the ladies rankings uh, she will overtake um, uh, Anna uh, Rankin uh, from Finland and takes top spot in the ladies so we have both sets of men now grappling with the big mountain let's see gradients the B men of 5% and the A men of six. the A men it sounds like the end of a prayer, doesn't it? Uh, the A race, should we call it? We're going to say Amen all the time. Otherwise, I'll sound like a preacher. And um, my kids will tell you that I can sound like a preacher, um, but uh, not different sort, of course. So, will this split the peloton? I think there is some um, fracturing in the B race. Um, <clears throat> the paracycling. Uh, so Brooks has stopped. I think he stopped yesterday actually, he just takes a little break. Um, I might be being a bit unfair, but somebody did yesterday and I've got a feeling it might be him. Um, I think, yeah, just you just stop, get your breath back and, and carry on up again. Um, maybe it's a mechanical, maybe it's not. Um, I'm not sure. Put it this way, um, <clears throat> he knows why he's made that decision and we're not going to find out, are we? So Kuman, um, Jackie Jones uh, on his, I think Jackie Jones has uh, sat behind him uh, most of the race, isn't it? Bryant there, uh, attacking 3.3%, uh, reasonably slowly, um, but then again, I have no idea what, well, I can imagine what hand cycling feels like on a gradient like this. Uh, I'm lucky I don't have to do it. Uh, comparatively, uh, with the hand cycling, uh, we're seeing quite um, an emphatic uh, speed of 20 miles uh, kph uh, from Jackie Jones, but slightly being distanced uh, in the process uh, from Kuman, the, the uh, rider from the Netherlands. And I think Kuman is probably uh, where I would uh, put my money if I were a gambling man uh, on this race, uh, based on what I've seen so far in the series. Uh, Jackie usually in our Zoom room, um, so you usually have a look at. Oh, Jackie's made it up, isn't it? Look, he's caught him now. In fact, if anything, Jackie may decide to sit on his wheel, but uh, it, the way he was uh, coming up to uh, Kuman there, it looked like he uh, might overtake him. Um, but I think he's decided to sit on the wheel. Very shrewd move. Paracycling, uh, we can see there's a, a split now between the two. Uh, the and we're not actually at the mountain yet. Um, in fact, neither in the hand cycling or the paracycling are we at the mountain. Uh, don't forget, they are only riding half the distance, so uh, it's not uh, not quite the same um, same race. <clears throat> right, men's B. Um, Marion Hembrick and Tant from the Netherlands. Uh, two Dutch riders up there at the front. I'm not sure if you're allowed to say Dutch anymore. So we had this horrible thing, uh, which I thought has been wrong for a long, long time, where uh, in Britain we refer to the Netherlands as Holland, which is quite wrong because Holland is only uh, one part of uh, 
Netherlands on that all, but uh, yeah, it's only one part of the Netherlands, and I've always thought it's wrong. And the Dutch government has decided that officially they don't want to be called Holland, they want to be called the Netherlands, which I think is great, and I tend to agree with. Um, I wonder how long it'll take uh, British people to stop saying Holland and start calling it the Netherlands. However, do we? Should we be calling it Dutch? Should it be Netherlandish or something? I don't know. Uh, certainly in French it's Nierlandais, isn't it? So, uh, you know, the, the French uh, describe people from the Netherlands as Nierlandais. So uh, I, I think I think the English should uh, inco incorporate that as well. But I don't know what the official view from the uh, Netherlands government is. Um, so maybe I need to check that one out uh, so that I don't offend anybody by saying Dutch when I mean uh, Nierlandais. Maybe I'll just say Neil and Day for now because I know they can get away with that. 8.6%, uh, it's Marion Hembrick, the man who was very sly uh, sitting there undetected in the bunch yesterday, who is now pulling away in first position. And I think we're starting to see gaps, aren't we? Because you look at seventh, it's 73 uh, metres now. Um, I mean, I won't worry too much. I mean, David Brecu, uh, the Frenchman, uh, Esther Schmidt, uh, the Belgian, at 27 metres. I wouldn't read too much into that. You can make that up on the descent. Um, you're starting to look back at borders on um, 89, nearly 100 metres. Uh, that uh, starts to look like a gap. And... Um, that's a bit more difficult to make up. Metcalf on 100 meters now. Uh, Schmidt 39. I think that's still. Um, I think anybody down at the seventh or sixth, sorry, to Schmidt, who can make this up on the uh, on the descent is still in with the shout. I think seventh onward. Metcalf borders billing. Uh, these borders billing. Uh, these are riders who rode yesterday. Uh, they may not have the legs for this. Um, let's see, but certainly uh, we've got uh, Dutchman, Slovenia. I don't, is that Slovenia? I'm not sure. I think Kile is probably a Slovenian. Um, I'm not sure though. I think the Slovenian badge is blue and that looks like it might be. I can't tell. Um, there's several uh, flags that are very, very similar to the Slovenian flag, and the Ray 2 difference is the little badge crest that's on that flag in the blue band. And I'm afraid I can't get close enough. I'm going to assume it's Slovenian, um, but if I'm wrong, I do apologise, and I'm sure that can be uh, corrected somewhere else. Um, but anyway, Erin Hambrick. Um, who oh, I hardly mentioned in the commentary apart from the fact that I thought his kit was rather cool. Uh, he's now getting more mentions than uh, he got yesterday because he's actually starring up the hill. Now we are at the top and this is the point where do we see Schmidt uh, now at 60 kilometers? So maybe he's just outside of it. David Brecu at 40 uh, meters, is it meters not kilometers. Um, did these guys make it up on the descent or Marion Hambrick? Uh, got the chance to actually take this away. Uh, this is interesting. Now, Marion, uh, now on the descent at 2.4, you can see the body just uh, dipping into an aerodynamic position. You don't need to do that at home, of course. And immediately, uh, somebody goes past him. It's Kile, the, uh, well, I think, Slovenian. Uh, he's going to get caught by the next two as well. Um, it's whether or not... I think the Schmidt's out of this now. So uh, the Belgian Schmidt, uh, he's probably out of this at 100 metres. Not necessarily. Uh, David Brecu, uh, you can see him just behind. Uh, has he got the ability to bridge this on the descent? It rather depends how hard they push on the front end. Now let's have a look at the watts per kilograms uh, being pushed out here. David Brecu is pushing out 3.5. He wants to get back in that group. You can tell that. Still 3.8. Uh, watts per kilogram coming from David Braku. Now he hasn't got the uh, benefit of the uh, of the um, the draft. Uh, Marion uh, Hembrick is pushing out quite a lot at 2.5. Uh, Schmidt 
he's not making up ground despite that and he's uh, watts per kilogram have dropped to 2.4 he's probably reached the uh, point where he realizes that that is not going to happen uh, on this descent um, that's disappointing I'd have liked to have seen him uh, make that one up um, but the guys on the front although pushing out what less watts per kilogram um, isn't quite the same as pushing out less watts because uh, it rather depends on what your uh, <clears throat> what your weight is um, and also four of them don't have to work quite as hard because they've got the uh, draft effect of being in a group of five in fact uh, Kilo the uh, let's say Slovenian but I'm not convinced that's Slovenian fag I can't tell the detail of the crest inside there uh, well enough to be 100% sure uh, Kilo is just having a fight to stay on this group but it's probably worth the effort because once you get in and get that draft uh, you can take the pressure off so long as somebody doesn't uh, do a nasty uh, attack off the front. Uh, Gishmet's back to 64 metres though. He's still in this. Uh, this would be, uh, he's putting the, he's, he's ramped it up. I think he was taking a little breather. He's putting in 42, uh, 4.2 uh, watts per kilogram. Uh, he's overdoing it because you can see the watts per kilogram are red. This is in the uh, left hand side all the data there. If you look next to his name, there's a red digit. Um, that's because he is pushing in uh, too much effort and he's caught them all up and he's immediately dropped the effort. He uh, <laughs> no longer needs to and we're back to a group of six. Absolutely. Now let's see who's in uh, Sander Koeman, um from the Paracycles, Jackie Jones, uh, these are our two leaders. Uh, David Blodgett from the uh, A race. Uh, David Blodgett is doing well. He's in second place in the series. Um, he's the one with the beard in the top right hand, right -hand corner. Uh, from the uh, paracycling, we've got Paul uh, Kilgore um, and it's uh, Jackie Jones, as I said. John Cooper up there in the top left, um, and it's Michael Brooks as well from the paracycling. Um, making up as in actually the paracyclists and the um and, and the hand cyclists very good at doing the zoom room um i don't know if there's a, a reason behind this i'd be very interested to know if anybody wants to let us know um i'd be very interested to know whether this is just uh, something that uh, it's, it's become a bit of a protocol amongst them or there's a good uh, logical reason why they do this um as you look at uh, Kevin Bouchard Howe, who is now nearly a kilometre ahead of everybody else uh, in this race. He rode yesterday as well. Uh, quite a phenomenal uh, performance, uh, Kevin. And uh, Kevin's not actually um, in the top seven of the uh, racing, the rankings for the race uh, at the moment. So um, whether or not this will drag him um, up into it, uh, I don't know. So uh, it's uh, something we should um, probably uh, keep an eye on. Um, I'm just looking at the, uh, just going to try and have a look at the uh, rankings uh, further down um, while, uh, while I can. Um, but uh, as I say, it, uh, it may be that this uh, a good result here today uh, can bring uh, Kevin uh, back up uh, into the uh, top rankings um, of this race so uh, we'll have to have a look he's certainly not in the top seven at the moment so he will be at least 150 uh, behind uh, the leaders in the race so um, we'll see what uh, we can find out on that um, um, what news have we got um, right Okay, I've, uh, I've been asked to uh, read some of the information on an Excel sheet that I had a great deal of difficulty trying to read actually because of the way it was um, set up. Um, so, uh, so this, I, um, uh, sorry for the um and ah and I've been asked to read out some uh, stuff that isn't actually that readable uh, from the way it's arrived in the file uh, and I'm just correcting that. So. Um, what have we got here that we can uh, divulge uh, by way of information 
uh, from uh, the file that I've mentioned. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute, I think, because the, uh, the information um, is not absolutely um, right. Uh, right. Visit Durango. Um, <clears throat> Oh, actually, this is quite interesting. I'll take all this back. Um, this is taking place in Durango, Colorado. Um, and as I say, uh, there is uh, a bit of history with this race um, that it was called the Iron Horse because it was, uh, as legend has it, um, all about a race between a cyclist and somebody in a train. And the cyclist won. Uh, I'm not 100% sure why. Um, but Durango, uh, say, is in Colorado. And I do have this thing that I do want to visit Colorado. I've said it for years, I never got around to it, always settled for the Alps because I can drive there with my car, uh, loaded up with a bike, uh, a lot easier than I can uh, flying from Europe to uh, Denver uh, or wherever you get off the plane. So, um, so uh, what have we got to tell you about Durango? Uh, the Iron Horse and Cycle Training. Uh, it's quite a comprehensive cycle training program uh, riding this course. Um, and the Iron Horse is, of course, an event uh, that happens, um, and I think it's in May the 26th in 2022. It takes place if you want to event, if you want to event, uh, enter the event. Um, so you can actually go down there and do all this for yourself uh, in May 2022. May the 26th uh, is the uh, official day of the big race uh, where we get all the classics, and um, there's plenty going on right through from the 1st of April. Uh, there's a training program that they run uh, in the area. Um, I suspect that those of us from outside the area are going to have trouble being there from uh, the beginning of April to the end of May. But if you are uh, a person of leisure uh, with a suitable income, then maybe you can do that. Um, so what can you do uh, there? There's uh, plenty of um, there's a visitor centre uh, in Durango uh, that you can visit and that will tell you about all the cycling routes that you can do um, in the area. It's open from Monday to Friday, uh, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, all by appointment, I suspect, if you want to go on the weekend. Um, Durango uh, itself, which I have to admit, um, I don't know a lot about, but it's um, it's located in the Four Corners region of southwestern Colorado. Durango is a perfect home base uh, for adventure. Um, it's, history, it's got historical uh, legacy there um, and it's uh, based um, in the San Juan uh, mountains um, and you can do this um, on the uh, Durango and Silverton narrow gauge railroad uh, and you can see the best bits of the San Juan, uh, San Juan mountains. Um, it's out. It's an outdoor sort of place to go. It's a bit of a haven for outdoor adventurers. You can do mountain biking there, hiking, trails, ski resorts. Well, that's what Colorado is famous for, isn't it? Uh, and the uh, and Mass River, uh, which features gold medal fishing and whitewater rafting. That sounds good um, for those looking for. As I say, it's an adventure centre, so why wouldn't you? Um, and they've got historic sites, including the uh, Mesa Verde National Park and Chimney Rock. Uh, which all sounds stunning to me. Um, and of course, uh, Durango has um, some award-winning restaurants. Uh, if you've got tourists going there, you need that sort of thing, don't you? Um, so you can have world-class steaks to casual food, uh, truck fare. I like the sound of truck fare. Is that what lorry drivers eat? Um, they've got a thing in France called the, um, what was it? The uh, Routier uh, National or something like that. Uh, truck drivers uh, know where to eat, don't they? Because they pick out these places. Uh, if you've got truck driver menu there, it sounds good to me. Um, and haute cuisine as well, uh, by the sounds of it. Di diverse landscape, uh, Western heritage. Uh, well, <laughs> of course it would do. Uh, Colorado, Denver, uh, they, that just oozes uh, Western uh um, his history, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I, to me, I, as I say, I wanted to go to Colorado for a long time, uh, and this little uh, broadcast here is selling Durango to me big time. Um, we shall come back and talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, back to the racing. Um, see the paracycle in the bottom left hand corner, um, and we see quite a laboured uh, ride there from. Um, I'm not sure who it is. It's actually it's the leader, isn't it? So it's uh, it's on eight point 
two percent. So it's, I, it's very easy to sit here, isn't it? Sitting on my armchair uh, with uh, you know and having a look at um, poor old Paul Kilcare <laughs> working his way up. 8.2% on an RGT course, and, and it's not easy. And this is a long hill as well. I mean, I I, I don't even like 8.2% on a short one. This is a long one, and I'm sitting there going, oh, it's quite laboured, isn't it? I'm not having a go, Paul. I think you're doing splendidly, mate. Uh, 7.6 kilometres per hour. I'd probably be about that myself. So, uh, read into this um, what, what I mean, not what it sounds like, okay? Um, Anyway, you're doing a great job because uh, you're well in front of uh, Michael Brooks uh, now, aren't you? You've got um, 64 metres ahead of Michael, uh, which is probably um, going to... Here's Michael. Uh, now, he's doing 8.8, .8, so he might be catching you, actually. Oh, so you need to put a bit of effort in, Paul, um, because Michael might be catching you. He's not going to let you go that easily, is he? Uh, so the two Americans uh, in that RGT kit there, um, duking it out on the uh, difficult climb. Now remember, if, if you only, uh, and it's down to 50 metres, oh, Michael's, Michael's clawing it back. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe Paul just went a bit too early on that climb and, uh, and uh, was probably uh, trying to eke out a gap. But, uh, you know, the steady rider. You see this on climbs, don't you? We were out on our um, club ride this morning for West London Cycling. And uh, there's a guy, <laughs> there's a guy who you just assume uh, he's, he's just one of these sort of riders. And you think he struggles on hills. And he turned around and he said, no, no, I don't struggle on hills. I've just got my own pace uh, and I will get them. I will never struggle on the hill. I will do it on pace where I feel comfortable. And I just, I was wondering, uh, as we all shot up and left this guy behind this morning, whether if we all went to one of these big mountains like we're riding now, where it's a really long climb, and a lot of the guys who sort of, you know, absolutely rock it up the hills this morning, um, whilst, as I say, Keith just sits at the back and he does it at his own pace. Never, he's never exerted, he's, he's doing it at his own comfortable pace. Uh, Paul's pulled out to 72 uh, metres now, so uh, Paul has responded uh, to this clawback. We're on 9%. Uh, Actually, the 72 might be because Paul was on the 2.3% uh, bit, which Michael has just got to, and immediately uh, he pulls that down from 72 to 52 and uh, reducing. So uh, that, I think, uh, we're going to see Michael uh, give it a good go to not let Paul get away, um, and I suspect he's going to do that. So, Sander Kuman is our leader in the hand cycling. He's 700 metres ahead of Jackie Jones, and uh, we have Brian in third place, um, two points. Uh, so here we have Brian, who's um, a good two kilometres behind uh, Jackie Jones, but that's not what it's all about. It's all about being part of this, picking up your points. And uh, we have the women's uh, result. It's as predicted, uh, Jacqueline Godby, uh, Jackie, uh, the dominant rider over the weekend. Kimberly Miller from Deutschland pulling his 16 minutes behind. That's how emphatic Jackie was. Uh, and even so, um, there's probably you know nearly four minutes uh, between Kimberly and Kate Ouellette. But Kate is going to clock up some points and she's going to find herself elevated, absolutely elevated in the women's uh, race there. Um, she will... Uh, Elevate up into the top six or seven is my guess. Uh, as we see, uh, somebody just pulling up. Uh, Sander Kuman uh, not pulling up though. He's on minus four percent. Why would you? Uh, he's enjoying a descent, and I think everybody's moving on our screens now. What's happening in the men's A race? How's that panning out? Let's have a look. As we see, uh, Daniel Cassidy uh, off in second place. Um, Ch trying to chase down uh, Kevin uh, Kevin Bouchard still at 1.25 kilometres. That's quite a lot. Um, be interesting to see uh, what happens next. I remember, I'm going to copsy. I'm going to ignore. That is definitely a Slovenian flag, by the way. Uh, and that's why I think the other one that I was looking at earlier is not a Slovenian flag. It's slightly different, and I can't remember which country it is. So sorry about that. Um, I'm pretty sure it's Eastern European though. 
it's uh, probably like the Czech Republic or something like that, I think. Uh, maybe we'll have to look at that. Daniel Cassidy, uh, can he claw back Kevin Bouchard Howe? Um, he's got 200 metres on David Blodgett. David Blodgett, uh, remember, is in second place in the series at the moment. And Zach Horner, I don't think he's riding in this. So, David Blodgett, if he gets anything like, um, well, anything more than 60 points will take him ahead of David Blodgett. But he's only 33 points in front of Mike Lister. And Mike Lister is racing in this. You can't see him in the top uh, batch there, but he was certainly with those riders. And I suspect um, that most of those riders, if we go into the... Uh, into that batch, I think we'll probably find that Mike Lister ought to be there unless something has gone horribly wrong for him. No, Mike Lister is there. Uh, no, he's, hang on. Um, Mike Lister is quite a way back. So Mike has got dropped, I think, on the hill uh, for some reason. He's in 15th place. So, um, yeah, 1.2. It's quite a big guy. He's with uh, the American Navin there. Um, something's happened to Mike. Um, he's got dropped out of the front group, which means he's not going to score as many points in that, as people in that front group. Uh, Mike is currently in third place in the series, though. He's on 421. Now, Mike Schwartz, who uh, is in the, the group ahead uh, in 13th place, uh, is on 398 points. So um, there's only about 22 points between Mike Lister and Mike Swart. Mike Swart can probably um, gap Mike Lister by 22 points. Uh, so therefore, he would overtake uh, Mike Lister. Is Alex Plasier uh, racing today? Because he's uh, in fourth place. Uh, these three riders, and Char Charlie Revels, um, not far, he's only 27 points behind uh, Mike Swart. So, um, there's a lot to be played out here. Um, this would be quite interesting to see where they go. Uh, but with Zach, if Zach Harner is not racing, then we've got uh, an opportunity um, uh, to uh, see this really get shaken up. Well, you can ponder that. Uh, we're going to take a short ad break. Um, while you ponder that, um, I'm not actually trying to look at my Eastern European flags during the break and see if we can't identify what that other flag was. But join us again after the break. This is uh, this is shaping up to be a very interesting race in the men's day. Uh, don't go anywhere. This is going to be an absolute cracker, uh, even if the uh, race splits up, because the permutations in the series are immense this is a big shake up this is a big day in echelon racing stay tuned watch the ads might be some good products you want to buy stay tuned
Well, hopefully you got all the commentary there. I was talking away, but uh, I think the button might have been muted. So apologies if you missed anything there. Um, we're having a look at men A and uh, just seeing that um, David Cassidy is a whopping 1.3 kilometers uh, behind Kevin Bouchard Howe. Um, Sophocles uh, is uh, up there in fourth place. Sophocles, uh, 360 points in the series, 150 behind Zach Harmer, who we think is not racing today. So, um, so let's have a look at this. Uh, Aris Sophocles, um, a lot of US flags there, isn't there? I'm, uh, the, uh, Stars and stripes flying high, Aaron Sophocles um, doing 280 watts. I think it depends whether you go on and off the front of this little group, um, but this group has thinned itself down. Um, as, I, as I was saying before the break, this is going to be a tremendous shake-up in the series. This is quite exciting. Zach Harner is almost certainly uh, going to lose top spot. I think to David Blodgett, who's in that group, we can see him there. Aris Sofrapes uh, is in the top seven as well. Alex Plasier, I don't think, is racing. Mike Schwart uh, is up there in this group, I believe, as well. So that... Um, no, Mike Schwart. Yes, Mike Schwart is in that group. Uh, Mike Lister, I think the um, the biggest loser here because he's uh, he's in the group behind, so he's going to lose places to all these rivals. But remember, of course, Mike Lister has the advantage that he's ahead of all those rivals uh, by a healthy twenty points. So, uh, for example, if Mike Lister can get to the front of the group he's in, um, and Mike Swart say finishes at the back of the group here, um, then actually the distance uh, is irrelevant because the points gap won't be too much for mine. So quite, um, the group is sticking together. Um, I think this uh, this group is going to sort of work hard. Oh, Mike's on his own. Um, oh dear. Um, I say actually, I say that sympathetically. I think Mike's um, no, Mike will be happy at because he's uh, pulling away from Navin, isn't it? They were together. Um, got Rob Miller there. Um, there's a little bunch behind. I think uh, I think uh, Chris Navin. Uh, has been dropped by Mike Lister. Uh, we can see riders just behind, uh, that's Miller and Goldbeck uh, coming up from the USA and Canada. Um, I think Chris Navin will let himself get into that group. Um, and then what may happen is that the, um, I think if they're a little group, they might have the advantage and catch um, Mike Lister. But Mike, um, Mike uh, might uh, actually like that as well because with 50 kilometers to go being in a group is probably advantageous to all of them obviously rob miller uh, leading the charge depends whether mike really wants to get in a good group uh, a big group or not i guess Let's see, Asta now in 21st place, um, out on his own, 35 metres ahead of uh, M. Girotti, um, the Frenchman. Uh, so not a lot. Um, and again, the question comes, do you want to be caught or do you want to be solo? And it's uh, Girotti uh, and Harris, the Canadian, uh, in the chase there. Um, I think they're going to work together. I've got a feeling that uh, Asta is Len Harris. Uh, from Canada in 23rd place. They're on a 1% gradient um, there in the early part of the course. Um, they still got that mountain to go over. Remember, it's three times over the mountain uh, during this race as we look across the board and uh, take him where they're all at.
So the men's B, um, we've got clutch of riders. That that seven that um, we did wonder whether it would all come back together um, earlier on the climb. Is holding together, it's a group. Um, Marion Hembrick there, um, Borders, um, De Schmidt. Oh, they're dropping somebody there. I don't think this will last though. I don't think. Um... Oh, Gile, that was the um, other flag I was going to look up, wasn't it? <laughs> Maybe I won't have to if it gets dropped. But uh, the uh, I have to say, there's, there's several flags that look like um, look like that, and uh, as I say, you have to um, you have to sort of look at the badge to see which one it is. Um, and I say, I don't think that's Slovenia. I think that is one of the other Eastern European countries. Uh, we shall have to uh, we have to work that out before the end of the race, won't we? So we um, looking at this little group, uh, ninth, tenth. Um, this is the men's bees race. Uh, they are now 1.87 kilometres uh, off the front eight, so they're not going to win. Um, but nevertheless, they're going to work together to get themselves around the course. No, it's, um, here we are. <clears throat> so, uh, Borders now is the uh, rider in first position in the men's bees group. Um, I think this will, uh, this will sort of change. I mean, I think they'll rotate. I don't think uh, we're going to see one rider on the front forever. Um, some people are willing to do this though. So, uh, you never know. Um, it's, uh, Remember, of course, it's, the tactics are a bit different in this, aren't they? Because um, you uh, you get sort of things where the um, you know in pro races uh, teams are actually working for one rider, but here everybody's an individual. Um, so how you run a race is uh, not around some sort of tactic other than in your head, and of course you don't really really know um, what the other riders are thinking or how they feel or. Or, or what have you so um, there's a whole load of uh, variables here that um, you know that uh, it's Slovakia that flag isn't it I think <laughs> right, um, I'm just trying to refresh my memory as to which one it is but uh, I've got a feeling it's Slovakia but uh, anyway yes it is So looking at the uh, four screens now, um, Men's A is still being dominated by Kevin Howe Blanchard. Let's look at the paracycling, see who that is um, grinding their way up a 3.4%. Um, <clears throat> It is Paul Gigor who's in first place. Now three kilometres ahead of Michael Brooks and he's got 9.2 kilometres to go. Remember uh, this was a much shorter race uh, for the uh, paracyclists and the hand cyclists uh, as opposed to the men's A and the men's B. So we will see these guys finish at first. They um, only effectively doing one lap I suppose aren't they? About 27 kilometres and I think that would be more than enough for me if I was doing that certainly hand cycling. So uh, Mike Brooks there in second place, um, and obviously he's going to claw up a lot of points, um, and both of them are. Um, I would guess, and you have to ask these guys, but I would guess that these um, guys race each other all the time and know each other. So uh, there's probably a great camaraderie amongst these um, racers. And I think I was just saying in commentary yesterday, I have actually organised a hand cycling race myself in the past, and I. Um, did note that the uh, what was going on um, was that the riders all knew each other. They turned up at the same circuits and everything else like that. Uh, and it was a bit of a community as much as they were racing against each other. And I think they kind of knew their natural uh, pecking order. You know, you knew who the strong rider was. But you still enjoyed racing against them and seeing them 
and, and being part of it all. Um, we definitely like some more of these guys, and you can see them all there. Um, now that you see Jackie Jones pumping away uh, in the Zoom room, and Sander Kuman, who's in the lead. Um, Sand, I mean, look, both this is absolute sort of like rhythmic approach. I mean, you can see it better in San, um, Sander's picture because of the way the camera is situated. But there's just this absolute sort of cadence uh, that's going on, isn't there? It's, um, you know, there's no respite from it. It's just churn, 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 churn. And um, biceps to be proud of, of course. Paul Gilgore still looking like he's reading a book. I, I I suspect what's happening is Paul Kilgore has got his computer screen on his left hand side and uh, all it looks to me like is that he's sitting there reading a book or something but uh, I'm obviously wrong I'm obviously wrong and uh, again I, I made a comment yesterday that I'm quite interested um, in looking around the uh, scenery that everybody's doing it all in because um, I definitely do it sort of out in the backyard garage or shed and um so quite a few people do it in their houses don't they paul Gilgore, gore uh 2.7 ahead of michael brooks now uh, with five kilometers to go let's have a look at the hand cycling and uh, sandy kuman is nicely comfortably 3.4 um meters uh, ahead of uh, Jackie Jones and uh, Bryant is another 10 kilometers behind that. Uh, Bryant struggling a little bit on the uh, on the climbs I'm not surprised uh, they are steep and 6% um, I think I probably find that a challenge uh, using my legs let alone my arms so uh, you just keep going mate um, that'll be fine. So Sander Kuman um, Firing away, still some more. So going back to um, going back to uh, Durango, we were looking at that a little bit um, uh, earlier on, and the sort of things you can do uh, in the area. Um, so there's a place called Purgatory Resort. Apparently, um, I'm not quite sure why they call it Purgatory, but uh, <laughs> fascinated to know why. Um, so it's, it's about, apparently it's just north of Durango, um, and it's just uh, it's about a quarter of a mile uh, further north than the finishing line of this apparently. Um, anyway, in Purgatory, you you can uh, have a peaceful pedal through the uh, Animas River Valley before uh, ascending the heart of the majestic San Juan Mountains, which we mentioned earlier. Uh, Twenty-five miles of pavement and more than two thousand three thousand feet of vertical climb um, sounds painful. Uh, but I suspect um, we all like a mountain climb really don't we I've done loads I get halfway up the mountain wondering why I'm doing it I get to the top and think it was worth every pedal stroke uh, so there's village plaza there costumes and it's all sorts going on so uh, purgatory resort you want to google that um, before you uh, forget all about it and uh, I think I think Durango sounds brilliant I'm going there I'm definitely going there so let's, uh, we're back in the pain cave. Um, let's say uh, David Broger, he's uh, he's looking a little bit more grimaced at the moment, isn't he? But uh, he's probably going to be our series leader at the end of this. So recognise the face because you could well see him on the podium uh, by the end of this series. Uh, let's have a look at the men's A. Um, see if anybody is getting close to. Uh, I'm sure how they're not. Oh, they just look at that. That's emphatic. Daniel Ca Cassidy, um, Eagle Cops, um, who we're going to ignore because we've got a feeling uh, that there might <clears throat> be some sort of uh, view on his participation. I don't know. I, I, you know, this is speculation. I just flagged that one up. Um, it was flagged up to me uh, that he has had doping issues. Um, and it may well be that, that all the uh, punishments have been served and he's clean and this is a clean race and he's legitimate but uh, we just flagged that one up that there is a track record of dodginess shall we say so uh, I think uh, I think we can assume that with uh, half the race done uh, a lead of Ooh, you know, a couple of kilometres over Daniel Cassidy. I think um, 
I think we can assume that I think Kevin Bouchard how is going to win um, this race. I don't. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think he's uh, put in a, a fantastic. According to Wikipedia, Kevin Darnell Hart is an American stand-up comedian and actor. So anyway, Daniel Cassidy uh, on the front. Uh, Eagle Cox putting in, um, and let's assume that he is uh, absolutely legitimate and fine. Um, he's putting in a strong effort on the front of the chasing group. So uh, he's certainly contributing to the race, and that's good. We've got a bunch of um, seven riders here. Harris Sophocles, John Cooper, Mike Schwartz, who is um, well placed in fifth in the series. Um, Harris Sophocles, seventh. This is about scoring points for these guys. Um, and I think they'll contest the finish if they can, because they'll want um, to make the most of those points. They've just come down the mountain. So they're hitting the flatter stage of the race. Uh, I don't think they're going to make massive inroads into the uh, guys ahead. We've got Cassidy and Cox now, um, and Jaden Jaeger, um, who are way out uh, ahead of the next group, which we're looking at now. So this is fragmenting into little groups, um, and uh, I would expect that to happen. I mean. With such a big ascent and such a big descent, um, not everybody's going to stay together quite as easily as they normally would. Sander Koeman dominating the uh, hand cycling goes through the Flamme Rouge. 900 metres to go. Um, the race is his. Um, Jackie Jones, four kilometres behind, so it's going to be, I suppose, <clears throat> a good five, ten minutes before uh, Jackie hits home. Sander Koeman from the Netherlands, uh, today's winner in the hand cycling, and that will uh, be a handy couple of hundred points. Um, in that competition and I suspect <clears throat> um, these guys will race the whole series um, and see it all out but of course you can never ever be certain it only takes a bit of an injury something goes wrong um, some personal reasons or even work reasons uh, miss a race and people will catch you did you remember well they might get 200 for first and 190 for second uh, the fact that you've beaten Jackie Jones by four kilometres, um, it's only 10 points difference in the series. If you miss a whole race, Jackie's going to get 190 points. So you need to race every race if you're going to do this. And it's why I think that um, certainly Jackie Jones and Brian need to uh, keep racing every race. Because if uh, Sander doesn't turn up for one of them, then the race series could be yours and this is a prestigious race series echelon racing league is um one of the top e-racing things you could ever do um so we salute everybody who takes part in it because this is a prestigious and a good and a quality race series and the fact that they go beyond what most promoters do and put in hand cycling and paracycling um an open women's race and both men's a and b i think speaks volumes about how good this paul kilgore now in the paracycling um as we see Santa Kuman uh, complete the race and win the hand cycling. Well done, Santa. Terrific ride. Well done. Uh, Paul Kilgore now 800 metres in the paracycling. Remember, these guys are only doing one lap, so this is uh, you know going to finish now, and we're focusing on the men's A and the men's B after this. 
So, 600 meters to go. Uh, it is looking like it's all uh, it's slightly uphill, isn't it? Plus 0.1%. I don't think Paul would be too worried about that. Um, he's going to win handsomely uh, for Michael Brooks, three kilometers behind. Uh, but again, you know, the points allocated is not going to be massive. So, uh, you know, as I say, you've only got to miss a race and you're in a bit of trouble with this. 400 meters to go as we look at the wonderful scenery um, that RGT have put into this. I do think this is a real road and not a magic road. Therefore, uh, the scenery you see is what the roads actually look like in real life, um, a bit drawn rather than um, photographed. But of course, it's reasonably accurate and I think it looks stunning. I think it's a great advert for the area. Um, I'm sure Durango. Um, will be very proud of the fact that they've got one of the uh, best racing circuits already to have it added to uh, virtual racing especially something as big as uh, Echelon uh, must be a great uh, result for Durango and I think I'm going to visit one day it looks brilliant so uh, Paul Kilgore uh, takes the paracycling race and deservedly so well done Paul so we're going to focus on the men's A's and B's now we'll show you the final results of the other two races of course um, but let's concentrate on the, let's have a look at the B race first, shall we? <clears throat> so let's, um, okay, so uh, the Netherlander uh, and we've got, who got behind it? Kile, who's the uh, Slovakian uh, and Marian Hambrick. Uh, they have got away, haven't they? So there's a trio here, Marian Hambrick, very much sitting in the uh, peloton yesterday. Uh, he's uh, certainly showing his face here. But he's got a little bit of a challenge on as we go up 5.7%. We're going up the uh, big mountain here. This is an attack uh, from 10. Uh, let's have a look at his uh, data if we can. It'll be interesting to see what he's pushing out um, in terms of watts because he's creating a gap here. Um, he's not going out a lot, but um, be interesting to see what his wattage is. Uh, so let's, uh, let's see what we've got. He's uh, certainly putting out 4.8 watts per kilo, so he's pushing it. Um, He's pushing it, he's deliberately attacking it, I would say. And he's pushed it out to 56 uh, meters now. Um, so he's definitely gapping the other two. Remember though, uh, two working together on descent might have uh, what it takes to catch him. He's getting into the final stages of this climb. The gap's gone out to 77, the hand brick, and it's even more uh, to kilo the Slovakian. Maybe this will stick, but don't remember, we're not even halfway through this race yet. This is the second climb though. If you think about it in terms of climbs rather than distance, uh, we're actually two, almost two thirds of the way through this because there's three climbs. If you take the whole distance, we're not even halfway through. Um, but of course, the uh, once you're over the climb, and depending on your outlook on cycling, uh, you might think that once you're over the climb, the other bit is bearable, manageable. Uh, it's over 100 now uh, that Tent has pulled out the uh, Netherlander and we look at Kilo the Slovakian and Mike Hambrick from the USA. Um, <clears throat> Mike Hambrick uh, very slyly is just sitting on the wheel of Kilo, letting him do the work. But I think um, I think they were stronger when they were alternating. Oh, Marion's just going ahead. No, he's not going to do it. He's going to sit there on the wheel, isn't he? Let's see. Uh, let's see how this one plays out. Over to the men's B then, and um, just Schmidt now, 200 meters um, behind Mike Hambrick. Um, it's uh, they're all churning up this hill. I mean, uh, the hill will always be decisive. Um, he's looking ahead to David uh, Bracu, um, another Netherlander, um, who's. I'm not sure if he's going to catch him or not. There's a 60 meter gap there, and David Bracu is about 150 meters off uh, De Schmidt, the Belgian. So this group really has split up um, on this uh, on this climb. I think um, we look back. I mean, this was always a group of seven. Um, you look at Bob Borders, and 
he's now looking up the road um, and well Billings way behind him we're working back one by one but I think you can just see gaps emerging on this second ascent of this climb um, between all the riders in front this is now spread out um, the interesting thing now will be um, will any groups reform um, my instinct is that the gaps are now getting to the point where they might not form themselves back into a big group you might get the odd two that end up side by side uh, but I think this is fragmented and if everybody holds their position you might get something of a procession to the end um, with the exception of those uh, those two up front I mean Kilo and Hambrick I mean Ham they're still still together um, Slovakia and the USA um, together do they want to ride you know are they going to ride together and then duke it out later or are they going to uh, be competitive it's always hard to tell Schmidt in fourth and what can he do he's 500 meters behind Hambrick um, <clears throat> but he's 400 meters in front of uh, David Bracou so a bit in no man's land um, be nicer to get into a group but uh, what do you do do you hang back for the guy behind and risk uh, losing places or do you try and chase down the one in front and absolutely exhausting yourself uh, to the point where your last lap and your master center the climb might be too painful um, so you don't want to burn too many matches what do you do in these situations uh, it's very very difficult it's not because RGT is very very good at um, the draft effect the corresponding point about that is but when you're not in the draft, it actually is quite hard as it is in, you know, because you've actually got the effect of wind resistance. I mean, it's not wind resistance per se, but you know, in terms of pedaling, you are <clears throat> a situation where you're pedaling as if you were riding into air rather than sitting in a draft. So once you are solo, it's hugely different. Um, if you've ever ridden RGT and you've been dropped off one of these things, you just see your speed drop the moment you get dropped out of it. So uh, be interesting to see in the B race um, how those whether or not groups reform or whether we're going to be in a procession. What's happening in the A race? I suspect that Kevin Bouchard Howe is nice and comfortably ahead still. I can't see him being sailed there anytime soon. Uh, 1.8 kilometres. Um, Igor Kops is the person behind uh, alongside uh, Jared Jaeger. And uh, as I say, um, interesting Slovenia uh, and the USA uh, a clutch of US uh, flags coming after that um, only Charlie Revel um, interrupting that with a good old Union Jack um, my country of course um, I'm not the most patriotic so uh, Yaden Jaeger sorry I said Jared didn't I um, Yaden Jaeger, uh, Jaeger uh, from the UK uh, no, that's interesting. sorry it's Charlie Brevet is from the UK Yaden Jaeger uh, from the USA um, like pretty much everybody else in this top bunch um, that is a stars and stripes parade isn't it with Charlie Revel and Igor Cox uh, just interrupting that uh, from Slovenia and the UK uh, respectively David Cassidy's on a point uh, 0.6 gradient uh, chucking out uh, 38 39 kph um, <clears throat> which is pretty impressive uh, given that he's going uphill it's not very steep uphill but also bear in mind please that this is quite an attritional race in which there has been a lot of climbing so there's a lot of climbing in your legs by the time you get to this 51 coming up to 52 uh, kilometers into the race uh, 31 left to do there's plenty of racing to go and remember that 31 uh, is basically just the end of this lap and then a whole new lap uh, over that mountain and of course the three little uh, ramps or four little ramps that precede it so there's some uh, leggy work to be done uh, and he's now up to 48 uh, 40, 47 kph uh, slight uh, descent of 1.9 percent uh, but uh, nevertheless impressive speeds all the same and uh, we look at the next group or we look at the fifth group back um, <clears throat> we've got Cassidy and Jaeger uh, ahead of those. Um, this is the one where there's a couple of people like uh, Sophocles and uh, there's Brian Hodges in there. But uh, I think Sophocles and Mike Schwartz are the ones to watch here because um, they are the ones that 
will benefit the most um, from scoring good points. So it's very useful for them just to get around in this group and distance themselves from everybody behind. But there's um, some real value in, in getting a good result in the sprint of a finish. Um, and those that uh, fancy themselves climbing might just give it everything on the last climb and get a distance rather than bother about the sprint. Who knows? Um, we uh, <clears throat> we will find out. I think it's uh, I mean, it's not like pro racing where you can uh, you, you have a list of the riders beforehand. You research what all their strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, we are semi blind when we come into this in the sense that uh, you enter one of these races on uh, RGT and uh, you can actually enter five minutes before the race and you will be um, you know included in the race I don't know you're going to be there I can't do any research on, on who you are uh, luckily because I commentate on a few of these and run races I do know some of the riders um, when I say I know them I've never physically met them of course this is e-racing after all um, so I, I can comment on some of the riders that I've seen perform before but not all of them so it makes it hard to judge what might be uh, in a cyclist brain uh, when they're in this position uh, but like I say I think Software Keys and Swart out of this group are the ones that are looking to gain the most. Uh, Mike Lister is uh, behind them somewhere but I'm not sure where um, but he's must be quite distanced now because uh, we see Feldhaus the uh, German uh, is another one point or another and a half uh, kilometers behind so um, if Mike's not in front of him he's at least one uh, there we are oh Mike's three down um, so Mike Lister looks like he might uh, be overtaken uh, possibly by Charlie Revel, uh, Aris Sokfakis and um, Mike Schwartz uh, in today's race whilst David Blodgett is destined I believe to overtake Zach Carner who's not racing today at the top of the standings so it's going to be a big big change and it's come down to um, and if you take somebody like Mike Lister he might be looking at this and saying well it's better actually to um, you know to get some points um, and have a tough race and remember Mike rode yesterday as well as some of the others did uh, so there's a lot of mile, you know there's a lot of uh, miles or kilometers in their legs um, and some of the riders will just take the view that okay I'm tired but finishing scores me points staying at home um, that's the wrong word isn't it because you stay at home either way but uh, not entering uh, is, is uh, going to score even less points so you know it's probably uh, worth the pain of getting through this oh, we're under 30 kilometers uh, left to go uh, there's the official paracycling result uh, as we know Michael Brooks uh, finishing second there uh, just under nine minutes behind Paul Kilgore our worthy winner of the day those points will be uh, put into the series uh, and I've got a feeling that Paul Gilgore is uh, in the lead with that. Um, but we can actually uh, check. Um, so let's uh, let's see what we've got uh, for you. It's, um, no, I can't check at the moment. Sorry, I can't. Uh, no, I'll have to come back to you um, with the positions in that. Um, so I'm not sure what... Uh, what the standings are, but I've got a feeling Paul Gigor was in the lead in that. Um, let's have another go at getting you the results. It is um, so. Um, no, I don't have the. Uh, I don't have the standings. To hand, I'll just have one more go at this. Um, no, I haven't. Uh, haven't got them to hand. So sorry about that. I, I'll do my best. Uh, see if we can find out a bit later on. But I've got a feeling uh, Paul Gore's. Really... So the hand cycling, uh, Sandra Kuman, Jackie Jones, and I think we've got Michael Brooks. Uh, sorry, we've got Bryant still to come in, haven't we? Um, who is what, 11 kilometers from the end so I think that's going to take him a while um, Bryant uh, obviously having to um, take some of these hills a little bit slowly and a little bit of a breather um, but uh, I, just, I mean I don't know I would imagine that people are going to hand cycling 
and particularly if you've got it in hand cycling because you've had an accident of some sort that's changed your lifestyle, uh, it might take some years to build up the uh, strength and skills uh, needed to do it. So um, and you don't do that by not participating. So I'd encourage everybody uh, who does hand cycling to get involved when they can. So the leaders in the men's A race um, just coming to the end of lap two and so that'll be the final lap for them. Uh, when I say leaders that is of course Kevin Blanchard how and it should be singular and uh, the leader shouldn't it look at that uh, 1.5 um, head of Eagle Cops, um, Jaden Jaeger uh, riding with Eagle Cops and then a gap of about 400 meters back to Daniel Cassidy, Charlie Ravel um, <clears throat> just at the front of that little group of riders going back um, to the rest of the top 10 John Cooper, Mike Schwartz, uh, all riding in that little bunch of course that we've seen throughout the race so uh, Daniel Cassidy riding alongside the railroad track Charlie Rivell putting his uh, nose on the front here. Um, riding over 300 watts. Um, I'm not sure whether Charlie, Charlie's actually trying to um, <clears throat> stretch the group or just doing a turn on the front. Um, John Cooper just easing up to get on his wheel, but then immediately dropping off. John Cooper pushes up again. Doesn't quite want to go on the front, does he, John? Uh, I think everybody's quite happy for Charlie Revel to uh, <laughs> take the strain and take the pain on the front there. If I were Charlie, I'd probably just ease up a bit and let him <laughs> let somebody else do it. All right, Aristophanes is going to take up the running. Charlie drops back into uh, Charlie. Uh, I think Charlie doesn't want to be too far back. Um, and he's gone off the front again. Seems odd to want to do this when you're in a group. I mean, if we watch uh, Marion Hammock yesterday, he he was um, very smugly, uh, snugly, and cleverly sitting in the pack um, so that he had something left at the end and, and certainly clawed up a few places as a result of that. Back to 12th position now, uh, Feldhaus, who is in no man's land. But uh, only 200 metres away from uh, nearest rival, Sean Feldhorse. Um, so, can, you know, he, he could be, uh, could find himself catching the person in front, perhaps. Uh, maybe not. It's uh, 1.63 metres, sorry, uh, kilometres. Sorry, I misread that. Um, in fact, no. And in fact, the and snow behind him is quite away. Uh, Mike Lister behind him. So, Mike Lister way down in 14th, uh, which is. Surprising me a little bit, Rob Miller uh, further back in 16th than I would normally expect to see uh, Rob riding, but there we are. Carter Snow. I won't. Uh, <laughs> that's a great name, isn't it? <laughs> it's uh, like turning up uh, at somebody's house with a wheelbarrow. Full of snow again I've got a car to snow. Um, I shouldn't really say things like that should I? That's probably uh, a bit of a no-no in broadcasting. I'm sure Carter won't mind. I bet uh, it's not the first time he's heard some boring old uh, person come up with that little quip. Mike Lister riding happily uh, with Rob Miller and uh, Goldbeck from Canada and um, I think uh, let's say Mike rode yesterday so I think he's uh, He's probably settling for a 
you know, clocking up some points um, one way or another. Uh, he's riding for a new team. I was uh, commentating yesterday and um, I couldn't remember the name of his team. So I had to go and look it up afterwards. It was Tour 2000. Um, <clears throat> they're based in Somerset in the UK. Uh, they're a new team and um, they're, uh, they're involved with Callus actually. So it's uh, Tour 2000 with Callus uh, uh, riding up the UK down there in Somerset in the West Country. Um, and that's the new kit. Uh, Mike was riding with another rider in the same kit yesterday. So I assumed they were in the uh, same team. Uh, I think uh, Rob Miller's got a very similar kit on as well. So just wondering if they're riding as uh, teammates. Are those kits the same or not quite? It's hard to tell, isn't it? <clears throat> Jay Hanahan, uh, another UK rider. It's all my compatriots a little bit further back in the field, um, apart from Charlie Revel. Jonathan Hanahan uh, riding for the UK uh, in a rather cool grey strip. I like that actually. It's um, I don't know how practical that is in real life, but uh, looks pretty cool on RGT, doesn't it? Um, well done, Jonathan Hanahan. <laughs> then he goes through the Flam Rouge, but of course, he's only going through the Flam Rouge from the point of view of that one, um, and he's got another center of that mountain. Uh, Nathan Daly is the next rider up riding for the USA and he is back in 18th position. Uh, he's again another one of these in, in the sort of no man's land in the sense that he's 1.6 kilometers behind uh, Hannah Hand but uh, 1.35 ahead of Navin. Um, so uh, it's always uh, it's always one of those things I think where you know what do you do? You try and catch somebody you drop back and try and work with somebody, always risky, or if you just sit it out and churn it out. Um, because it's hard work, churning it out, there's no effect, draft effect. You've got that stonking great big mountain in the middle of this, and three little nasty bumps just before it. Um, so, hey ho, uh, hard one. <laughs> it's hard one. Chris Nevin, uh, and he's uh, got his hands up. <laughs> Do you think he might be watching this? <laughs> Wave if, you, if you're watching this, Chris. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Uh, I don't know if he... Uh, somebody just shouted out the interviews on the screen. Give us a wave, Chris, if you're watching. Yes, he is. Oh, it's fantastic. All power to you, mate. Well done. Brilliant stuff. <laughs> I like that. Uh, so he's going to get an award for today. I don't know what it is. We'll make it up at the end. You won't actually get a prize, Chris. But uh, you deserve something for... Uh, being the best party person in the race, something like that. Is that what yes, cool, yeah, okay. Chris Nevin, the official best party person in the whole race, riding for the USA. Well done, Chris. Uh, another one of my compatriots, Mr. Astor, uh, with the Union Jack, my country. Uh, he's second to last, but uh, still gets my admiration, because I think this is a uh, great race. As to you, Mr. Harris, uh, from Canada. This is, uh, I mean, you're still, <laughs> you're still churning out 38 kilometres an hour in your last place. So, um, Len Harris uh, is the Lantern Rouge, but nevertheless, he's still, in my book, an absolute hero. Uh, these are quite acceptable speeds. I mean, if you think that the last place rider is uh, capable of riding just under uh, 40 kph. Now, I, I do appreciate this is a 1.4 uh, negative gradient, but Nevertheless, uh, you know, you've got to be pretty good to be in this uh, wherever you finish. And remember too that a lot of riders have avoided this race because it's a big long one with a stonking great big mountain. Uh, so, you know, if you're brave enough to enter, um, I think just finishing is absolutely fantastic. Well done to every single rider in this. Men's A, Men's B, Paracycling, Hand Cycling and the ladies, of course. Uh, I think it, this series is going to start getting really interesting from now because you're beginning to see the leagues shake up. Uh, you're beginning to see who's got points and who hasn't. And the people who don't turn up at races, and as I say, Zach Carner in the men's A, um, ha I'm not sure why he's not here today. He was racing yesterday. Uh, he is going to lose ground today. Uh, whereas if you take somebody like Mark, Mike Lister who rode yesterday, uh, probably feeling the effects, uh, he's going to lose places, but he will still score points to mitigate the damage. Uh, and that's the strategy that riders have got to look forward to uh, as we go into January. Uh, there is a list of, uh, there is a calendar of all the races in January that we can look at. 
Um, and it'll be interesting to see how those play out. Uh, so we're not going to have these sort of double header weekends, I don't believe, in January. Uh, they will be single weekend races. But so people are less likely to, uh, you know, ride one out of two races. And here we are. So let's have a look at the calendar. We've got the Tour of Gila uh, on the 2nd of January. So uh, no hangovers, right? OK, if you go out New Year's Eve, drink sensibly um, so that by the 2nd of January, uh, your head and legs are in the right place. The tolls are tough. Um, I think the second word in there might give you clues to what that feels like. The tolls are tough. Hmm. I reckon that might be a bit hilly. Um, I don't know. I don't know. The, I, I'm not familiar with Tulsa. The only thing I know is the Gene Pitney record, so I don't really know a lot about Tulsa. Um, I'll have to go and do my research. Intelligentsia Cup. Now, of course, that applies to all of us because we're all intelligent people uh, on this, aren't we? Absolutely, to a man and a woman. Uh, that's on January the 16th. So, oh, actually, so I lied. We have got a doubleheader weekend in the middle of January. Uh, then we've got the Joe Martin stage race. Uh, bringing it all together on the 29th of January. So we have four more races. We've done uh, five, haven't we? So um, no, we've done four. Sorry. Uh, the uh, I think the, the uh, community combine on 13th of November wasn't uh, wasn't included in the series, I believe. So we're halfway through the series. Um, how do you play this one out? Well, certainly I think everybody should ride the 2nd of January because they haven't got to choose between one day and the next. The January the 15th, 16th weekend looks like an absolute corker because that will shake everything up. I think everybody who's in it needs to ride both days and it might not suit all of them. That will be an absolute corker. And then it will leave us with that final weekend at the Joe Martin stage race on the 29th of Jan uh, with a very exciting finale with whatever's left out of the carnage weekend. Then we're going to call it that now. The Tulsa Tough and the Intelligentsia Cup weekend is the carnage weekend. Uh, the pros have to do this as well. This is the calendar for the pro races. Um, pretty much the same lineup, so they're all doing the same courses. Uh, I would imagine the pros do it a little bit faster. They don't let me commentate on that. Uh, and I should imagine it's uh, slightly uh, more serious commentary than some of the uh, flippant comments that I might chuck at you. Um, but we're here to uh, talk you through a very long race today. So you'll let me indulge in a few comments here and there. And don't forget, look out for those January races too, because hopefully the hand cycle avatars will be part of the IGT setup. Uh, and I think that will be a great addition to what is already a great series here on Echelon League Racing. Um, you can look up all the results after the race. Um, and bear in mind that I'm not going to be able to work out the standings in a split second uh, after the race. And they do have to be adjudicated and checked uh, for eligible riders. And uh, so therefore, you, what you need to do is to look at the series standings. Uh, you go on to www.echelonracingleague.com or I think maybe uh, a little bit later, you can probably go on rgtdb.com and you'll get all the standings. Um, I urge you to do that because I think this is going to be a huge shake up in the men's aids today. Um, and I think it's, uh, I think we'll all be poised uh, with their mouse or whatever, uh, clicking on the, uh, results as soon as we possibly can to see where it all stands uh, this is um, as I say I think January is going to be absolutely fantastic can't wait so um, we've only got uh, we're under uh, in the men's age we're under or certainly at the front of the race anyway um, we're under 20k to go so uh, we're probably looking at 20 25 minutes to the end of the men's a race as kevin bush of how uh continues to he's only um actually he's being caught by Igor cops and uh uh Jaden jaeger uh from the usa and to be honest they're only 300 meters in front of daniel cassidy uh brian hodges uh further kilometer behind david daniel cassidy uh along with uh, smith welford uh, mike swart in there john cooper uh, Aris Sophocles and Charlie uh, Ravel. Uh, Charlie Ravel may be 10 metres off the back of Mike Schwartz at the moment. That would be uh, quite a blow to his um, chances. He's in the top seven at the moment uh, and that gap's extending. Uh, Mike Schwartz is, yes, uh, Chris, yeah, I think uh, Charlie Revel is falling off the back of the group. So, um, you see Schwartz and you see Revel there. And Revel is now 200 metres behind Schwartz. Now that is a big blow to his chances. He's in the top seven. Um, he is only 11 points 
ahead of Aris so uh, Sophocles. Um, now the interesting thing is, I don't think Sophocles can get 10 points on him because there's not 10 people in that group. So I think uh, Charlie will probably just hold his place, uh, but Aris Sophocles will make up ground on him. Uh, Mike Schwartz will pull away, although of course Charlie Rever will make up ground on Alex Plasia um, and probably overtake him. I would guess because uh, Alex is not riding today. Uh, Zach Harmer, the biggest loser, I think, today by not riding. Uh, he's going to lose top spot uh, almost for certain. So Chris Snow has caught uh, Mike Lister. I think Mike's struggling from a bit too much racing here. Um, and Rob Miller um, put it away 50 metres from uh, Goldbeck. I must admit it's um, it's all well and good sort of sitting there watching this on your screen. Um, when you watch somebody disappearing away ahead of you, I think you see it's gone up to 60 metres gap now. So if you're in Goldbeck's position and you're sort of sitting there watching this guy go up the road and you're absolutely hurting because you're on a 4% gradient here as he is, um, it is soul destroying because <laughs> you think it's not far but I don't think I can make that up. Um, particularly on a gradient um, and this is why people attack on gradients of course but uh, I can I just can imagine what his world feels like at the moment um, he is of course ahead um, by just under a kilometer of um, Jonathan Hanahan um, whether or not uh, Hanahan's <clears throat> gonna make up any ground if it, I mean if Goldberg is struggling um, whether Hanahan can make up any ground uh, remains to be seen. Uh, Hanahan himself um, comfortably ahead of uh, Daly and uh, we're going to the back now, Chris Navin. Uh, Chris Navin is uh, entertainer of the day of course, he's the star of the show. The, he wins the personality prize as uh, Chris Navin. Chris Navin, personality, here he is, uh, I'm sure he'll give us away. He won the personality prize uh, for this race, Chris. Absolute star. Look at that. See, he knows what he's doing. Is it? These are the sort of guys, I don't know if you've ever been to one of these um, things where they have the sprinters races on the track, but they get absolute showmen, just like you, Chris. That's what you should be doing, mate. You should be on, uh, you should be on, uh, <laughs> you should be one of those guys they pay to go in the old sprint races at the uh, track racing to keep the crowd entertained. Absolutely top notch, mate. Um, And so just behind him, uh, we've got Aster, and uh, yeah, I mean, he's a decent speed. I mean, for somebody who's just uh, ridden 55 uh, kilometers and been over a mountain twice, um, I think I'd be quite pleased with that. Len Harris uh, taking up the rear, uh, but uh, every bit of star uh, has every rider in here. Uh, even though Chris Navin gets an extra star because he's personality, he wins the personality prize. So Kyla is um, clear away in the B race, not by a huge amount, um, but I think it's telling. Um, we are on the final lap. I think there's a sort of um, possibility he's just looking at that Slovenian and saying, I don't think these two guys have quite got it. Um, and if you look at the racing yesterday, um, Hambrick was very much, uh, Marion Hambrick there, He's very much sitting in the pack uh, to make the most of the draft. Um, and he's found himself exposed today. Now, I don't know Marion, um, so I don't know uh, what his riding style is. I don't know whether he likes hills, he relishes them. I have no idea. Um, 
but he rode a very smart race yesterday and he finds himself in a very different position because this is requiring sticking your nose into the wind quite a lot um, Schmidt sitting on his wheel although uh, I think he's going to take a little bit of a turn on the front or maybe it's an attack I think Marion's probably smart enough to stay on his wheel uh, judging by what I saw yesterday or well, Schmidt is pulling away maybe Marion's suffering a little bit here um, let's hope not Right, well, Marion, you know, chase him down if you can it's so easy to say it isn't it I mean it's not <laughs> I'm actually uh, doing it. I wonder if Deschmart is actually hunting down uh, Killer there's the uh, Slovenian. Hmm. That's interesting. So there's 54 between Killer and Deschmart. Uh, Marion not getting distance too much, but it is just edging out a little bit, I think. Uh, borders uh, David Brecky uh, in the next group. They're neck and neck, of course. Uh, and then we get a huge gap back to uh, Billing uh, Panas Panarisi, who I've not mentioned so far, and Metcalf and um, Flo Kill, uh, making up the nine. Uh, we've got uh, only nine riders left in the men's B, so we've clearly had some uh, dropouts in that, I think. Um, at least one, anyway. So Panarisi, everybody gets their five minutes of fame, at least I mentioned you. I mean, I felt very guilty there was somebody in the uh, race yesterday. I didn't even notice them until, the, until near the end of the race. Uh, and Metcalf as well. So, um, I've got one more. Uh, from the Netherlands, uh, Broco uh, is the uh, last rider. But again, um, I think uh, more power to you. Uh, I, there's nothing wrong with finishing ninth in a race of this calibre and it is not an easy race by any stretch of the imagination um, you're not quite on the last lap I'm afraid uh, so it's a uh, little way to go um, but nevertheless so uh, certainly on the last lap is Kile the Slovakian who is now the leader of the men's race by a clear 84 I don't think Schmidt is making up ground if anything it's going out so I think uh, this is a positive attack uh, from Pile. Um to see how he copes with the mountain. I mean, with this many miles and that much climbing in your legs, the mountain could still catch you out. Yeah, you know, people, we, we all know, we've all watched Grand Tours when they go up the mountain and we watched a, a rider crack uh, just when they were looking strong. Um, there's a certain amount of poker faced uh, bluff in a, in a pro race that uh, the avatars don't give away. Um, in quite the same way in e-racing but uh, we've seen the zoom room haven't we <laughs> we've, seen, <laughs> we, we've seen how uh, yeah I mean look at Jackie Godby in the ladies race earlier whoa dear what a poker face what a queen she is uh, absolute star Schmidt now is actually closing out killer so it's, the moment they hit the slope Schmidt is just reeling him in that's gone down from 80 to 30 in no time at all uh, but Marion Hambrick is still distant. So to Schmidt, uh, looks like he might just have it on uh, Kile on the climbs. Now, that's one thing saying that on this short climb we're on now, uh, and we've got a couple of those to go uh, before we get to the big climb. But who's got the legs on the big climb? Because I think to Schmidt, see, it's going out again. The Kile's responded to that, he's pushed it out to 60 again. It looked to me that once they were on that climb, see, it gets flat. All right, Kile hits the flat first, so he's going to pull out a few meters before De Schmidt uh, gets onto the flat. So we see what happens next. But Kile's pulling out that distance on the flat. This is going to be quite fascinating, isn't it? Because clearly Kile can do it on the flat, but the moment they start going upwards, De Schmidt starts making up the ground. It's interesting. Slovenia has got quite big uh, mountainous hills. Uh, Belgium hasn't. But uh, there's a common uh, mistake made by a lot of British people when they turn around and tell you that uh, Belgium is flat. Um, it's actually not. The south of Belgium is very, very hilly in the Ardennes. And of course, um, if you've ever been to Flanders, you know there's a little strip of hills uh, where they've got all those nasty climbs like the Koppenberg and the Quermont, uh, the Moor de Gerolsbergen and plenty of others. Uh, and if you have cycled those, you know that they're very, very hard. Now, they're not very long, but they are very, very hard. And Belgium is a country obsessed with cycling as De Schmidt brings it back down to 41 
kilometers, but guess what? They're going up a slope. Every time they go up a slope, the Schmidt makes up ground. If he can hold this at that sort of distance, then on the big mountain, my bet is that Schmidt overtakes Kilo, but Kilo then has the advantage on the descent and the flat home. So the objective for De Schmidt is quite clearly, see it's flattened out again, and automatically that uh, gap goes up to 60. So De Schmidt, we can deduce from this as a climber, and Kilo is a flat sprinter. I say sprinter, not in the uh, conventional terms of people who win sprint races, but uh, he has got speed. He's a speedster on the flat. Poor old Marianne Hambrick is not going to emulate yesterday. He's now 300 metres adrift of De Schmidt. Um, but I'll tell you what, uh, Marianne, I think your haul over the uh, two races uh, is phenomenal. And I think you rode a very smart race yesterday. Uh, so well done to you, sir. Um, and I think if you do uh, hang on to third here, that will be very respectable. Um, and I think you are going to be one of the uh, vedettes of the series. Um, keep racing. Um, and I like the jersey too, of course, which is the main thing. Not really. I mean, <laughs> not really, it's not the main thing. Not not really, I don't like your jersey. Anyway, let's uh, start, stop digging a hole for myself and have a look at how David uh, Breku from the Netherlands is getting on, uh, along with Bob Borders. The... Uh, I think the pair are sort of working as a little bit of a team. I don't know if that's conscious or just inevitable. Um, Billing now in that resplendent jersey. Um, US rider <clears throat> is... Well, it's Pomasi is uh, too... You know, say, most of these riders now are in positions where I don't suppose they've got huge ambitions of changing the position they finish. Uh, and the money objective is to m just not crack and make sure you don't get caught. Um, as we look at Kilo now, 76 metres ahead of the Schmidt, uh, but what look at the gradient, it's flat. So um, I think the hill is going to be quite cracking. Let's have a look at the men's Bs and see what, uh, uh, I'm sorry, let's have a look at the men's A's, I meant, uh, and see what's going on there. I'm sure Kevin uh, bouchard Hal is now, uh, it's two kilometres ahead. I mean, it's sort of held a little bit there, hasn't it? Um, Eagle Copsey and uh, Jaden uh, Jaeger uh, working to get in unison together. Um, there's a little gap back to Daniel Cassidy. Um, he's only 60 metres behind those two. Um, it's going to be harder to catch them in the sense they can work off each other. Um, but, uh, oh, sorry, 600 metres, I beg your pardon. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so maths, who needs it? Uh, yeah, maybe 600 metres is a bit uh, bit much to ask for Daniel Cassidy, sorry. Um, uh, but he's a comfortable 1.2 kilometres ahead of uh, anybody behind him with uh, Mike Swart and uh, I think it's Tom Smith um, working in unison alongside John Cooper. Uh, Aris Sotfkis and Brian Hodges and Welford all in that little group. Uh, and Charlie Ravel has firmly dropped off that little group, uh, now 700 uh, metres behind Mark Schwartz. So, Charlie Ravel, uh, as we thought, uh, was the uh, one who f was going to fade and not get back on. Uh, well, we didn't think that before he faded. It was a bit of a shock when he did, but uh, we saw quite early on in, in the uh, with the gap that it was expanding quickly. And you had that bad feeling for poor old Charlie. But like I say, he, uh, and there's six people ahead of him. Um, Mike Schwark can only finish six places ahead of him. Um, and uh, there's only, let's say, there's only, what, 27 points. So uh, Mike Schwark can only get 33 points ahead of Charlie Revel in the league. So, you know, the losses won't be great. I mean, Charlie will be disappointed, but the losses will not be great because Mike Schwart can't finish more than six places ahead of him. So six points possibly lost uh, to the rival who's one place ahead at the moment. Both of them will overtake Alex Plasier though. Um, I don't think they can overtake Mike Lister even though Mike's having a rough day uh, back there in 14th place. 
Um, even in 14th place, you're not that far behind. Uh, so if you look at the gaps here, Mike Lister is way behind uh, Charlie Revel, uh, four kilometres. But in terms of places, only three places. So he's only, you know, only going to lose a few points. Um, so this is shaping up to be quite a cracking series. And remember, January the 2nd, uh, have it in your diary. The first thing you do after New Year's. So you spend New Year's Day recovering from New Year's Eve, okay? You get over that, and the next day, you go out for a little spin on your bike, uh, just to see what it feels like. Maybe a little spin on RGT as well, just to get yourself in the mood. And then you make sure you're watching uh, Echelon Racing League uh, on January the 2nd, because uh, it's going to start unfolding the series. Uh, the weekend on um, 15th and 16th is going to be an explosion and of course the 29th of January the grand finale uh, what a series eh? brought to you by ZMS the broadcasters uh, here uh, for Echelon Racing Promotions and uh, we've had some great races uh, across America some great city crits uh, some climbs I think this is the uh, epic one. Oh, look, it's Chris Navin, <laughs> personality of the uh, personality prize winner. Yeah, he's the man. He's the man. <laughs> you should get free entry to everything. Oh, it is free, isn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, Astler uh, from the UK is uh, next on our list, and then Harris from the uh, from Canada. Only 5.6 kilometres uh, of Kevin Bouchard. How he's going to win uh, unless somebody pulls the plug out um, of his uh, PC or whatever he races on. Um, he should win this. There's no major uphills. He's got a comfortable lead of 1.85. It's been raining a little bit by Iger Cops and uh, Jaden Jaeger, um, but they're not going to make up 1.83 kilometers over the next five kilometers i mean they're basically on seven kilometers uh Kevin's on five they're not gonna make up two kilometers over five uh here's the other two uh jaden jaeger sitting on eagle cox's wheel um as i say uh we have to uh, wait and see whether eagle cox is um permitted to ride i mean there are question marks i am told over his uh, legitimacy but uh, it's nothing to do with me and it is a decision for the organizers of the race and like i say all the things i've heard um which do raise que uh, questions but uh, to be honest they're things in the past and not related to e-racing so um i've got a feeling that there is no reason why he shouldn't be uh, uh excluded for, uh, and what have you um but there are as I say, ongoing lingering doubts um, about his legitimacy based on past events, which, um, as I say, if you've ever been to uh, a <coughs> court hearing, um, past records uh, shouldn't really be talked about too much um, when judging somebody on a specific set of events. So we'll leave that one open. Um, but anyway, he has ridden particularly well um, to get that second place. And he is closing the gap, although it's a little bit too late. Uh, this bunch is going to be the interesting one. Uh, as I say, uh, Aris Socrates uh, and um, Mike Schwartz are the two to watch. It's where they finish affects the series, although I've got a feeling this might be quite an interesting sprint anyway. 8k to go. They're clearly um, going to stick together because there's nothing... Uh, unless somebody really puts their foot down on the front and... Uh, the hangers on get dropped off but then it's always the question it's like what does that prove because if somebody was hanging on and you dropped them um they probably weren't going to sprint anyway on the other hand if they were a good sprinter uh and you dropped them uh then you have had an advantage uh depends how well you know your other riders doesn't it i mean i know um from rgt racing there's quite a few riders i'm familiar with and quite a few i'm not and the ones that i'm familiar with i kind of know how they race a little bit not intimately but uh, a little bit uh, and the ones i don't i don't and i would guess that something like echelon which is attracting uh, a global reach uh, as we see well for just having to work to stay on that group it looks like they're putting a bit of pressure on and he might be struggling to stay on the group uh, it's critical right now the speed is around 46 kph it looks like it's just about going to do it but he's it's yes i think he's made it yes he's done it um, you need to do that. You really don't want to get dropped. But I've got a feeling now we're going to see speed to ramp up. It's dropped down to 40. There was a little explosion there of about 46 
<clears throat> and Welford just just struggled. And now we're seeing somebody else going off the back, uh, working hard to make sure they get back on. So it's uh, now what often you see um, at this stage of a race is that uh, somebody goes off the front and ramps it up a little bit, and you start working out who's still got legs and who hasn't, because you will drop a couple of these people. Um, I think that will happen. It's I doubt, I'm, I'm just trying to say, I doubt it will happen yet. I think maybe around three kilometers you might see something like that. Um, so there's a little way to go for that group. Um, they're on about six and a half, I would guess. So uh, about three kilometers time, I think you'll see that group start playing games. Now, um, these two uh, will probably play cat and mouse a little bit. Uh, I don't know who's the strongest out of these two. Uh, I think Eagle Cops looks the strongest to me. Um, I'm guessing. I'm not. I, you know, real racing. You can look at ra riders' legs, their body language, their faces, um, their reactions to attacks, and things like that. Um, I've just got a feeling Eagle Cops may be the one with the legs there. Um, that said, Jaeger might be playing a canny game of um, <clears throat> not pushing too hard on the front. Uh, and saving it all for an explosive sprint, who knows? So he didn't quite go on the front, or you know, did he not go on the front, or did Eagle Cops decide that he wasn't gonna let him go on the front? Which would seem an odd decision to me. We'll have to see how this one plays out. Um, interesting tussle. 4K to go. Um, <clears throat> so the last couple of K for Kevin Bouchon Howe, um, Daniel Cassidy, He's probably comfortably in fourth now. Um, he's quite a way ahead of the little group of six who we think is going to be the... Uh, so it's going to be two interesting sprints here. Uh, Eagle Cops and uh, uh, Jaeger. Uh, Jaden Jaeger. And um, the group of six where um, there's going to be two things at play there. It's uh, Mike Schwartz and Aris Socrates vis-a-vis uh, -vis the general classification. And uh, all six of them because uh, we'll enjoy a good sprint, wouldn't we? Um, and who thought you'd get a good sprint in a hilly race like this? I didn't. So uh, I'm delighted if we get a little sprint. And remember, um, can we show how he's punching out? <laughs> 40k. Uh, he's, he's still deter He's still hammering it, even though uh, it's going to be a comfortable win. He's going to pass the Flamme Rouge in a moment, and uh, we shall watch him uh, ease home. Um, I don't know if you're uh, listening, Kevin, but raise your arms on the uh, finishing line if you are. Um, I can't say that I would uh, probably be listening if I was, uh, even if I had this commentary on, I'd probably be breathing so heavily I'd be drowning it out. So, a phenomenal race from Kevin Birchard. Uh, Hal, uh, the clear and undisputed winner today in phenomenal form. Uh, let's just enjoy watching him finish the last 800 metres. Down to the last 400 meters, then. It's rolling at home. 300 meters. 300 meters always seems a long time to me when I'm doing one of these. But um, I'm sure Kevin feels quite comfortable, uh, safe in the knowledge that uh, everybody behind him is at least two kilometers or more behind. And there it is. There's the finishing line. Here's the winner of the men's A race, uh, Kevin Bouchard Howe, who is going to go piling up the rankings. Waves his arms in the air. Well done, Kevin. Absolutely phenomenal ride. Uh, and you rode yesterday as well, so I think that's uh, chapeau to you, sir. Extraordinary. Brilliant. Now let's see how these two fit. Two kilometres to go. Um, so I think there's plenty of cat and mousing um, to happen yet. Uh, Igor, of course, they're just pushing a, a little bit on the front there. Oh, oh, that is interesting. I said you would get something like, you might get something like this in the last three kilometres. And 
Jaden Jaeger has gone for it after 1.7. Now that could be too early. It depends how Eagle Cops is going to react to that because he'll look at that in one of two ways. Is Jaden Jaeger, he's pushing out 500 watts now. Uh, this is a lot to sustain for 1.5 kilometers. And, and the, the game is, do you actually get uh, Cops to the position where he thinks, well, I can't win this and gives up? In which case you can slide home yourself, you know, glide home yourself because the person behind you is no longer chasing. Or is Jaden Jaeger going to have to keep this up because Eagle Cops hasn't given up? I've seen plenty of people um, go later than this and still get caught. 200 metres is a lot, but if Jaden Jaeger has just burst himself, he's doing 62 kph. This is extremely fast. Um, yeah, all right, it's minus 4%. Uh, the gap's gone out to 255. I don't think. I don't think Eagle Cops is bothering to chase, so I think that's that. Uh, 56, I mean, again, he's got the descent, but he's doing 56. Uh, whereas uh, Yaden was doing uh, 60. I think Yaden, what, 45 now on a plus one gradient, uh, which is pretty good going, by the way, particularly with that amount of mileage and climbing in your legs. Uh, the gap is 214, it's coming down a little bit. Don't forget, Eagle has got to hit this um, very small and slight gradient himself. Uh, he's not going to make up 200 meters in 600 meters, is my guess. Um, I've seen things, I've seen quite remarkable finishes. Um, Daniel Cassidy uh, comfortably in fourth place. Uh, a terrific ride, well done, Daniel. Uh, we salute you. Cracking bit of, he's 250 meters ahead with 160 to go. You can see the finishing line. He's taken a glorious second position. Well done, Yaden. Uh, well done, Igor, as well, uh, for <coughs> riding um, a quite competitive race. And I think uh, Yaden ought to really thank you because I think you dragged him. Um, and you certainly set the challenge to chase down Kevin Bouchard Howler, even though that uh, never quite materialised in itself. Uh, so, cracking ride, uh, Igor. Uh, uh, well done to you, sir, for lighting up the race too. Great to see. Daniel Cassidy, 400 metres from the finish. Uh, Brian Hodges uh, leading the little group of six. Now, the little group of six, um, <clears throat> they've got one and a half kilometres to go. Uh, this is going to be a very interesting one and a half kilometres. We'll just see uh, Daniel go over the line and we'll probably hit uh, the group of six inside the last uh, kilometre at some point. Well done, uh, Daniel. Terrific ride, a very worthy fourth place. Uh, particularly riding on your own as well, very commendable. Uh, we salute you, sir. Well done. So, the, group of, uh, the little group of six behind us. Now, this is... Uh, this is going to be interesting. Brian Hodges has got 10 metres on the other, so he's gone. Oh, it's really strung out, hasn't it? It's not going to be the bunch sprint we thought. And none of the uh, serious contenders are in the first three of that group. Uh, so Wilford is uh, front. John Cooper. Um, no, sorry, Wilford's not, is he? Um, eighth is Mike Schwartz. Soft, uh, Aris Sophocles and Mike Schwartz. The, the two who really need the points are duking it out now. This, oh, this is cracking stuff, isn't it? Yes, they might get overtaken, but it doesn't matter because it's uh, versus each other, isn't it? Uh, who we got at the front? Now, they are cl clustering together a little bit. Mike Schwartz, John Cooper and Software Keys go into the final kilometre. Mike Schwartz sitting on the t wheels now. This is, is he biding his time for a big thrust and sprint finish? Uh, we're looking at 5th, 6th and 7th here. Brian Hodges. And who's gone for it there? It's Welford, isn't it? But no, he's not. Oh, Hodges has gone. And Smith has absolutely rocketed away from the other two for the United States. That was explosive. 500 metres, that's a long way to sustain it, though. 52 miles an hour, uh, kilometres an hour. And he's maybe slowing up. He's got 400 metres to go. It was too soon. Welford is going to catch him. I'm pretty sure he is. And Brian Hodges isn't out of this yet. Brian Hodges is probably going to catch Smith. I think Smith went too early. Probably didn't fancy the sprint and just tried to catch the others. Wilford is the man who's going to do it. He's got 200 metres to go. He's only got Smith to challenge him. Smith is fading a little bit. Uh, quite going to catch Smith, I think. Wilford takes fifth uh, in a phenomenal finish. Well raced. That was, uh, that was a classy bit of racing. Oh, look at that. 
Hodges just nicks it off Smith on the line uh, with that surge, and that is such a good thing to do. Uh, Mike Schwartz beats Aris Sofra Keys. Uh, Mike Schwartz was already ahead of Sofra Keys uh, by 38 points in the series. Charlie Ravel is uh, not far behind. So basically, he's only lost um, to Swart and he's only lost a couple of places to Swart and Sophocles. Now, <clears throat> that's um, that's telling because Mike Swart is a lot, uh, sorry, Charlie Revel is a long way behind them in terms of distance in his race and has been well beaten, and I don't mean that rudely, in any shape, sense, manner or form. But he's lost very few points because he was in, you know, if he's heading the next group, um, or solo as he is, uh, he's actually going to do quite well. So Charlie Revel has actually got a very respectable result, uh, only three places behind Mark Squire and two places behind Sophocles. So um, do have a look at uh, www.echelonracing.com a little bit later on to see how this uh, plays out in the table. Um, so uh, we're waiting for, um, I think we're waiting for, is, uh, I'm assuming he's doing the right, is uh, David Bodgett, um, because he's the man who stands the game most, I think, uh, and take the lead in the series, but I'm not sure where Bodgett is. I don't remember seeing him for a little while, so maybe, maybe, something has gone wrong and he's dropped out. Um, interesting, uh, interesting. So I think, uh, <clears throat> I think maybe uh, we could even see Mike Lister possibly go top of the listings here rob miller is um next coming out i can't see budget on there so i think mike lister could be uh top of the league by the end of this race in some very crude calculations this is going to be so interesting i haven't uh, <clears throat> i haven't got a spreadsheet in front of me to work this all out in uh, real time and as i say it does have to be adjudicated by the uh, powers that be at Echelon Racing, uh, the Commissaire equivalents, and uh, once all that's done, the results will be properly processed and published. So I shouldn't really be speculating too much, um, but then again, on the other hand, that's what I'm here for, isn't it? So I will. Um, <clears throat> so Mike Lister in 14 could do himself a big favour. Oh, here we <laughs> and it's the Personality Prize winner and man of the moment, Chris Nevin. <laughs> star of the show. Everybody go away remembering Chris Navin and go, who won the race? Oh, I don't know. You should see this Chris Navin bloke. He's brilliant. So, here we go. Mente. Feldhouse is the next rider coming in. I don't think uh, Feldhouse... I think he has ridden before, but I don't think he's um, high in the standings. So, um... We've got Carter Snow behind him and then Mike Lister, Rob Miller and uh, the field. So this is, uh, I'd say this is going to be cracking. Let's have a look at the men's B. Because um, I think, uh, I think the, uh, there's a bit of, uh, there's a bit of procession probably in the men's A for the moment. So how far are we um, from the finish? Well, our leader in the men's B race, uh, Kilo from uh, Slovakia is 10 kilometers from the end so we're probably um, something in the region of 12 minutes away from the finish. Uh, Marion Hambrick is now way off uh, uh, De Schmidt and um, but he's probably you know a kilometer, kilometer ahead of uh, Baldis so I think Marion Hambrick is going to get a very very good third and, and having ridden yesterday and ridden very well yesterday uh, this is a most commendable result for him. Uh, Schmidt, you have to give him credit. Uh, the way it exploded off the front and um, left Marion behind uh, was uh, quite entertaining and uh, skillful and it showed his strength. Uh, but of course, the star up front and 700 metres ahead of De Schmidt uh, is Kilo from Slovakia. I think it's 700 metres um, with the distance we've got left. Is not insurmountable. The only thing is, I'm not sure where where you attack on this. I mean, it's not um, depends on the style of rider you are, doesn't it? But uh, I think Kilo should probably be able to hold 700 meters. Um, but uh, don't 
they'll absolutely bank on it. Bob Borders uh, riding solo again. Uh, he's 12 kilometres from the end. Probably enjoying the downhill after all that hard work and everybody in it's nice to have a downhill finish, isn't it? When I go out on my local uh, rides, I usually uh, sort of ride out in something that sort of gently rises for 30 miles and then uh, come home again. It's not, you don't descend for 30 miles on the way home. Um, it is undulating, so it goes up and down. But each time you go up, it's higher than you go down. So the journey home, although, again, it goes up and down, uh, each hill gets lower and lower. Uh, so effectively, the journey home is far nicer than the journey out. And... That's quite nice because you're feeling tired by then, and I'm sure that's the same for these riders here. This uh, the hill coming in the uh, probably about two fifths of the way uh, through the oh, massive mountain, uh, two fifths of the way uh, around the lap, uh, leaving you uh, mostly a nice descent, a couple of tinges of orange uh, ascent on the profile uh, on the way back. But uh, barring that, this is um, quite a nice uh, way to finish a race isn't it and you can kid yourself you felt fresh at the end if you're coming downhill because it feels like it doesn't it so uh billy now is uh, struggling up the 5.8 percent uh rise uh with 16k to go um never easy on the last lap is it so it's uh, uh fair play um oh, yeah, that's the sort of speed i might be doing that um so Fair play. Um, I'll take my hat off to these guys. I mean, to ride uh, an e-race over this sort of distance, I think is uh, more than admirable. Um, I do think it's uh, it's, uh, it's something to be. I mean, as I say, um, you free will far more in outdoor racing uh, than you. So, Carter Snow is the next home in 13th place, and uh, of course, what we've got to uh, make sure we don't miss is Chris Nevin in 18th place because. Uh, That'll be a major celebration, won't it? That'll that look like a pro crossing the line on a mounted top finish uh, in the Tour de France. Uh, so uh, make sure we catch Chris Nevin in 18th place going across the line. It's a must. Don't, don't move away from your screens. This is going to be the highlight of the show. Mike Lister from down there in Somerset and uh, Tour 2000 with Callis uh, racing team in 14th. I think Mike is going to find he gets a very big result here even though he will be disappointed with the race i'm guessing um he was in that front group uh, got dropped uh, by quite a distance but the placings i think are going to work in his favor we shall have to see but uh, we might have a british leader in the series Ooh. so uh, <clears throat> that'll uh, that'll boost the nation won't it um Actually, most people watching this are probably in the US, so it probably won't boost your nation if one of us Brits is at the front. Uh, but I'm sure there's plenty to race for, and there's plenty of talented US riders uh, across all these races. So, um, here is to be honest. <laughs> so, Carter Snow in 13th. Uh, we're looking at the time gaps here. Um, he's 12 minutes behind the uh, winner, Kevin Bouchard Hill, who had 2 minutes 40 ahead of uh, Yaden Jaeger, who actually eked out 25 seconds over Eagle Cops uh, from Slovenia. Daniel Cassidy rode so well for solo for so long at 3.39 back, uh, almost two minutes ahead of Jan Welford, Brian Hodges and uh, Tim Smith. Uh, Mike Schwartz, who needed the points, uh, pipped Aris Soft Lucuse, who also needed the points. John Cooper uh, coming in next at five minutes, five minutes 44 behind uh, Kevin Bouchard now. And Mike Lister, yes, well done, Mike. <laughs> Tour 2000. <laughs> you meant to point at your sponsor's name, mate. <laughs> um, Charlie Revel, who needed the points but got dropped, but didn't suffer too much damage with the very respect, uh, uh, respectful uh, uh, 11th, uh, respectable 11th, sorry. Uh, Sean Feldhaus uh, from Germany next. Carl Snow um, is the very worthy uh, 13th place. 12 minutes behind Kevin Bouchard now probably 12 minutes in front of anything I would have done so uh, chapeau to you Carter. Uh, Rob Miller is the man we're focusing on there in 15th place he's just behind Mike Lister who just finished and who have we got coming up so we've got uh, I think we've got five kilometers to uh, Chris Nevin so we might take a little look at the uh, B race at some point um, we're definitely not missing Chris Nevin on the finishing line though that's uh, 
that's uh, that's an that's a must i think <laughs> should be a video of all these uh, hand waves and things like that so <clears throat> rob miller uh saying home he's got just 800 meters to go and um 1.5 kilometers uh, behind is Hanahan from the UK uh, so it might be worth a quick flick over to the B racers um, to see how they're getting on it's only 500 meters um, in Killer and Deschmer I don't think that's going to get made up um, interesting I mean even five Five kilometers, 500 meters, it's 10%. Um, very crude mathematics, Deschmerck would have to ride 10% faster than Kilo um, to make up that gap. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I just don't think that's going to happen. Marin Hambrick uh, is in a little bit of danger getting caught by Bob Borders here. He's only 200 meters ahead. Now he had a healthier gap than that. Uh, maybe Marion's suffering a little bit. I mean, he raced yesterday. Um, and maybe it's just all catching up a little bit. So Bob Borders um, may have his head down. Uh, as we see here, um, oh my goodness, it's only 170 meters. Marion, you need to push it a bit, boy. Go on, get, get, <laughs> go on, man, go on, man. <laughs> it's not, oh boy, you need to push it. Uh, it's it's uh, oh, it's coming down it's quick, Marion. Stop pushing those pedals, man. Come on. <laughs> he says easily from the comfort of his armchair. Bob Borders is going for it, isn't he? He's got it down to 135. 7.8 kilometers go. Poor old Marion. He's ridden a brilliant race for the second day running. Uh, and he's going to get it nicked off him by. Oh, it's, sorry, it's Brad Borders. I can't Bob Borders. No. Uh, sorry, Brad. Um, my goodness. I. Uh, this is phenomenal. You can see, you can actually see Marion in front of him now, can't you? Um, Brad is going to catch him. It's under 100 metres. Um, what's Brad going to do? Is he going to catch up with Marion, sit on his wheel and get a bit of respite or just sail past him? Demoralisingly. Go on, Marion. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Marion. Speed up a bit as he comes by and sit on his wheel. And just <laughs> you. I mean, you, you were brilliant at sitting in the pack yesterday. This might be... Uh, this might be your ticket home, mate. Go on, Marion. <laughs> You'll never notice you in that loud jersey. So, oh, Brad is just 40 metres behind. I, I get the impression that Marion might be uh, feeling the full effects of riding hard yesterday and today on the two longest courses you've had in this series so far. Uh, make my own mistake. This is, uh, you know, this is tough. Uh, All right, so just overtaking one of the camera. Oh, he's just sailed past him, isn't it? Oh, go on, Marion. Get on his wheel, man. Come on. <laughs> go on, Brad. Be considerate. Let him get on. Oh, he's, I think, well done, Marion. This is brilliant. He's another few metres. Just get a rhythm. Don't You don't have to hurry to get back on the wheel. You can glide up. That's it. That's it. Now, don't overshoot. Don't overshoot. That's it. That That is exemplary riding. That is how you do it. That is fantastic. Oh, no. Brad's pushed on. Oh, that is a killer when somebody does that to you. You just catch them after all that effort and you just mentally relax and they push it again. Oh, bad luck. Um, I've had that done to me. It's uh, It hurts, doesn't it? Mainly in the legs, but it hurts. <laughs> Brad, that was a quite classy way to do that. You let the person catch and then just sail off at the moment they relax because um, they suddenly mentally haven't got that energy they've just spent a lot of energy mentally they're about to sit on your wheel and have a nice little ease off and they just don't have what it takes to match the acceleration uh, classic riding uh, that must have uh, been absolutely galling for uh, Marion Hambrick uh, now he's now got a problem that with seven kilometers to go um, it's only 800 meters back to David Breku and I do one if uh, Marion's suffering a little bit because that is about to become 700 and well, 799 is almost 800 I'll grant you but it's coming down rapidly I think Marion's in a bit of trouble I think he's uh, 
he's burnt both ends of the uh, candle here, isn't he? He's uh, raced hard over two gruelling races. Uh, all right, it was a crit yesterday, but that mountain in the middle of this one three times um, hurts. Uh, I've got a feeling no one's going to slide back. Um, I think he's probably... I don't think uh, Billing's not going to catch him. So uh, I think Marion Hambrick may well find himself uh, sliding from third to fifth, which is sad, but it's bike racing. It's why we watch it, it's why we do it. Um, and it is entertaining, isn't it? And uh, so is Chris Navin, by the way. He's quite entertaining. I don't know if you know Chris Navin, uh, but he's a cyclist who rides on RGT races. And he's one of the most animated. Uh, responsive riders that a commentator could ever wish for top top chap <laughs> so uh it's kilos out the front of the men's b race uh 500 meters from de Schmitt. it's not changing and um, with 2.5 kilometers to go i think we can safely assume kilo is going to be the winner of the b race that's the a race looking um we're on daily uh chris navin's still got 4.7 kilometers to go as we have a look down the list. Uh, Rob Miller came in uh, next since we've been watching. Jonathan Hanahan uh, from the UK uh, too. Um, <clears throat> Rob was uh, three minutes uh, off Mike Lister and he was just uh, uh, just under two points for the uh, Echelon Racing League of course uh, which is going to be absolutely fantastic. I can't wait to see the A-list. <laughs> I really can't. This is going to be uh, so much fun. Um, Daily 1.4 kilometres to go. Uh, probably can't wait for that to uh, complete. <laughs> there must be some uh, heavy legs uh, out there in Durango, uh, Colorado. Um, when I say they're out in Durango, I mean virtually out in Durango, Colorado. And there's a site for sore eyes, the old uh, Flam Rouge. Uh, maybe just getting out of his saddle, feeling a bit more comfortable. Uh, with the comforting thought that he has only got uh, less than a kilometre to go to wrap this one up uh, and bag the points. And he does a little wave. Uh, well done. Uh, fantastic riding. Uh, as I say, I salute every single rider in this. Uh, community racing. Um, you can't beat it, can you? I mean, it's fantastic. Really, I love it. And uh, well done to ZMS for putting on great production. Well done for Echelon Racing League putting on this whole damn show man it's brilliant it's absolutely fantastic uh, we love it and uh, i think the riders do too <clears throat> and chris navin um will come last he'll win the lantern rouge uh, his palmares will be the best in this race you do realize this chris navin will win the lantern rouge and the personality prize top there i mean who wants to win the race when you can win those two well maybe okay 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 maybe 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 300 metres to go, and uh, I hope there's a big uh, arm wave when you cross the line. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a try. I think it's a triumph to do three laps of this thing. <laughs> Look at that mountain in the middle, big blob of red, <laughs> a long one as well. It's uh, frightening. That's the word, frightening. <laughs> So the men's B, uh, Kilo is into the last kilometre and uh, will romp home to take the men's B prize. And look at that, uh, Daly giving us a bit of a what he goes through. Kilo is now the still that 500 metres gap back to Smurt. And uh, as um, actually. Um, David Brack, who hasn't uh, hasn't caught Marion Hambrick, um, interestingly, it's probably uh, 90 odd metres there. I wonder if Marion might just hang on. Um, Schmert uh, takes the uh, Flamme Rouge, and barring Tacanicals, will get second place after Kilo, who's 500 metres ahead. In fact, actually, the gap's uh, gone down to 390, and I think that's possibly for Kilo's. Uh, probably eased off a little bit i mean he's only doing 32 kph uh safe in the knowledge that nobody's going to catch him uh this is on uh a nothing gradient of 0.1 with 300 meters to go so i think the gap will come down but that's uh kilo easing off rather than schmert uh, 
devastating the distance and don't forget you don't get in prizes for distance here it's all based on your placings which means you can finish a mile behind somebody else um, but if there's only one place it's only one place's points so uh, there it is Oop, there it is so um, oh, we've got Brad Borders he's going to take third place uh, very impressively he hunted down Marion Hambrick and uh, there we are. Well done, sir. Uh, Yaden. Uh, it's not like Yaden, is it? Um, Achille, uh, the Slovakian, the winner. Uh, De Schmert from Belgium, uh, one of my favourite countries. I'm going there. I've been in Belgium twice next year, and I've just been there in the last month. I had the uh, privilege of watching the wonderful Six Days of Ghent track event. Um, and if you've never been, do it. <laughs> You'll know about it. Do it. <laughs> uh from Belgium then taking a very honourable second place uh, for what I consider to be the world's number one cycling nation. Brad Borders uh, set to become uh, the third member of the podium club in this particular race. Two kilometres to go though. Uh, how are we getting on in the men's A race? Um, I think we've got Chris Navin uh, <coughs> left on the field. Um, so. Chris, you don't have to put that much effort in because uh, you're the only one left out on the field. So, you, barring mechanicals, you are going to finish. Now, being the entertaining um, rider, you now have to tell us lots of jokes and stories, sing us a song, and keep us entertained for the final 3.3 kilometres you've got to do. Uh, do you think you can manage all of that while you're cycling? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay, three point. Uh, we will come back to watch Chris celebrate. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Every time. He's the man. He's the man. I'm telling you. Right, okay, so let's uh, have a look at the men's B race and we'll come back and watch Chris a little bit later. We'll tire him out if we make him wave his hands in the air all, all through the race, won't we, actually? Brad Borders coming in for third position, 1.4 kilometres to go in the men's B race and uh, what a race this has been. Uh, Kile, uh well off the front and doing superbly. Uh, De Schmidt, uh, having a good fist of uh, hunting him down but uh, Kilo was able to hold on just easing up at the end. Brad Borders uh, hunted down Marin Hambrick who rode a superb race but just began to fade at the end and I think has started to put a bit of effort back in because he's distanced David Braku. So my uh, prediction of Braku catching Hambrick is not going to happen. Uh, well done, Marion. Um, bad luck, uh, David. Um, who are Stefan de Schmidt? Giro killer. Um, sounds like a rapper. Um, it's uh, Stefan de Schmidt. So Giro killer uh, from Slovakia. And it's probably killer. Like Kile, isn't it? Probably. Um, Euro, Euro Kile, um, Stefan de Smet. Uh, this one got a difference of 38 seconds uh, between the two. So well done, Stefan de Smet, uh, with the hunt down there. Brad Borders uh, closing in, 400 metres to go. He's going to get a very respectable result and time too. Still pumping out 37, and you contrast that to uh, Kile. Um, Euro Kile, who uh, eased off and just did 32 uh, in these final couple of hundred metres. Uh, Brad Borders still pumping out 37 kph uh, like a true racer. Um, and he doesn't need to because he's got over a kilometre back to uh, Marion Hambrick, who I think is now capable of holding off the threat from David Bracku. Not sure whether that's Marion. Um, responding to the uh, potential of losing that place or David Braku uh, fading after doing a bit of a hunt. Yeah, here's Marion in that resplendent jersey of his just going through the uh, Flamme Rouge. He has got uh, 800 metres on David Braku and 800 metres to the finish. So there is no way that David Braku is going to ride twice as fast as our man Marion here. Uh, so our man Marion is going to be fourth. And uh, three, um, that's two pretty good placings in two days, I would say. Um, I reckon it's that shirt that does it. Um, you know, you can't beat a loud shirt, can you? Anyway, that's the results so far. Uh, Brad Borders, uh, 
coming in. Three minutes fifty behind uh, Euro Kille. Last few hundred meters for Marion here, Hambrick and uh, I bet he'll be pleased to see that uh, finishing line that's going to come into view any moment now. <clears throat> Just 290 uh, meters to go. So men's A. And there it is. It's the Flamme Rouge for Chris Navin. <laughs> Only a cake to go, Chris. <laughs> As we watch, uh, only uh, 60 odd metres to go for Marion Hambrick, who takes a brilliant fourth. Uh, well done for holding off uh, David Brackhu uh, at the end there, Marion. Uh, Great riding. Uh, over two days as well. Let it uh, not go unnoticed that that was two days racing. Uh, as are some of the other riders up there, actually. Um, you aren't the only one. So, uh, we're into the last uh, 500 metres, Chris Nevin. Uh, and similarly, over on the right in the B race, <laughs> Chris Nevin just <laughs> giving us another wave in the air. I, this has to be your biggest wave yet when you cross the line. You know that, Chris. <laughs> It has to be the best one, like like you've never waved before. I don't know how long you can hold your finger on the button that does it, um, or whether it just sort of kind of just makes it happen once. <laughs> Maybe if you just sort of keep pressing it repeatedly, um, you get a multiple wave. <laughs> two hundred meters ago, I can't, can't keep my eyes off. I've got two screens on here because we're watching Chris uh, on the left and. Um, watching the B race on the right and they're both about the same distance from the end so it's uh, <clears throat> we're gonna have to sit on two screens are aren't we um, I will I have to say um, with no disrespect to the B race um, what I'm waiting for is Chris's celebration that is the one do it again come on do it again <laughs> and maybe it doesn't work when you're finished <laughs> fantastic fantastic so uh, Andrew Billing is the uh, next rider. Um, unfortunately, we didn't concentrate on poor old David Brack, who's uh, finished there, because Chris Navin stole the show uh, because he's the entertainer of the peloton here on Echelon uh, Racing League. So Billing is the next rider to finish. 3.2 kilometres to go and uh, two riders left. Uh, Chris Navin now on your screen. Does the uh, wave your hands thing still work when you're uh, stationary, Chris? Can you uh, press it and see if you can give us a wave? He's probably puffing and panting and not even listening to me anymore. So that commentary he keeps making you wave your arms. <laughs> That's the final result for the men's A, uh, A team. Kevin Bouchard, how undisputed winner, uh, Yaden Jaeger. Finally, distancing Iga Cops, who uh, led the hunt down to try and hunt down Kevin Bouchard Hale, but he didn't quite come off. Daniel Cassidy, superb solo ride, finishing fourth in front of uh, a little group of six, which included Yan Welford, Brian Hodges, Tim Smith, Mike Schwartz, and Aris Sophocles, who are in the hunt for the series title, uh, both finishing at the back of that little group, uh, along with John Cooper. But uh, just behind them is Charlie Revel, who's also. Uh, at the start of play in the top seven. Sheen Feldhaus, uh, German, Cart Snow, uh, just pipping Mike Lister, who again is in the hunt uh, at the top, might even be in the lead. We'll have to have a look at the uh, echelonracingleague.com uh, results a little bit later. Rob Miller after that, the Brit Jonathan Hanahan, Nathan Daly, uh, Chris Navin, who, or Navin or Navin, uh, who wins the Lantern Rouge, the uh, personality prize and uh, hand waving of the race awards. So you got three trophies finishing last, Chris. Absolutely brilliant, mate. Absolutely fantastic. We go over to the B race and uh, thanks, Chris. Thanks for taking part. Uh, Billing now, 2.2 uh, kilometers to go. Uh, we have Panarisi uh, behind him at 4.55 kilometers. These positions are not going to change. So uh, I think we pretty much 
have the results uh, for the men's B race, um, assuming that these two both reach the finish. Um, where is it? I, I was doing a commentary the other day, I have to say, and somebody got a tecanical and they uh, stopped. And um, they were, I don't know, something like 20 metres from the finishing line. And everybody else went past them and they were there for ages and ages and ages. And I just thought, well, you know, they're not, uh, they're not going to finish. So I announced all the results and uh, I went back and had a look about an hour later. And the guy had actually got his uh, computer or his... Uh, smart trainer working and actually done the final 20 uh, 20 meters ages after everybody else and finished so it was an extra finisher that i didn't announce but i think in this uh scenario i think we can be fairly sure that uh, building and paracy will finish in sixth and seventh place so that is our lineup um just the seven finishers in the end uh euro Kille, uh stefan schmidt uh, brad borders marion hambrick who i think rode a fantastic race and uh, a little bit unlucky to tar at the end after two days racing but it happens and we'll get stronger and better don't we marianne uh david avid uh Brooke, who, uh from the netherlands uh is in fifth place uh did a tremendous spurt at the end but didn't quite overhaul uh marianne uh and then we have billing and Peronusi, uh to come in sixth and seventh so that's uh broadly uh we're up to i'll tell you what i don't know if you want to run a couple of adverts and then we'll watch the final two come across the line just to complete the coverage, shall we? Um, maybe not, actually. Let's uh, let's see Billing get over the line because he's about to do the flam rouge. So we'll watch him. Um, and I reckon we'll do a couple of adverts uh, and then come back and watch uh, Panarisi uh, cross the line so that we can say that we did a complete coverage of all the races. And haven't they been great? Hasn't this been a great weekend on Echelon Race? Uh, racing league um thoroughly enjoyed it and you know every little race has got a different aspect to it hasn't it i mean you look at the hand cycling the paracycling uh, i mean these guys are just absolute stars there might not be many of them it all grow and it needs people to put the word out about how good this is and the echelon will put it on for people like that we'll get more riders in that in the end and that will turn into top racing and don't forget in the hand cycling rgt are working on hand cycling avatars so even better everything moving in the right direction the women's racing has been absolutely great i mean you don't have that many uh you don't have a large field like you do for the men's races but boy those girls can race and look at jackie godby i mean what an absolute star uh, I take my hat off, hat off to you over the weekend, Jackie. Superb riding. And the men's A's and the men's B's, and, and everybody in it contributes. Uh, and it, isn't it great to watch somebody like Chris Navin uh, just joining in the party by waving back and responding to the commentator? Um, it's a community. It's RGT, it's Echelon Racing, it's ZMS Productions. I'm Dave Morrison, the commentator. Um, where my involvement in this is, I run races on RGT every other Wednesday uh, on oh, well, I'd say 7.30 UK time whatever that is for you, uh, they're every other Wednesday uh, I commentate on those as well uh, I love RGT, I'm part of the uh, community, uh, I have no other vested interest, and there we are Billing is our next finisher, and we have Panarisi, uh, who's got 5 kilometres to go, so I suggest we uh, maybe we take a little advertising break and come back and watch our man finish
Well, I have to say, <laughs> the graphics on this have been brilliant. I think Durango uh, looked fantastic on the graphics. When I saw the uh, advert just then, I was like, oh my goodness, this looks even better. Uh, did you see the little narrow gauge railway? That wasn't that fantastic? Um, as I say, Colorado, wow. Um, <clears throat> I've got to make it there one day. It's, it's been on my bucket list for years and I've never done anything about it. Um, this has really uh, jogged my need to go there. And I think Durango could be high on the list of destinations based on that little trailer. Looks fantastic, doesn't it? Uh, 2.9 kilometers to go uh, for Panarisi uh, in the orange jersey there. And uh, well done for sticking it all out. Uh, Andrew Billing, uh, they're confirmed as sixth place, uh, just behind uh, David Abbey-Broku. Um, difference of six minutes, and we're going to have um, something akin to that, I should imagine, um, <clears throat> probably a bit more, uh, before uh, Paralisi uh, gets home. But uh, we're going to do the decent thing and watch him every inch of the way, or his avatar anyway. Um, I'm sure... Uh, he's sitting in a pain cave somewhere, absolutely gasping and sweating, uh, wishing that uh, the 2.5 kilometres would go down a little bit faster than it is. Um, I think it's quite telling that um, he's doing 20, 29, uh, 30 kph. That says to me um, he's not one. Well, he doesn't need to race because he's the only one left on the course, of course. Um, he's upped it to 34 there. Um, although albeit on a minus percentage um, probably feeling it I would imagine I mean it is let's be honest this is a tough course um, you only have to look at the bottom of your screens that big blob of red stuff at the bottom of the screen is a long ascent that you know goes up to the eight nine percent the levels at places and it's continued it's dark red for a reason because that means hard technical word for dark red is hard right um steep is probably a, a, a better word but uh yeah um i think to ridden this course today in a pain cave and bear in mind there's none of this freewheeling uh, that you might do if you're out on the open road um you do tend to keep going this is uh for top riders and let's face it uh, there are many uh, riders who've ducked out of this long arduous 81 or well, 83 kilometer race uh, today many many have given it a bypass they've looked at the uh, parkour they've seen this big mountain they've seen the distance and thought ouch that's gonna hurt um, and you know these are the guys who are brave enough to come and do it and uh, they deserve every point they get in the echelon series so um, I think uh, I think chapeau uh, and that's why we're going to uh, give the respect due to Panarisi uh, from the United States of America who has 1.5 kilometers to go that's about a mile and uh, <clears throat> it's interesting I, I'm, as a cyclist um, you know I'm from Britain where our signposts on the roads are still on miles um, I am very used to driving in Europe so I'm quite used to kilometers from that perspective uh, but once I started cycling my whole brain works in kilometers now because uh, cycling is so kilometer based um, that I don't really think about things in miles anymore it's uh, totally kilometers I can't see the British government changing all the signs to kilometers I think that'll cost them absolutely billions um, but here's a sign that Panarisi uh, has been looking forward to it's the Flamme Rouge it goes under that um, Flamme Rouge actually has a black banner hanging from it but uh, never mind the arch was uh, red so we get the picture Flamme Rouge uh, is obviously literally translated red flame. So, uh, <coughs> counting down 750. It will seem like forever. It really will. <laughs> it's uh, 670. <laughs> Don't worry, it's nearly there. It's nearly there. And look at that. It's only point. It's only 0.1% gradient. You've done far worse this afternoon. <laughs> so, uh, coming up to half a kilometre to go, and we get the little signs at the side of the road telling us it's 500 uh, metres to the finish. Uh, that's just in case you want to judge your sprint, of course, which I'm sure you're probably plotting this very moment, aren't you? Um, 400 metres 
to go. And uh, just like the advert, look how stunning it looks. Isn't it? I mean, I know this is <laughs> this is uh, graphics and not real, but it still looks good, doesn't it? I mean, it's a uh, great little course. I'm going to have to ride this myself. Um, as I was explaining earlier, I've been off the bike for a little while um, due to travel and illness, so I haven't done anything on RGT for weeks, uh, and I need to get back on. Uh, count it down, last couple of hundred uh, metres, and then it's all over for the afternoon, and we can all pack up and go and do whatever else we need to do. What well up Mr. Panarisi, you have made it. You are officially a finisher in Durango, Colorado, the place to be. Um, I'm coming cycling here, fantastic. Thank you Durango uh, for being a virtual host. Thank you uh, Echelon Racing League for being the organizers. Thank you ZMS and Damon Bates for uh, putting this fine production together and thank you each and every rider out there for entertaining us uh, today and it's been an honor and a privilege to be part of this don't forget there's professional racing you can look it up at all the dates on the other weekends uh, but we'll be back with the community racing on january the 2nd uh, and don't forget to have a quick look uh, later today at the listings because i think there's going to be a big shake up particularly in the men's a um, and i think the ladies uh, league anna uh, Rankin then is going to lose her place at the top of that. So there is plenty to have a look at and I think January the 2nd is going to be so explosive that you just need to cancel everything else in your diary for that day. We will see you then. Bye. <coughs>